The Jell-O program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Kenny Baker, and yours truly, Don Wilson. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, this being the first day of the new year, it behooves me to introduce the star of this program in a manner befitting his dignity and position. Well. He is a man whose illustrious character and many fine qualities have my sincere admiration. Oh, Don, please. A man whose lovable nature and unselfish devotion to others... Say, Jack. Quiet, Mary. I want to hear this. Go ahead, Don. Whose unselfish devotion to others has endeared him to the hearts of his public. How true. So I bring you none other than that sparkling, scintillating, outstanding personality... That's not me. I'll kill myself. <laughs> Jack Benny. Hello again, this is Jack Benny talking, one of the sweetest guys I've ever met. <laughs> and Don, I want to thank you for that beautiful introduction. You know, as a rule, a man has to be dead before he gets such a lovely tribute. Well, I wrote it just before the broadcast while you were lying down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you didn't expect me to get up, eh? Well, I am pretty tired after last night. Hey, by the way, Don, what did you do New Year's Eve? Did you have any fun? Oh, I had a swell time, Jack. Simply wonderful. That's good. First, I took my wife to a movie, and then we went to the Coconut Grove to celebrate. Well, that was nice. First the picture, and then the Coconut Grove. I suppose you danced a lot. No, my wife left her shoes in the movie. <laughs> well, there's nothing like relaxing at the cinema. I often slip my shoes off myself, but I'm getting so absent-minded, I'm not going to do it anymore. You're not. No, the other night at Grauman's Chinese, I was clear down to my underwear before the usher stopped me. <laughs> oh, it was embarrassing. I can imagine. Well, tell me, Jack, how did you spend New Year's Eve? Any excitement last night? Well, I had a fairly good time, Don. I took Mary to the Wilshire Bowl, you know, where Phil Harris is playing. Oh, you did? Yeah. Say, you had a pretty good time in my place last night, didn't you, Jackson? Yes, I had a nice time, Filson. <laughs> But as long as it was your place, you might have seen that I got a decent table. What are you talking about? Your table wasn't so far away. It wasn't. I was so far from the bandstand, I couldn't even see the circles under your eyes. <laughs> it's a fine table. Oh, you're exaggerating, Jack. There were a lot of people sitting behind you. Listen, Phil, the only people sitting behind me were from Pasadena. And they were home at the time. <laughs> What a New Year's Eve. Well, Jack, maybe Phil couldn't help it. New Year's Eve's a big night, and after all, first come, first serve. That's what burns me up, Don. I was the first one in the place. When I got there so early, the manager asked me to help blow up the balloon. <laughs> How do you like that? Well, you got paid for it, didn't you? That's not the point. <laughs> Now, let me tell you another thing, Phil. I don't mind my table being far away, but the next time you seat me behind a post, please see that there's a knot hole in it. <laughs> behind a post? What are you talking about? Oh, never mind. Hello, Jack. Happy New Year. Hmm, Happy New Year. I was just telling Phil about the fine table he gave us last night. Imagine seating us behind a post. It burns me up. You're crazy, Jack. We weren't behind a post. We weren't? No, that was a piece of confetti on your glasses. <laughs> Well, why didn't you tell me? I nearly broke my neck trying to peek around it. <laughs> anyway, post or no post, we were certainly sitting far enough away from everything. Well, I'm glad we were. I was so ashamed sitting next to you with that old-fashioned tuxedo you had on. Why don't you buy a new one? Oh, how often do I wear a tuxedo? And besides, it isn't so old. It isn't? No. Go on, I put my hand in your pocket and pulled out a program from Ford Theater. <laughs> Listen, Mary, that suit might be a little out of style, but they're still wearing single bread bre single. <laughs> now listen, Mary, that suit might be a little out of style, but they're still wearing single breasted tuxedos. Not with a belt in the back. <laughs> well, they're coming back, so don't be so smart. Mary's right, Jack. Oh, she is. Your pants were so tight, you had to wear your garters on the outside. <laughs> Listen, maestro, one more crack out of you, and you'll be leading the organ on the Lum and Abner program. <laughs> Oh, 
And another thing, Phil, the next time I dance by your orchestra, watch your baton. <laughs> Remember that. Okay, buddy. Hmm, buddy, yes. Yeah. Incidentally, fellas, this being the new year, I was going to give you all a raise in salary, but the way you've been acting today, I'm not going to do it. I'd be satisfied just to get my regular salary on time. Now, wait a minute, Phil. Don't give me that. I put your check in the mail every Monday morning. Well, from now on, don't pin it on a postcard. I don't want people to know what I'm making. <laughs> all right, Phil, cut out the beefing. Let's see if we can't inaugurate the new year with a little harmony. Oh, Jack, you want to hear something awful? What, Mary? Here it is, New Year's, and I forgot to write a poem about it. Oh, that's a shame. I'll sit right down and dash one off. Okay, hurry it up. And now, folks, going from the... All right, Jack, I'm all set. Why, Mary, is your poem finished already? Yeah. Gee, you work faster than George Bernard Shaw. Well, his beard gets in his way. <laughs> oh, that's right. Uh, what's the title of your poem? Goodbye, 1938. Hello, 1939. Well, that covers everything. Go ahead. <clears throat> <clears throat> oh, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Please don't be a sad and blue year. These last 12 months have been sublime. So goodbye, 38. Hello, 39. Well, so far, nobody is screaming. <laughs> You just wait. Oh. I wonder who this coming yar will be our favorite movie star. Hmm. Will it be Garbo hmm. or Sonia Heine? So goodbye, 38. Hello, 39. <laughs> 90. Uh, what has this year in store for us? For thee and thou, and thy and thus. Hmm. Will Don get fatter? Will Phil be gay? Will Kenny get knowledge with a capital K? I doubt it. I'd like to ask you if I dare, will Jack continue to lose his hair? Mary. And when it's gone, will it stay away? Goodbye, 38. Hello, toupee. <laughs> Mary, get to the last verse, will you? It's coming up now. That's good. Oh, happy new year. Happy new year. Please don't be a sad and blue year. We will give you one more chance. So goodbye, Broadway. Hello, friends. <laughs> well... Mary, you finally did it. Hey, Phil, do you think you can follow Mary's poem with a number? I'll try. Okay, hit it, boys. Wait a minute. Come in. Mr. Benny? Yes? Oh, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. To the greatest man I know. And I bring you fondest greetings. There's a wagon. I must go. <laughs> well, I'm glad they let him out for our program. Play, Phil. That was Say It With a Kiss, played by Phil Harris and his original orchestra. And now, ladies and gentlemen... Original? Yes. Wait a minute, Jack. This isn't the band I started out with. I don't mean that, Phil. I mean, when they look at their music, they still play something original. <laughs> and speaking of the band, Phil, you'd think that they could start out the new year by dressing a little better. Where'd they get those awful-looking neckties? Aren't they atrocious? They certainly are. Where'd they get them? I gave them to them for Christmas. Oh, and saying that reminds me, Phil, that was some Christmas present you sent me. You must have been under the weather when you bought it. Oh, no, I wasn't. I was sober as a judge when I bought your gift. You were not. I was, too. Then let me ask you something. What use have I got for a porthole? <laughs> Isn't that a fine present, Mary? A porthole. Well, if your head gets any bigger, you can use it for a monocle. All right. Don't make it any worse than it is. Oh, hello, Kenny. Hiya, Jack. Happy New Year. <laughs> Well, Kenny, I see you're still celebrating. You must have had a good time last night. I'll say. I didn't get to bed until 10 o'clock. Gosh, I'm a wreck. <laughs> Kenny, how can you be a wreck if you went to bed at 10 o'clock? I slept in a folding bed and I forgot to pull it down. <laughs> well, it's none of my business, Kenny, but would you mind telling me how you got into a folding bed without pulling it down first? I'm not going to tell until I get it patented. <laughs> Oh, that's right. Guard your secret carefully. <laughs> and stop blowing that horn. Well, I'm practicing for the Rose Bowl game at Pasadena tomorrow. Say, are you going, Jack? I certainly am. I wouldn't miss it for anything. Hey, Mary, I got a couple of good seats. You want to go with me? No. I went with you last year, and you were the only one in the stand wearing a raccoon coat and a beanie. <laughs> well? And the way you were waving that pennant around, I was so embarrassed. Well, what's wrong with waving a pennant? Your said Waukegan High School on it. <laughs> 
right. You don't have to go with me. I'll take somebody else. You want to go with me, Kenny? Sure. But I'll have to bring my girl along. Well, I don't see how, Kenny. I've only got two seats. Well, I'll invite her anyway. Maybe we can lose her in the crowd. <laughs> Yes, that ought to solve our problem. Incidentally, I mislaid my ticket somewhere in the house. I hope Rochester finds them. Hey, Jack, who do you pick to win the game, Duke or USC? Well, Phil, I'm a USC man myself, and I think it's a cinch for them to win. Oh, you do, eh? Well, how much do you want to bet? Well, I didn't say anything about betting, Phil. I just told you who was going to win. Well, if you're so sure about it, why don't you want to bet? Because gambling is naughty. <laughs> And you know it. You mean because you're a scaredy cat. Scaredy cat? Listen, Harris, what are the odds on the game? Two to one on USC. All right, wise guy, I'll bet you 20 cents to a dime and put up or shut up. <laughs> well, what are you stalling for, Harris? He's afraid if he wins, you'll fire him. <laughs> ah, that's it. Mm, I thought you'd well shun up. 20 cents to a dime. Make that $100 to 50 and you got a bet. Don't try to show off, Bill. You had your chance. <laughs> now, let's drop it. You know, I don't think Jack wanted to bet at all. Think? Kenny, your job on this program is to sing. Well, I can have a hobby, can't I? <laughs> you better stick to stamps, Kenny, and go ahead with your song so we can get to do our play tonight. Okay. Hold it a minute. That must be Rochester. I asked him to call me. Hello? Hello, Mr. Billy. This is Rochester. Yeah, I was waiting for your call. Did you find my two tickets for the Rose Bowl game? No, I look high and low. I can't find them anywhere. Oh, God, that's a shame. Well, keep on looking. They might be in the house. They must be in the house someplace. Okay. So long. So long. Say, boss, can I have them all off? I gotta go to a wedding in Pasadena. <laughs> A wedding in Pasadena. Tell me, Rochester, who's getting married? Uh, 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 what was that, boss? I said, who's getting married in Pasadena tomorrow? Oh, aunt of mine. An aunt of yours, eh? Who's she marrying? Uh, some fellow that's going to be my uncle. Uh-huh, I see. Now, at what time does this wedding take place? They kick off by one thing. <laughs> What's that? What did you say? Oh, uh, nothing. Uh, keep quiet, operator. <laughs> Rochester, there was no operator on the line. Now, you found those Rose Bowl tickets, didn't you? Well, I... Uh... You found those tickets, didn't you? Am I on the oath? <laughs> Answer me. Did you or did you not find those tickets? Sing, Kenny. <laughs> Listen, Rochester, when I get home tonight, I want to find those two tickets on the dresser in my bedroom. Okay, boss. Happy New Year. Go ahead and sing, Kenny. That Rochester, the only way I can keep things in my house is to nail him down. <laughs> that, uh, that was, I promise you, sung by Kenny Baker. And, Kenny, that was very good for a fellow who stayed up until 10 o'clock. Your voice hardly showed it. Oh, I'll put myself together in a couple days. I hope so. And, Kenny, if you got to bed at 10 o'clock last night, how'd you get those awful circles under your eyes? I painted them on, ain't I nuts? <laughs> you sure are. And now, ladies and gentlemen, for our feature attraction this evening... I was going to paint wrinkles on my forehead, but my mother wouldn't let me. Well, she was right. And now, ladies and gentlemen... If I was Kenny's mother, I'd trade him in for an Airedale. <laughs> now, Mary, Kenny's mother wouldn't do that. And now, folks... We've got an Airedale! <laughs> All right, all right. If you two will quiet down, I'd like to get on with our play. And now, folks... You know something, Kenny? I never met your mother. Well, you didn't? Phil, for heaven's sake, who cares? <laughs> now, let's get on with the play. Everybody's butting in here but Don. Well, I met Mrs. Baker. Oh. <laughs> well, I'm very happy to know it. And now, folks, going from Mrs. Baker to our feature attraction of the evening... Uh, this being the first day of the new year, tonight we are going to present an original play. A sort of a New Year's fantasy, entitled The New Tenant, or Goodbye 38, Hello 39. Now I will... You stole that from my poem. Mary, that was just a coincidence, believe me. Now in this fantasy, I will play the part of 1938. And Mary... You know, Jack, I read this play four times and I still can't understand it. Well, in the first place, Kenny, our play is a little too deep. And in the second place, you're a little dope. <laughs> now, uh, I will be 1938, 
And Mary will be Mrs. 1938, my loving, loyal wife. And we have 12 children. <laughs> what are you laughing at? I don't know. It's censored. <laughs> and keep still. Now, our play opens in the home of Mr. and Mrs. 1938, who live in a big round house called The Earth. It is almost midnight on December 31st, and their lease is about to expire. Curtain. Music. Oh, Mariah. Mariah. What do you want, Pa? Better hurry up with that packing. The landlord said we've got to get out by midnight to make room for the new tenant. The new tenant? Who is he? Oh, some little nudist by the name of 39. He don't know what he's getting into, does he, Ma? Nope. This house sure has been a mess, ain't it? You said it. Remember a couple of months ago when the bathtub ran over and got New England soaking wet? I sure do. And say, Pa, what about the time last spring when the roof leaked and we had to hang Los Angeles out to dry? Wasn't that awful? Yep. Hey, Pa, turn on the moon. I can't see what I'm packing here. Okay. Hey, moon, what do you want, you old fossil? <laughs> I want some light down here. And quit winking at my wife. Okay. Say, you want some milk, too? Milk? Yeah, a cow just jumped over me. <laughs> well, I'll be darned. Quit gabbing, Pa. We ain't got much time. That's right. Darn those shooting stars. They're having a feud again. <laughs> Doggone it, Pa. Even with all our troubles, I kind of hate to leave here. So do I. After all, we did have a lot of fun. Remember the time that scallywag Howard Hughes flew around our house in five and a half days? Do I? <laughs> he sure had me dizzy. And then that fella Corrigan. He started to fly from the kitchen to the parlor and... Th- Dern fool ended up on the back porch. <laughs> <laughs> Say, Pa, did you pack up all the swing music? I'm doing it now. Last foot bluesy with the floy, floy. Might as well take that with us. <laughs> Say, Ma, it's five minutes to twelve. We better start rounding up the kids. Where are they? Well, January, February, and March are outside playing on a cloud. Oh, where's April? He's taking a shower. <laughs> oh, he's always doing that. The rest of them are around here someplace. Well, tell them to stick close. We're going to leave in just a few minutes. I wonder who that can be. I'll go over and see. A kiss, get a task, get boy, am I sick of that. Well, well, look who's here. Who is it, Paul? It's old man Mars from across the Milky Way. Hiya, Mars. Hiya, neighbor. <laughs> Heard you were leaving tonight, so thought I'd drop over and say goodbye. Well, that was mighty sweet of you. Say, I sure handed you a scare a couple of months ago, didn't I? You certainly. <laughs> Hey, what was the big idea, anyway? Well, I really didn't mean it. I was lighting a cigarette, and I reached down in the Hudson River to put the match out. And what happened? Well, my hand slipped, and I gave New Jersey a hot foot. (laughs) You sure did. (laughs) Say, Mars, you'll have to excuse me now. It's almost midnight, and i got to be getting out of here. So long. So long. Oh, say, I got my rocket ship outside. Can I give you a lift anywhere? No, thanks. We'll be all right. Say, those rocket ships smoke a lot, don't they? Yeah, the exhaust pipes are bad. I just flew by heaven and now angels really got dirty faces. (laughs) Well, if you pass by the other place, give my regards to Fred Allen. (laughs) So long, Mars. So long. (laughs) Well, Ma, it's almost midnight, so put on that silly hat of yours and let's get going. Okay, Pa. Hmm, there's the first stroke of twelve. I wonder what's keeping the new tenant. Don't worry, he'll be here. Doggone, Ma, I forgot to find find out where we're moving to. Thought you bought a place over on Jupiter. No, but I took a look at Venus. (laughs) Hmm, time's a-fleeting. We can't leave until that little brat gets here. That must be him now. Yep. Come in. Well, hello, young fella. Are you the little New Year? I ain't Bobby Green. <laughs> well, well, my boy, come right in. Well, this is it, young man. Tell me, what do you think of your new home? Boy, what a dump. This house could stand a lot of fixing up. I know it, son. There are a lot of things wrong here, my boy. Yes, sirree. That Spanish shawl on the piano there is all ripped and torn. Need a lot of mending. And another thing, the china is just about all smashed to pieces. 
And while I think of it, son, if you see some little lost sheep roaming about, try and find a place for them around the house somewhere. I'll do what I can. For heaven's sake, let's get going. Just a second more. Now, there's just one more thing, young fella. What's that? May not sound like much, but it's a mighty big issue. Your greatest worry, my boy, is going to be to pick out a Scarlet O'Hara. <laughs> <laughs> that had me groggy all year. Come on, Pa, you're talking too much. I'm coming, Ma. Thanks, old timer. You're welcome. Happy New Year, young fella. Happy New Year. <laughs> We'll be with you again next Sunday night at the same time. Are you listening, Tommy? And now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to announce that in response to many, many requests, and owing to a renewed and timely interest, we are going to, uh, again going to present our version of Walt Disney's famous picture, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, next Sunday night. So if you missed it the first time, folks, be sure and tune in. And if you heard it, tune in anyway, as we're going to have a brand new Prince Charming. Guess who, folks? <laughs> oh, Andy, you gave it away. <laughs> Good night, folks. The Jell-O Program, starring Jack Benny. With Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Kenny Baker, and yours truly, Don Wilson. For now, ladies and gentlemen, we bring you that Don Juan, that Casanova, that answer to a maiden's prayer, Jack Benny. <laughs> Hello again, this is a woman's home companion talking. <laughs> and Don, you certainly went to town on that introduction. If I do say it myself, you hit the nail right on the head. Oh, you liked it, huh? Well, Don, before you mentioned it, I never quite looked at myself as an answer to a maiden's prayer, but come to think of it, I guess I do have a way with the ladies. Oh, I've got to tell him, Phil. I'll oh, keep still. Let him rave. Hey, wait a minute. What is this? Well, Jack, if you must know, Phil bet me a dollar that if I introduced you as a ladies' man, you'd go for it hook, line, and sinker. Oh, I see. A frame-up, huh? Well, that's one on me. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> so you're making money on practical jokes now, eh, Phil? Yeah, that's my sideline. Yeah, well, just pull one more on me, and your sideline will be your main occupation. <laughs> Anyway, I don't see what you fellas want to rip me for. You know, you never see me outstepping unless there's a pretty good-looking girl with me. I admit that, Jack, but they always look so bored. Well, certainly they look bored, Don. That's because they're sophisticated. They're blaze. I mean, they're blasé. <laughs> That's what. So your girls are sophisticated, eh? They certainly are. I saw you with one last night, and she had a gold tooth right in front. Well, she's from the Klondike. <laughs> That explains that. All right, now explain those high-button shoes she had on. Oh, high-button shoes. I suppose she was wearing a bustle, It too. was either that or a papoose. <laughs> you know, Phil, it's funny, but I just can't seem to scream at you tonight. <laughs> Maybe I'm not in the mood. Who knows? And let's not discuss my love life any further. We've got a long play to do. Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. Who was that goon I saw you with last night? <laughs> Goon? Yes, why don't you go out with good-looking girls once in a while like Phil does? Now, wait a minute, Mary. Miss LaRose may not have been the most beautiful girl. <laughs> Miss LaRose may not be the most beautiful girl in the world, but she's delightful company and very refined. Yeah, she's the only girl I ever saw that ate a steak like it was corn on the cob. <laughs> Now, she wasn't that bad. Go on. She ordered a baked apple and bobbed for it. <laughs> All right, Mary, just relax and mind your own darn business. Say, has anyone seen Kenny? We've got to get our play started. You want me, Jack? Well, I don't want you, Kenny, but you're supposed to be here. <laughs> Where have you been the last 15 minutes? I was outside in the telephone booth talking to my girl. Oh. But somebody wanted to use the phone, so we had to get out. <laughs> a shame. <laughs> and now, now that we're all here, tonight, ladies and gentlemen, by special request, we are going to bring you our 1939 version 
of Walt Disney's screen classic, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. We are? Well, what do you know about that? Well, don't act so surprised, Bill. I announced we were going to do Snow White last week. Well, I didn't hear you. Oh, you didn't? Bill, don't you ever pay attention when I say something on this program? Not unless I say something right after it. Hmm. <laughs> I wish you'd think of someone beside yourself, Maestro. Oh, stop picking on Phil. I didn't hear you say anything about Snow White either. Well, of course you didn't. All during the last half of the program, you were pitching pennies with the orchestra. <laughs> well, I won 30 cents in a piccolo player. <laughs> well, give him back to Phil. I'm going to fine you 30 cents. <laughs> anyway, believe me, fellas, I announced Snow White last week. That's a lot of baloney. <laughs> Oh, brother. <laughs> Kenny, I said it, and I said it so everybody could hear me. I guess I must have been worrying about Congress. No doubt, no doubt. In our version... Hey, Phil, what's a dwarf? My salary with a beard on it. <laughs> That's right. Huh? Now, in our musical comedy, folks, as none of us look like dwarfs, we are going to call our play Snow White and the Seven Gangsters. Mary Livingston, who left her rouge at home, will be Snow White. Now, let's see. Who's going to be the witch? The girl Jack was out with last night. <laughs> she is not. I'm getting the same witch we had last year. Where are you, witch? Here I am. <laughs> see, is she going to be my stepmother again? Yes, and she's going to give you a poisoned apple. You stool pigeons! <laughs> Quiet, you old bat. <laughs> Now, our play will go on immediately after Kenny's song. And by the way, Mary, you want to know something? Walt Disney is sitting in our audience. Well, as long as he stays there, we're all right. Hmm. I don't mind him coming, but he didn't have to bring Ferdinand the Bull with him. Sing, Kenny. <laughs> that was one song from Snow White sung by Kenny Baker. And thanks, Kenny. It was certainly apropos. Apropos? Who do you think you're talking to? <laughs> Kenny, apropos means that your song fits the occasion. Oh. Yeah. You mean like pajamas in bed? That's it. That's it, exactly. Yeah. And now, ladies and gentlemen, for our musical comedy, Snow White and the Seven Gangsters, uh, which we will present in four acts and 38 scenes. And as a special inducement for tonight only, we are going to give away to each and every listener a genuine solid gold soup knife. A soup knife? What's that for? It's for scraping it off of neckties. <laughs> The opening scene is an isolated farmhouse. As the curtain rises, Doc Benny is giving his boys a pep talk. Curtain. Music. Now listen, men. We got a big job on for tonight. The biggest thing we've tackled since we cracked the mint. We're going to stick up the 12th National Bank. Do you get that? Now call the roll, see if we're all here. Sleepy. Oh, here, Doc. Sneezy. Kerchew, Doc. Gesundheit. <laughs> Happy. I'm right here, Doc. Feeling fine and raring to go. <laughs> well, what are you giggling about? I got an awful toothache. <laughs> oh, isn't that jolly? Grumpy. Right here, Chief. But I'm afraid we're soon going to get caught this time. Oh, you're too pessimistic. Bashful. Where's Bashful? Here I am, Doc, under the bed. Well, come on over here with us. What makes you so bashful? Well, Doc, when I was a kid, I went to a party and I caught a sealing horses trade and it parts fitted. Of course, I didn't know they were going to fight the season the way it was start. <laughs> and when I caught this part of season across the street, and I've been flushing ever since. <laughs> hmm, fine gangster. Now, let's see, who else? Oh, yes, Dopey. That's me, folks, and very apropos. <laughs> And you're a fine crook, too, the way you waste your time. What do you mean? I sent you out yesterday to pick pockets, and the first guy you hit was Fred Allen. What did you find there? Some chewing tobacco and some chewing gum. Oh. They taste awful together. <laughs> I shouldn't wonder. And you, Bashful? Yes, Doc? I sent you out for bullets yesterday, and you brought back a bag of jelly beans. Well, the man at the store said they were caught a seat if I fit with a boom boom. <laughs> I don't care what he said. Now listen, fellas. You've been laying down on the job lately, so I want you all to be on your toes tonight. Uh, stay, Doc. What is it, Sleepy? What time are we going to rob the bank? About midnight. And this time, don't fall asleep on the burglar alarm. Uh, okay. I'm afraid of that job, Chief. We're sure to get caught. Oh, we are, eh? How do you feel about it, Happy? Grumpy's right. We'll all go to Sing Sing and never come out. Gee, it'll be awful. <laughs> <laughs> I certainly got a brave bunch of men here. Scared of your own shadow. Ah, oh, shut up. Yes, sir. What's that? Gee, it darn near worked. 
Now, listen, men. We got a big job on tonight, and we got to get some money. There's a payment due on our beards. <laughs> so let's all work together. Just as soon as our supply of dynamite gets here, we'll go. Come in. Package of dynamite for Doc Benny. Sign here. Now, wait a minute. Is this dynamite good and strong? I think so. I had two arms when I started out. Goodbye. <laughs> All right, men, now listen carefully. We'll meet tonight at 11.30 in the alley right in back of the bank. Is that clear? Sure. Oh, right, 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 there. Yeah, sure right there. What about you, Dopey? Will you remember where we're going to meet? Yeah, I tied a string around my little finger. Well, take that yo-yo off the other end. <laughs> now remember, fellas, 11.30 in the alley behind the bank. And then, do you know where we go from there? Where? I hold. I ho to rob the bank we'll go. A safe will blow and grab the dough. Hi ho, hi ho, hi ho, hi ho, hi ho. Now don't be late, you know. We gotta work quick for the chisel and pick. Hi ho, hi ho, hi ho, hi ho, hi ho. I'm sleepy that I know. And I'm so fast set if all the folks said dead. Hi ho, hi ho, hi ho, hi ho, hi ho. To rob the bank we'll go. The scene changes. We now take you to the home of Miss Snow White, who lives on Park Avenue with her cruel stepmother, Mrs. Agatha Witch. Oh, she's a meanie. Take it away, Park Avenue. To you and don't keep calling up here anymore. Goodbye yourself. Who was that, stepmother? That was your boyfriend, Prince Charming. Now listen, Snow. <laughs> I don't want you to go out with him anymore. He's just after your money. So are you. Well, I saw you first. <laughs> now don't you dare to leave this room, you little brat. Isn't she awful, folks? Quiet, you Waukegan weasel. <laughs> My stepmother's so cruel to me. Is she jealous of me for chance? Or is she jealous of me good look? And where is my Prince Charming? If he would just come and take me away, I'd be so happy. He'll be here, folks. You see? That must be him now. Is that you, Prince Charming? If it ain't, I whitewash my horse for nothing. <laughs> Charming. Hello, Snow White. How's my itsy bitsy lambsy piesy? <laughs> Isn't he lousy wowsy, folks? Oh, Prince, I'm so glad you're here. My stepmother's getting crueler every day. Boo hoo hoo hoo. Is that so? Well, what's the matter with that old Mickey Finn? <laughs> Why, only this morning she tried to kill me. She gave me a poison apple for breakfast. A poison apple? Yeah, and another thing. My stepmother says you're not a real prince. You are a real prince, aren't you? I'll say I am. My blood is so blue every time I cut my finger, I fill my fountain pen. Then I don't care what she says. I love you, my prince. And if you'd only take me away from here, I'd be so happy. Don't worry, my little angel cake. Someday I'll take you to my castle in Van Nuys. In Van Nuys? When? Someday. Oh, someday. Someday we'll go away Someday so far away And how thrilling that moment to be When the prince of my dream comes to me I'll whisper I love you
wasn't that awful, folks. <laughs> well, goodbye, darling. I must go now. Away on my faithful steed. There he is now. Say, your horse is awful thin, isn't he? He sure is. Hi ho, sliver! <laughs> He looks a little like Harrington. <laughs> so Prince... So Prince Charming leaves. The door opens and in walks the wicked stepmother and says... Snow White? Snow White? Who was that in here singing? Nino Martini. Well, he ought to gargle. <laughs> hmm. I know it was that Prince Charming and I told you never to see him again. But I love him, stepmother. He's so handsome and romantic. And besides, he's the only man I've ever seen. Well, then, for heaven's sake, wait a while. Yes. If you hold out, you can get one that wears shoes. <laughs> but, stepmother, please. Anyway, I'll put a stop to this affair, you little fool. Here. Have an apple. Don't take it, Snow White. It's poison. Stay out of this, you gray-haired ham. <laughs> Mother, this apple is poison. It is not. Then why is that worm waving a red flag? You see? <laughs> I'll make you eat it. Come here, Snow White. No, no, I'll run away from home. That's what I'll do. I'll run away from home. Stop! Stop! No, no, I'll never see you again. Never, never. Goodbye, stepmother. Goodbye, worm. Goodbye. <laughs> Snow White runs away from home. And two days later, we find her lost in a dense forest somewhere in Long Island. Oh, here I am in the woods. And look at the animals following me. Oh, see the pretty bird. Hello, bird. <laughs> Well, the same canary we had last year. You know? Gee, none of these animals are afraid of me. Look at that little silver fox with a bushy tail. Isn't he cute? Come here, silver fox. Oh, no, you got my brother around your neck now. <laughs> All right, smarty. Gee, I'm so tired and hungry. Oh, look, there's a farmhouse over yonder. Maybe I can get food and shelter there. Here I come, farmhouse. <laughs> men. We're ready to rob the bank. Now remember, this ain't no picnic, so everybody work fast and be on your guard. Say, Bashful, have you got the machine gun? Oh, sure. I can't see the boss until he crosses the street. He trade. gets a part of the Does that mean yes or no? <laughs> Step a flat. <laughs> okay. Hey, Dopey, stop chewing that dynamite. You'll blow your brains out. If I had any brains, I wouldn't be chewing it. <laughs> oh. Well, we're all set now. Hey, wait a minute. Where's Sleepy? <laughs> hey, Sleepy, wake up. We gotta go to work. <laughs> Oh, well, we can do without them. Now, let's go, men. And here's my final instructions. While we're robbing that bank, there's one thing that's very important. What's that, Chief? For heaven's sake, don't whistle while you work. Don't whistle while you work. Or the cops will come. We'll have to run. Be as quiet as a turd. You mean quiet as a mouse. But I couldn't make it rhyme. Now, come on, boys, and make no noise. We haven't got much time. Now remember each of you We know what we must do Now you must be still I know I will La 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 Don't whistle while you work For the cops are sure to hurt They'll get their men put in the can Don't whistle while you work I'm screaming honey Don't whistle, whistle while you work I'm shouting baby Don't whistle, whistle while you work And I'm repeating Don't whistle, whistle all right, men, we're on our way. Let's go. Wait a minute. I know it. It's the cops. The cops? Gee, I'll bet they give us life this time. <laughs> All right, I'll handle this. Come in. Hello, 
everybody. My name is Snow White. Why, it's a girl. A girl? <laughs> yes, a girl. What do you want, Snow White? See, I thought this was a farmhouse. Aren't you all farmers? No, we're not farmers. We're bandits. And right now we're going out to rob a bank. Rob a bank? Oh, you mustn't do that. Why not? Because it's antisocial and unstatutory. Oh, it is. Did you hear that, fellas? It's antisocial and an unstatutory. <laughs> it's also full and quinsend and virgin consult and ticket. Yeah. Never mind that. <laughs> Tie this dame up and throw her down the cellar. Throw me down, too. Grab her, man. Now, wait a minute, Chief. She can't harm us. Well, we're not taking any chances. Tie her up. But why do all you nice boys want to rob a bank? Money isn't everything. We're not going after money. We're going after blotters. Now, scram. <laughs> She's right, Doc. Let's call the whole thing off. I'm in favor of it. Yeah, maybe I can get me old job back. Your old job back? What did you do? I was a tenor in a tough quartet. <laughs> hmm, some tenor. And I used to be an orchestra leader. That's a lie. <laughs> what were you, Dopey? I used to be a beautiful baby. Hmm. But look at you now. <laughs> Fine bunch of gangsters I got. Now listen, Snow White. You listen to me, you big bad man. Hmm. You're all going to throw your guns away and stay right here. You're never going to rob another bank again as long as you live. Nothing doing. This is our racket and we're going to stick to it. Oh, come on now. Give me your gun. I will not. Here's my gun, Snow White. I'm going to turn over a new leaf. Here's my gun. Here's mine, too. Thanks. Be careful. There's water in it. <laughs> All right, Doc. You're the last one. Now hand over your gun. Oh, here. But Santa Claus will never forgive me. This is a Christmas present. Here, take it. <laughs> Gee, I feel better already. Come in. Mr. Benny? Yes? Say, what are you doing here? I'm Prince Charming, and I'm looking for my sweetheart, Snow White. Now, wait a minute. You're not Prince Charming. He is, too. I just sold him my title. Oh. Come, come my little Snow White. We'll go to the booby hatch and live happily. <laughs> At last. At last. Someday I'll be king. Mary Little Snow White, Andy went back to Van Nuys, and Doc Benny went back to his old job as lifeguard in a Turkish bath, Playbill. And we'll be with you again next Sunday night at the same time. Jack had to rush away to do another broadcast, folks. Say, Mary, you know we forgot to do one of the best songs in the picture. Which one is that? The Wishing Well number. You know where you heard the echo? Oh, yes, we'll do it now, Andy. So you get down in the well and be the echo. Okay. I'm wishing I'm wishing For the one I love To find me To find me Bill, hand me that bucket no. Good night, everybody The Jell-O program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Kenny Baker, and yours truly, Don Wilson. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we turn back the clock and take you to the drugstore across the street from the NBC building here in Hollywood. The time is exactly 15 minutes before this broadcast. Take it away, drugstore. You'll have to hurry, Mary. We haven't got much time. Well, I'm hungry. Look, if you'll wait till after the broadcast, I'll take you out and buy you a full-course dinner. I'm no gambler. I'll take a sandwich now. All right, it's up to you. Say, uh, here's a couple of seats here. <coughs> Whoops! Madam, would you mind taking your peak and knees off this seat? These stools are for customers. Well, Cuddles is having a hot fudge Sunday. Oh, he is. 
That's all his face needs, some hot fudge on it. Stop arguing, Jack. Here's a couple of seats over here. Okay. Hmm, cuddled yet. <laughs> oh, hello there. Hello, Mary. What'll it be today? Oh, just a sandwich. I'll have a peanut butter, jelly, olive, nut, bacon, cheese, roast beef, and turkey on whole wheat. Wow. <laughs> oh, Gilroy. Yes, Radcliffe. Hit the jackpot on whole wheat. <laughs> Want something else, Mary? No, that'll be all. Okay. What do your father have? I'll have... I'm not her father. <laughs> I'm Jack Benny. Now, let's see. I think I'll take the businessman's lunch. Are you a businessman? No. Then you can't have it. <laughs> now, wait a minute, young man. I ordered the businessman's lunch, and I'm going to get it... Ouch! Oh, Cuddles, did you bite that man's ankle? Ankle nothing and take him off that stool. <laughs> fine, fine Pekingese. Well, I bought him at a sale. A sale? Yes, he was marked down from a great dame. <laughs> well, that's very interesting. All right, mister, what do you have? Oh, I'm not in the mood to eat now. Uh, just bring me a cup of coffee. Oh, here's something good, Jack. A Dunker Special. A Dunker Special? What's that? Uh, coffee, donuts, and rubber gloves. Fifteen cents. <laughs> well, that's very sanitary, but not for me. Oh, I know what. Uh, I'll have a chocolate malted milk. A chocolate malted milk? Yes, and uh, put an egg in it. Fried or scrambled? <laughs> Look, I want a malted milk with just a plain raw egg in it. A raw egg. Okay, Oh, Gilroy. Yes, Radcliffe. One malt of milk for a barbarian. <laughs> what a smart alley. Now, uh, pardon me. I'd like two aspirin tablets and a glass of water. Yes, sir. Here you are. Hmm. This taste is familiar. Here's your sandwich, Mary. A five-decker. Oh, boy. Isn't that something? Yeah. It looks like Grauman's Chinese with potato chips. <laughs> That's right. It's even got footprints in the mayonnaise. Oh, you're just making that up. Here's your malted milk, Groucho. Hey, wait a minute, you I ordered a malted milk And this is an ice cream soda That's not ice cream, that's an egg Well, the least you could do is take it out of the shell You clumsy dope, can't you break an egg? If I could break an egg, I'd punch you right in the nose <laughs> Oh, you would Say, Radcliffe, is that man annoying you? No, Gilroy, put down that cupcake <laughs> Fine way to treat customers, I must say. Oh, fine. Jack, look. Cuddles, I'll give you just ten. Cuddles, I'll give you just ten to let go of my garter. One, two, three. Ooh, my leg. <laughs> Darn it, he ruined a perfectly good pair of garters. Go on, you've had new elastic put in him twelve times. <laughs> Well, the metal isn't the least bit rusty. <laughs> Gee, I don't want this malted milk now. Well, why don't you order something else, Jack? Yeah. Say, buddy, what's that lady having over there with the ice cream, pineapple, whipped cream, and marshmallow, and the cherry on top? Where? Right over there. That's her husband. <laughs> oh. Odd looking, isn't he? I'll tell you what, uh, just bring me a cup of coffee. Coffee? Yes. Sanka panka or schmanka? <laughs> Look, just bring me a cup of coffee with no ad lib. Pardon me. I'd like two more aspirin tablets and a glass of water. Yes, sir. Here you are. You know, Mary, I've seen that guy someplace. Oh, hello, Kenny. Hiya, Jack. i got to grab something to eat quick. My girl's waiting outside. Your girl's waiting outside? Why don't you bring her in? She's watching my bicycle. Oh. <laughs> Gee whiz, can't you put a lock on the bicycle? No, I trust her. <laughs> Well, that's mighty sweet of you. Hiya, Kenny. What'll it be? Oh, let's see. Uh, give me a tuna fish sandwich on rye bread. Okay. No butter, no lettuce, no mayonnaise. Oh, Gilroy. Yes, Radcliffe. One tuna on rye. No brush, no lather, no rub in. <laughs> now, now that's just showing off. Oh, say, Radcliffe. I want a side order of coleslaw with that. Just a minute. Hey, Gil. Yes, Brad. Have we got any coleslaw? Oh, just scads of it. 
Well, that's entrancing. Oh, Jack, there's a scale over there. I think I'll go over and weigh myself. Okay. Oh, wait a minute, Mary. I'll go with you. Don't eat my sandwich, Jack. I won't. Say, I wonder what time it is, anyway. <laughs> oh, go away, you little runt. Scat. Come here, Cuddles. He's just jealous because you've got hair. <laughs> Uh, pardon me. I'd like two more aspirin tablets and a glass of water. Yes, sir. <laughs> hmm. That's six aspirin tablets. Say, mister, have you got a headache? No, but don't tell the clerk. He'll think I'm nuts. <laughs> so low. <laughs> oh, now I know who he is. That guy's crazier than my Aunt Minnie's quill. <laughs> Say, Jack, if we don't want to be late, we better be getting over to the studio. Yeah, we're out in a few minutes, sir. Oh, Jack, I just got on the scale, and how much do you think I weigh? How much? A hundred and three pounds. Boy, have I been put on weight. You've been what? <laughs> I say I've been putting on weight. Boy, have I been put on in weight. A hundred... A hundred and three pounds, and you put on weight. Yeah, I only weighed seven when I was born. <laughs> well, you better watch yourself. And you know what else, Jack? Uh, Kenny got one of those little cards with a fortune on it. Oh, he did? What does it say? Uh, here it is. It says that you are shrewd, clever, and intelligent until you open your mouth. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> you said it. Say, Don. Hey, Don, what's your weight, anyway? Oh, I really don't know, Jack. But well, come on. Here's a good chance to find out. Oh, no. Nothing to it. Oh, come on, Don. Here. Come here. I've got a penny. You better put in a nickel. Here we are. Now, get on the scale. Oh, this silly. Silly nothing. Now, stand still. All right. Here, Kitty, hold my hat. A lot of difference that'll make. Now, hold still, Don. Wow, look at that. 100? 150? 175? 200? 250? God! 300? <laughs> oh, my goodness, he brought the scale. Oh, my Penny, help me pick up Don. Okay. Hey, Jack, the last fortune just came out of the scale. What does it say? Hey, you better run. Here comes the manager. That's a good idea. Let's get out of here. Oh, Gilroy. Yes, Redcliffe. Turn on the radio. It's time for the Jello program. Come along, Cuddles. That was Could Be Played by the Orchestra. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you listened into Fred Allen's program last Wednesday night, I bring you a man who needs no further introduction Jack Benny. Hello again, this is Jack Benny talking, and Don, I gather from that little announcement of yours that Alan was throwing verbal darts at my bullseye again, is that it? Yes, Jack, didn't you hear him? No, my radio was on, but unfortunately I was eating celery at the time. <laughs> the loud kind from Utah. <laughs> Tell me, uh, was Alan as witty as ever, or was he better? Well, Jack, I have to admit he did get a lot of laughs at your expense. Oh, he did? Well, I won't have to worry about him long. Uh, television will soon be here, and he'll either have to have his face lifted or get in a barrel and broadcast through a bunghole. <laughs> now, wait a minute, Jack. Alan may not be handsome, but when you come right down to it, he isn't so bad looking. He isn't. Don, he's the only Irishman I ever saw that could eat in a Chinese restaurant and be mistaken for a waiter. <laughs> If he wasn't allergic to soap and water, he could open a laundry. <laughs> now, let's drop the subject of Mr. Allen. Oh, by the way, Don, I noticed you were limping when you came into the studio just now. <laughs> Did you have an accident of some kind? <laughs> well, uh, uh... Come on, Don, tell us. Well, let me see. Oh, yes, I was out riding this morning and my horse threw me. Oh, threw you? Don, there's a possibility that you could have fallen off a horse. But the horse that can throw you doesn't live. <laughs> Tell me, Fibber McWilson, uh, how, did this, how did this unfortunate accident happen? Well, Jack, it was like this. I was cantering through the park Oh, this sure, morning. sure. Just stop, Don. Folks, i got to tell you what really happened to Wilson. We were in a drugstore just before our Now, program. Jack! Anyway, Don stepped on the weighing machine, and right now it's getting pennies in heaven. <laughs> Boy, what a wreck. Jack, I wish you hadn't said that. Now people will get the idea that I'm really fat. Fat? Don, when you step into your shoes... Your rubber heels spread out like pancake batter. (laughs) 
I can't understand how a guy can gain so much weight on the salaries I pay. <laughs> You're not kidding. <laughs> you know, Don, every time I look at you... Hmm. That woman would have to bring Cuddles to the broadcast. Oh, hello, Phil. Hiya, Jackson. How's the boy? Jackson? Phil, every time I meet you lately, you call me Jackson. What's the big idea? Well, that's as close as I can get to jackass and still be polite. <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha, that's very funny You know, Phil, you're clever enough to have your own program Which you better start looking for Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, Jack, I couldn't let you down You need a guy like me around here Oh, I do Sure, after all, I'm the only sex appeal on the show Is that so, Phil? Did you by any chance... Hear me on the Screen Actors Guild program last week and that romantic bit with Joan Crawford. Oh, was that you? I thought it was Guy Kibbe. <laughs> you knew darn well it was me. I got that smart wire you sent me. I didn't send you any wire. Not much. Who else would send me a ten-word telegram with seven lousies in it? <laughs> And another thing, Phil, the next time you send a wire from Pomona, don't sign it George Bernard Shaw. He moved from there. <laughs> you know, Harris, you remind me of a guy. Of a guy. Madam, madam, must your, must your dog bark when I'm talking? You don't expect him to laugh, do you? <laughs> no, but he can wipe that sneer off his face. Now, keep him quiet, please. Let's see, what was I talking about? I don't know, I just came in. Oh, hello, Mary. Hello. Say, Mary, Jack was just telling us about the program he did with Joan Crawford last week. Were you there? I'll say I was. And boy, was Jack nervous. I wasn't nervous at all. Naturally, I was a little teed up working with Miss Crawford, but I was not nervous. You weren't? No. Do you always sit down on chairs when they're not there? <laughs> oh, I just did that for a laugh, that's all. Everything went along fine. <laughs> did you tell the boys what happened at rehearsal, Jack? What was it, Mary? Oh, <laughs> Well, they were just about to finish their big scene, and Jack was supposed to kiss Miss Crawford. Yes? Well, Jack grabbed Joan in his arms and bent her over backwards. Yes? <laughs> then he bent her over a little further. Uh-huh. Now, Mary. <laughs> then a little more. <laughs> and what happened? Jack's toupee fell right in her face, and she fainted. <laughs> Now, Mary, that wasn't my toupee at all. That was my beanie. Well, well, it had a part in it. Mary, that only happened at rehearsal, but the routine sounded all right over the air. Believe me. Not according to Fred Allen Wednesday night. Say, what is Allen anyway? A barometer or something? If he doesn't learn to keep his mouth shut, I'm going to do something about it. I wouldn't get tough with him, Jack. You know, Allen's a pretty athletic guy. Athletic? Sure, I saw a picture of him in a fan magazine the other day, and he was posing in tights and boxing gloves. Yeah, but the hair on his chest said, welcome on it. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of that picture, fellas, did you notice his legs? They look like two sleepy people. <laughs> Imagine Alan posing as a fighter. Huh. One of these days, I'm going to have my picture taken being shot out of a cannon. <laughs> and in a leopard skin. I'll show him. All right, champ, relax. Take it easy. Lead me to him. <laughs> I'll, I'll get in the ring with Alan any day. <laughs> what are you laughing at? You wouldn't get in the ring with Ferdinand the Bull. <laughs> It was very cute, Mary. When Phil has his own program, you're going to be a big help to him. We've got... <laughs> yeah. We've got the first show all written. Oh, I see. And what are you going to call your little comedy act? Mary and Phil. Corn as you like it. <laughs> well, you certainly got the right title. Say, where's Kenny? It's time for him to do a song. Here I am, Jack. Oh, where were you, Kenny? I was over in the corner counting my toes. <laughs> counting your toes? Yeah, I count and I count and I still get 22. Kenny, either your arithmetic is bad or Ripley is waiting for you. <laughs> and next time, don't come in here with such a silly routine at all. Well, I was just trying it out for Phil's new show. Listen, Kenny, I just said that a while ago when I was mad. Phil isn't going to have his own show. He is, too. He offered me $8,000 in car fare. Oh, he's very generous, isn't he? $8,000 a week, huh? Not only that, I get extra money for writing the program. Oh, you're going to write the show, too. Well, that ought to be worth listening to you. Yeah, not only that... Oh, quiet! <laughs> now, go ahead with your song. Wait a minute. 
Say, Phil, is it all right if I sing on this program? Sure, kid, but hold back a little. Now yeah. cut out this foolish. <laughs> now you get up that microphone, young man, and sing. All right. <laughs> oh, shut up. Sing, Cuddle. I mean, Kenny. <laughs> That was Deep in a Dream, sung by Kenny Baker. And, Kenny, that's one of the best songs you've sung this year. I know you put so much feeling into it. Really, it was thrilling. Oh, you're just trying to flatter me so I'll stay with your program. <laughs> flatter you? I can see through that, brother. <laughs> Kenny, for three years now, I've been raving about your voice, and all of a sudden it's flattery. You ungrateful little brat. Now, wait a minute, you. Don't aggravate my tenor. <laughs> Phil, I refuse to continue this discussion about your imaginary program. However, if you happen, do happen to get one, I'd only be too glad to let you have Kenny and Mary. Be sure to take those broken-down troubadours with you. <laughs> ah, no, I'm sending them to Paul Whiteman. Well, don't send them COD or they'll return with the swallows. <laughs> anyway, Phil, as far as I'm concerned, you and Kenny and Mary can all go. Just leave me good old Don Wilson and I'm satisfied. Well, you should be. You're still getting more than half. Well, let me ask you something, Mary. Suppose you did go with Phil. Who's going to give you those good, snappy jokes? You mean like that last one? <laughs> yeah, don't be cute. Who's going to write your material? Oh, we've got two swell writers. Oh, yeah? Who are they? Noel Coward and Maxie Rosenblum. <laughs> a fine combination. Of course, I don't know what I'm getting myself all worked up for. It's all so silly. Well, don't worry, Jack. No matter what happens, I won't leave you. I'll stick with you. a boy, Don. Thanks, Don. You're a real pill. Pal. <laughs> Maybe that'll teach these traitors here something about loyalty. Well, gee whiz, Jack. We're not the only ones. I heard you on a program with Joan Crawford last week. Well, that was a special broadcast, Kenny, for one appearance only. Say, how'd you like it? Oh, it was swell. Say, Jack, I was wondering, is Joan Crawford as beautiful as she looks? Well, of course she's beautiful And she's marvelous to work with Gee, I got so excited listening to the broadcast Did you really kiss her? Why, <laughs> why certainly I did Who held her? <laughs> Phil, don't be so flippant Miss Crawford enjoyed working me, with me very much She told me so and as a little memento of the broadcast, I sent her a lovely bottle of perfume. Well. In fact, I sent Rochester over to her house with it this morning. You were on the air with her a week ago. Why did you wait till today to send her perfume? Rochester was making it. <laughs> it's nothing of the kind. I sent Joan some real imported stuff. It's called uh, La Lune Bleure de Boeuf de l'Amour. What does that mean? Love at Twilight also removes stains. <laughs> How do you know, Mary? Do you speak French? Woo, woo, monsieur. <laughs> well, you're all wrong. It's exquisite perfume, and I'm sure Miss Crawford will like it. And now, ladies and gentlemen, if I may interrupt my cast, I would like to announce our play for next week. As a special treat, we are going to offer our version of the Encyclopedia Britannica. <laughs> Now, I will play the part. Uh, pardon me, folks. Hello? Hello again. This is Rochester talking. I know who it is. What do you want? Say, boss, I don't think I'm going to be able to pick you up after the broadcast. Your car's on the bum. What's wrong with it? Well, for one thing, the back tires are flatter than Mr. Wilson's rubber heels. Well, for heaven's sake, get busy. Can't you blow up the tires? The pump ain't no good since you made those cream puffs with it. <laughs> Oh, that's right. Well, gee whiz, how am I going to get home? Why don't you take a taxi? I'll split it with you. <laughs> well, that's very kind of you, but I'll manage somehow. See you later. So long, boy. So long. Oh, Rochester, uh, did you take that perfume over to Miss Crawford? Yes, sir, in person. That's good. Did she open it? No, she just took a slow look at the price tag and then a quick one. <laughs> Why, darn you, Rochester, I told you to take the price tag off the bottle. Well, don't worry, boss, I raised it. <laughs> raised it? I put a one in front, it's twelve fifty now. <laughs> well, 
Well, I gotta hand it to you, Rochester. That was quick thinking. Yeah, but maybe I shouldn't have done it in front of her. <laughs> maybe you shouldn't. I don't know why I ever trust you to do anything. You show absolutely no judgment or foresight. I'm a butler, not a swami. <laughs> All right, forget it. Next time I'll know better. So long, boss. So long. By the way, Rochester, just a minute. I just thought of something. If the car is out of commission and you can't pick me up tonight, how did you get over to Miss Crawford's house with that perfume? I'll think of something before you get home. Goodbye. <laughs> hmm. He better think of something. What's the matter, Jack? Listen, Phil, you'll not only have your own program, but you might also have a very good end man. Play, boy. <laughs> We're a little late, so good night, folks. The Jell-O Program, starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Kenny Baker, and yours truly, Don Wilson. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we bring you a man who used to be a beautiful baby, Jack Benny. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hello again, this is Jack Benny talking. And Don, I like that uh, beautiful baby introduction. Was that just a lucky guess, or did you have authentic information? Well, Jack, when I was over to your house for dinner the other night, I took a peek at that old family album of yours. Oh, Don. And I must say, you were a gorgeous infant. Were you really so good looking? Well, I don't want to sound foolish or anything like that, but for the first 17 months of my life, I was a length ahead of Robert Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, I won four blue diapers. <laughs> I can imagine. And you know, Jack, one thing that impressed me very much about your baby pictures, you were always laughing and giggling. What made you so happy? Well, Don, my nurse used to slap me a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Say, I bet you were quite a healthy-looking kid yourself, weren't you? Well, Jack, I... See, I can just see you as a baby, Don, bouncing your mother on your knee. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, I'd like to be a baby again. Yeah, I really couldn't keep talking like this, but yeah, I was about the cutest little Dickens in Waukegan. In fact, people from all around used to come to my father's meat market just to see me. Meat market? Why about your father ran a clothing store? Well, Don, it was a combination meat market and clothing store. You know, on Saturdays we used to have a special: a pound of hamburger with two pair of pants. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it went over very big. Say, that's quite a novelty. A combination meat market and clothing store. Yeah, we used to sell legs of lamb with garters on them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, those were the days, believe me. You know, I remember one time when I was only... Hello, old... Jack. What are you talking about? Me. Oh, that again. See you later. Mary, come back here. It's not my fault. Don just happened to mention that he saw my family album and that I was a beautiful child. You beautiful? Yes, I was. Not only that, I developed very quickly. Now, when I was only three months old, I had four lovely teeth. Well, you're right back where you started from. <laughs> now, listen, Mary, I have a full set of teeth right now. And with the exception of a little argument I had with a cab driver in Toledo, they're all my own. <laughs> Go on, you've got more bridges in San Francisco. Oh, running down San Francisco, huh? <laughs> That's the trouble with you, Los Angeles girl. <laughs> Jack, did I hear you say that you had an argument with a cab driver in Toledo? Yes, but of course that was years ago. What was the fight all about? Oh, nothing. He just happened to say something I didn't like, and he hit me. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, Toledo was lovely. Say, Don, when you were looking through that album, did you see the picture of Jack's uncle on the big white horse? Yes, I did. <laughs> that was my uncle Beaumont. <laughs> and did you see the tree in back with the rope dangling from it and that big crowd of men standing around? <laughs> Mary, my uncle didn't steal that horse. That was just a scene from a Western movie he was making called The Code of the West. It wasn't a real hanging. <laughs> well, what are you laughing at? Just the same. He never saw the preview. <laughs> He did, too, and he was a fine actor. Say, Jack. Oh, hello, Kenny. I didn't see you. Oh, I was around here. I heard you telling everybody what a beautiful baby you were. Well, Don brought up the subject. I had never mentioned it. Have you got any cute baby pictures, Kenny? None where I'm facing the camera. (laughs) 
Oh. You know, Jack, I wasn't a very pretty kid, but I was as smart as a whip. Smart? I bet you were. All right, you can laugh. Well, when I was 12 years old, I recited the Gettysburg Address. At 12? What's clever about that? Could Lincoln do it? <laughs> All right, Kenny, we won't go into that. But if you were so smart at the age of 12, I'd like to know what happened to you in the meantime. So would I. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what, Kenny, sing your song, uh, sing your song now, we'll talk about it later. <laughs> hey, uh, hey, Don, where's Phil? Oh, he's around here somewhere. By the way, Jack, I don't know whether I ought to tell you this or not, but Phil's pretty sore about that crack you made last Sunday. What crack? Oh, you know, and you told him that if he didn't like it here, he could go out and get his own program. Oh, well, gee, Don, I was only kidding. I, I didn't mean anything by it. Well, Phil took it pretty seriously, and he said he's gonna leave. Leave me? Why... Why, I made the guy. See, when I picked him up, he was demonstrating curlers in a drugstore window. <laughs> oh, I must talk to him. Sing, Kenny. See, people are so sensitive nowadays. You tell them to quit, and they quit. I can't understand. <laughs> Penny Serenade, sung by Kenny Baker, my favorite tenor. Say, uh, Kenny, did Phil happen to say anything further to you about doing his own program? Yes, he mentioned it. He did, huh? Well, what'd he tell you? Funny, but I ain't no pigeonhole. <laughs> that stool pigeon. Pigeonhole. Say, Mary, did Phil say anything to you about this wild scheme of his? Well, yes and no. What do you mean, yes or no? Yes, he told me, and no, I ain't going to tell you. <laughs> well, all right, I'm not. Anyway, I think Phil ought to be at least loyal enough to discuss it with me before he takes any definite step. Hey, Jack, here comes Phil now. Oh, yeah. Oh, hello, Phil. Hiya, Jackson. How's the boy? Jackson? <laughs> you know, Phil, is cute the way you call me that every week, you know? <laughs> Say, uh, uh, what's this gag I hear about you getting your own program? Not a gag. You and I have been fighting so much lately that I thought it would be better to call it quit. Oh, that's silly. Silly nothing. You're just tough to get along with, and that's all. Who, me? Yes, you. You're always flying off the handle. I am not. I'm sweet and love them. You're always yelling and shouting at me. Shouting at me? And you're always losing your temper. Why, you baggy-eyed ingrate, I never lose my temper, and you know it. I love you, you rat. <laughs> no, sure, sure. Now, you listen to me, Phil Harris. See, you think they were married. <laughs> Keep out of this, Kenny. Let's forget it, Jack. You're just tough to work for, and that's that. Oh, I'm tough to work for. Did you hear that, Mary? You think I was a regular Simon Legree? All you need is a whip. <laughs> I wasn't talking to you. <laughs> now, look, Phil. Look, I'm not begging you to stay on this program. And get up off your knees. <laughs> I'm not on my knees, and I wish this was television so I could prove it. Look, Phil, I'm not begging you to stay, but if you leave, you're making a serious mistake. All right, Jack, give me one reason why I should stick with you. Just one reason. Well, well, in the first place... Go ahead, give me one reason. Well, well, for one thing, Phil Harris... All right, come on, why should I stick with you? Well, for one thing, we've got a contract. A fine contract. I supply the orchestra, and when people throw money at us, I have to split it with you. <laughs> Well, how often does that happen? Maybe once in a fortnight. <laughs> and another thing. Oh, Jack, what are you beefing about? If Phil wants to go, let him go. Certainly. You can get Abe Lyman to take his place. Oh, that would be fine. Abe Lyman happens to be the cab driver that punched me in Toledo. <laughs> That's all I need. Jack, you know a lot about music. Now, why don't you form an orchestra of your own? Well, maybe I will. Say, I could organize a darn good swing band, believe me. If you do, I got a swell name for it. Never mind. What is it, Mary? Jack Benny and his cut rate twelve. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, Mary, I don't have to worry about getting a band together because Phil is only bluffing. If he went out on his own, where would he get a sponsor? Don't worry about me. I've got a sponsor. Oh, you have, eh? Well, who is it? I mean, what's your product? Sixties bubble gum. Sixties <laughs> bubble gum? I never heard of it. Well, here, have a stick. Keep it. Hmm, bubble gum. That's not the only offer I had. I could have gone on the air for Macmillan's corn plastic. 
Corn plaster? Yes, corn plaster. Well, that would be more your style. Half the time you're corny and the other half you're plaster. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> if you're smart, Phil, you'd stay right here on the Jello program, and I'll try and make life a little easier for you. And now, ladies and gentlemen, pardon me, come in. Well, the mayor of Van Nuys. Hello, Andy. Hiya, bud. <laughs> Wahoo! Well, Andy, it's nice seeing you. You don't get around here as often as you used to. Well, Buck, by the time I get through with the farm and the city hall and my love life, I'm pretty busy. Love, huh? So you're going in for a little romance, eh, Andy? Little nothing. She weighs 300 pounds. 300 pounds? Why, you never told me about her before. Say, she ought to make a nice wife for Andy, huh, Mary? Yeah, he can hitch her to the plow. <laughs> Well, Andy, uh... Well, Andy, tell me, you're going to get married? Well, that's the reason I came down here, Buck. I'd like to ask your advice. Well, Andy, as long as you want my advice, all I can say is, if you love the girl, go right ahead and propose to her. Well, I have, but every time I do, she just looks at me and giggles. Giggles? The pa thinks she's an idiot. <laughs> Oh, what does your maw think? Ma, sir, Paul's a fine one to talk. <laughs> well, Andy, don't pay any attention to them. Just follow your own heart. Say, is this girl from Van Nuys? Yeah, she's in business out there. She's a plumber. <laughs> oh, a lady plumber. Oh, uh, well, 300 pounds. Say, Andy, how do you manage to hold her on your lap? Well, my hired man sits alongside of me. <laughs> Well, Andy, all I can say is don't let anybody interfere with your happiness. If you love the girl, marry her. And I wish you a lot of luck. Uh, thanks, Buck. I feel better now. That's good. Hey, Andy, uh, stick around, will you? I'd like to talk to you after the program. Well, what about Phil? Well, it's a business proposition, and I don't want to discuss it in front of Jack. Now, Phil, you've got a number to play, so spit out your bubble gum and go to work. <laughs> okay, boss. Oh, Andy, how about coming over to my house tomorrow for dinner and bring your folks? Thanks, Buck. Is it all right if my girl comes along? Sure, Andy. Bring her to dinner, too. Why not? It's about time she lost some weight. <laughs> Quiet, Mary. I'm just trying to be nice. Play, Phil. Yes, sir. That was well. That was This Can't Be Love, played by smiling Phil Harris and his rhythm rascal. And, Phil, that's what I call real flash. You know, that number had so much life and brilliance to it. Thanks, but I'm leaving just the same. <laughs> Phil, I wasn't trying to flatter you. That number was swell, and I felt I ought to give you and the boys credit. All of a sudden, the orchestra is good. <laughs> yeah, some obviousness. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Well, anyhow, to get on with our play, tonight, ladies and gentlemen, as I announced last week, we are going to present our version of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Now, I will play the part of... Say, Buck, it's none of my business, but did you hear Fred Allen Wednesday night? Allen? No, Andy, I missed him again. Uh, tell me, what did my Oriental friend have to say? I mean, anything worth probing into? Oh, he hopped all over you, Buck. Yeah. He said he's going to push your spine so far down your pants you're going to walk like a tripod. <laughs> Ha, ha, and hook. No kidding, Jack. Fred make you look like a nickel. Listen, Mary, he couldn't make me look like a nickel if my father was a buffalo. <laughs> He's nothing but a fake. Fake? Then how come he challenged you to a fight? That's a laugh. How can he fight? In the first place, he's terribly nearsighted. Nearsighted? Yes. I saw him at a party one night trying to make a date with a hall tree. <laughs> I finally had to tell him that the umbrella stand was her little boy. <laughs> <laughs> that guy No kidding, Jack Are Alan's eyes really that bad? Bad, Don To him, Hedy Lamar is just a gorgeous blur <laughs> <laughs> I'd go in the ring with Alan any time Be careful, he might hit you from memory 
Listen, Mary, he couldn't hit me if he put wheels on his wrist and they ran up to my nose on a track. <laughs> now, listen, fellas. Come here a minute, will you? I got a secret about Alan that I've been guarding for years. I never was going to mention it, but I'm so burned up that tonight I'm going to show you what a heel he really is. What do you mean, Jack? Well, in the first place, he ought to be the last one in the world to ever say anything against me. Why? Well, because 12 years ago, when we were in Baltimore together, I saved Fred Allen's life. That's why. You saved his life? Yes. Now, let's forget it. I don't want to talk about it. Okay. Oh, no, you don't. <laughs> It was, it was 12 years ago in Altoona, Pennsylvania. We were both, we were both on the same bill, Fred and I, at the Palace Theater. I'll never forget that night. Alan, who was then a juggler, was standing in the wings waiting to go on. And I, the headliner, stopped to give him a word of encouragement. Hello, Freddy. Hello, Mr. Benny. Oh, you can call me Jack. What's the matter? You seem a little nervous tonight, Freddy. Well, gee, Mr. Benny, it, uh, talking to a big star like you is quite a thrill for me. Oh, don't say that. <laughs> well, Freddy, Fink's mules are about through, so it's time for your act. <laughs> so go out on the stage and juggle those clubs. Gee, I wish I was a great comedian like you. Well, why don't you try telling some gags while you're out there juggling? Oh, I can never think of anything clever to say. You see, folks? <laughs> well, keep plugging, Freddy. You might get there one of these days. They're ready for your act now. <laughs> that was his theme song, folks. Chinatown. Get it? <laughs> My first trick, ladies and gentlemen, will be juggling three Indian clubs at the same time. <laughs> Three clubs, some tricks. There he goes, dropping him as usual. Darn it. Bring on Jack Benny. Yeah, bring on Benny. Altoona was one of my best pounds. <laughs> he, Alan, is nervous. And now for my next trick, ladies and gentlemen, I will juggle three Indian clubs and a cannonball at the same time. Cannonball? I never saw him do this one before. Say, hey, that's pretty good. Oh! Good heavens! The cannonball dropped on Alan's foot. He's hurt badly. Ring down the curtain. Stand back, everybody. Give him air. What happened, mister? Can't you see he dropped a cannonball on his foot? Oh! oh. Don't worry, Freddy. I'll take you to the hospital at once. And you're going to be all right. <laughs> well, folks, we finally got Alan to the hospital. And after I paid his entrance fee, which I never got back, <laughs> they took him to the operating room, and the doctor called me aside and said, Mr. Benny, I'm afraid this is serious. What do you mean, doctor? When that cannonball dropped on Alan's foot, it severed the femur and the anterior portion of the tibia. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> There's only one thing that can save him. What's that, doctor? I'll do anything. He must have a blood transfusion immediately. A blood transfusion? <laughs> Thank you. Well, Doctor, all I can say is, this unfortunate young man is my friend. And if my blood can save his life, I am ready. So they took Alan to the operating room, placed my foot next to his, and the doctor said to the nurse, Are you ready for the transfusion, Miss Stewart? Yes, Doctor. Then hand me that ice pack. <laughs> Wait a minute, don't I get an anesthetic for this? Yes. Oh, nurse, stand Mr. Benny with a herring. <laughs> if you do, I'll snap at it. Make it quick, doctor. Oh, doctor, doctor. Hurry, doc, please. Alan is sinking fast. All right. We'll just tap your vein here and attach a hose to it. Go ahead, doctor. I'm not afraid. Oh, I'm in awful pain now, folks. See what I went through for that mandarin? There we are. All right, Miss Stewart, open the valve and draw the blood. Yes, doctor. My goodness! <laughs> Here, 
Here, take it easy, Doc. That's not ketchup, you know. <laughs> and don't forget to wipe my windshield. All right, Miss Stewart, that's enough. Enough? I look like a bottle of milk now. But it was worth it for good old Fred. So thanks to me, the transfusion was successful. And the next day I visited Alan, Alan in his private room in the hospital, which I also paid for. Hello, Freddy. How do you feel, kid? I'm much better, Mr. Denny. And as long as I live, I will never forget what you did for me. Don't mention it, Freddy. You know, Mr. Benny, since that transfusion yesterday, I feel entirely different. I feel so mentally alert. No fool. I keep thinking of jokes all the time, and I owe it all to you. Now, please. Here, Mr. Benny, have a cigar. Oh, thank you. I'll smoke it later. No, smoke it now. Here, I'll light it for you. Okay. Say, the cigar is very... Why, darn you, that cigar was loaded. Oh, ha, ha, ha. That's my first joke. So you see, ladies and gentlemen, my blood not only saved Alan's life, but made him the comedian he is today. I thank you. There you are, fellas. That little play shows what a heel Alan really is. Oh, Jack, I don't believe that big cannibal really fell on Alan's foot. Oh, you don't, eh? Well, for your information, young lady, he still buys his shoes from the same store as Donald Duck. Play, (laughs) Phil. And we will be with you again next Sunday night at the same time. And don't forget, folks, if you have not already done so, you can help fight infantile paralysis by joining the March of Dimes. You know, Mary, I hated to expose Fred Allen like that, but after all, what could I do? Well, I don't blame you. I'll tell you something else, Mary. I'm the kind of a guy that if Allen needed another transfusion, I'd be the first one to volunteer. Go on. You haven't any more blood than a piece of salt pork. Hmm. (laughs) Good night, folks. The Jell-O program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Kenny Baker, and yours truly, Don Wilson. And now, ladies and gentlemen, tonight we bring you... Oh, just a moment, folks. Mary! Mary, where's Jack? He'll be right in. He's in the next room sending a telegram. Oh, he's been in there ten minutes. What's it all about? I don't know. Jack said it was none of my business, so let's open the door and listen. Oh, I wouldn't do that, Mary. It isn't cricket. We're not in England now. Open it up, Mary. Okay. Gee, he looks mad. Operator. Operator, will you please pay attention? I asked for Western Union. You gave me the Plumbers Union three times. I did? Yes, I'm not a plumber. I don't know a plunger from a trombone. (laughs) Now, will you please get me Western Union? All right, handsome. Handsome? Well, you can't even see my face. Well, I can dream, can't I? (laughs) That's all you've been doing. Now, will you please make it snappy? Just a moment, I'll let you talk to information. Look, I don't want to talk to information. For goodness sake, you can talk to the girl. You don't have to marry her. (laughs) Look, miss, I'm in a hurry. Will you please get me Western Union? Okay. Hmm. See, that guy fights with everybody. Especially on telephone. Why aren't you two? Here's your party. It's about time. Hello? Western Meat Market. What's your order, please? <laughs> I'd like a pound. Of... Hey, wait a minute. I've got the wrong number. Operator. Operator. Number, please. Look, operator, this is old faithful talking. <laughs> Now, if it's all right with you, I'd like to send a telegram. Oh, you want Western Union? Yes, and congratulations. <laughs> this is the longest conversation since Cohen on the telephone. Now, look, operator, it's the last time I'm going to... Hello, ask... this is Western Union. What? This is Western Union. Well, for heaven's sake, it's sure good to hear your voice. How are you? Oh, hello, Joe. When did you get in town? I'm sorry, miss, but I'm not Joe. Look, I want to send a wire to Fred Allen, New York City. Oh, so that's the big mystery. This ought to be good. You get the name, Miss Fred Allen. Allen, how do you spell it? A is an anteater, L is in liar, another L is in leech, E N. <laughs> now here's the message. Dear Mr. Allen, heard your program again last Wednesday, and this is your final warning. Oh, did you hear him too? I thought I'd die when he said Jack Benny was a male impersonator. <laughs> <laughs> A 
was very funny. Now, take my message. Oh, yes, sir. Mr. Allen, if you ever mention the name of Jack Benny again, the undersigned will personally come to New York and kick your new but unpaid-for teeth out. <laughs> Have you got that? Yeah. Good. Sign it, The Clutching Hand. How much is that? Straight message. Just a moment, please. The Clutching Hand? Where did Jack get that name? Oh, you know his rheumatism. <laughs> Quiet, let's go back. How much is it, miss? I haven't got all day. That'll be $2.46 for a straight message. Fine, send it collect. Thank you, Mr. Hand. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> well, that's that. Al will never guess who sent that wire, and he'll be plenty scared. Oh, now what? Hello? Hello, I got Western Union for you. I, I just talked to Western Union. Young lady, how do you keep your job anyway? Well, right now I'm sitting on the boss's lap. <laughs> oh, 800 telephone operators in this city, and I had to get her. <laughs> I, I'm sorry I'm late, Don. You can introduce me now. Okay, that was one o'clock jump played by the orchestra. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we bring you that suave comedian, that sophisticated humorist, that clutching hand, Jack Benny. <laughs> Hello again, this is Jack Benny talking, clutching hand. Don, what's the matter with this gang anyway? Can't I even make a telephone call without everybody eavesdropping? Well, Jack, it really wasn't my idea. Oh, it wasn't? No, I thought of it. You know me, I'm just a spy at heart. Oh, you are? Well, listen, Matta Harris. <laughs> I think... I think spying is about as low a trick as any human being can possibly do. You're right, Jack. Certainly I'm right. Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Clutch. <laughs> oh, you too huh? well, If you want to know something, Mary You're nothing but a little snoop Well, at least I never sign a fake name to a telegram Yeah, where did you get that clutching hand stuff? Phil, it so happens that that was my nickname when I was a kid Everybody used to call me clutching hand Benny Why? Because I never had a belt for my pants <laughs> That's why are you satisfied? Well, I got the impression you were trying to scare Fred Allen. Did you hear him Wednesday night? Yes, I heard him. I heard him. Every week I get the same question. Well, I tuned in last Wednesday, and I thought he was exceptionally amusing. Amusing? Don, I've listened to seashells that were more entertaining than Allen. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. And another thing, to hear Allen talk, you'd think I was a weakling and a coward. That's right, the Daily Double. <laughs> Quiet. <laughs> And you know, Jack, there isn't a week goes by that Alan doesn't mention how tight you are. He says, I'm tight. He's a fine one to talk. Any man that'll tar and feather his straw hat so he can wear it in the winter time. <laughs> well. No kidding, Jack. Is he really that stingy? Stingy? You want to hear something, Don? I went over to his house one day and caught him painting cheese on mouse traps. <laughs> isn't that awful, Mary? Starving a poor little mouse. Well, I never saw a fat one in your house. <laughs> well, that's all. I've got several with double chin. <laughs> anyway, let's drop, Alan. I'm talking about something a little more pleasant. Well, speaking of something pleasant, I have some good news for you, Jack. You have? What is it, Don? Well, Phil tells me he's not going to leave our program after all. Really? Why, Phil, what caused this sudden change in your plans? Well, Jack, I thought the whole thing over. And after all, you've always been a regular guy with me. Mm-hmm. And you're a pretty sweet fella to work for. Mm-hmm. And besides that, I had a little trouble with my sponsor. <laughs> oh, I thought it was something like that. What happened between you and the bubblegum king? Yeah. Well, uh, just as we were signing a contract where I was to direct the 90-piece symphony orchestra, they threw a net over him. <laughs> oh, I thought there was something crazy about that guy. Gee, Phil, didn't you suspect anything? Well, no, I thought he was all right. So one afternoon, we'd just finished the rehearsal. Uh-huh. And the sponsor said to me, can I take you home? I got my elephant waiting outside. <laughs> An elephant? He must have been batty. Say, Mary, you had lunch with him a couple of times. Didn't you notice he was nuts? I'll say. He used to order fruitcake and laugh at us. <laughs> Well, Phil, all I can say is I hope you've learned a lesson and be satisfied to work for a nice fellow like me. Oh, hello, Kenny. Hiya, Jack. Say, Jack, you want to hear something funny? <laughs> well, 
What is it, Jenny? I was in the restaurant across the street a few minutes ago, and you know, they got a new waitress there. Yeah. So I ordered a cup of coffee, and then I got to talking to her. Uh-huh. And I finally made a date to take her out tonight. Oh, boy. <laughs> Well, well, what are you laughing at? Boy, is she homely. <laughs> you certainly pick them, Kenny, so you dated her up, eh? <laughs> yeah. And you know what her name is? What? Buck Tooth Annie. <laughs> That's fine. Can you imagine that, Mary, going out with a girl that has buck teeth? Well, he's got to hang his hat someplace, don't he? <laughs> That's right. Well, Kenny, now that you're all excited about your date, have you got a good song for us tonight? Oh, sure. I got a pip. Well, that's well. Let's have it. Okay. Oh, say, Jack, not changing the subject, but uh, did you hear F.A. last Wednesday night? Yes, I heard F.A., and I thought he was L.Z. (laughs) Now, let's not bring that up again. Well, gee, didn't you laugh when he said your arm looks like a buggy whip with fingers? (laughs) My arm looks like a buggy whip, eh? Well, he ought to know. What do you mean, he ought to know? Don, when you're riding behind a horse and you take the buggy whip in your hand and hit something, well, he ought to know. (laughs) And now, Kenny, if you're ready, you may go ahead with your song. Wait a minute. Come in. Telegram for Jack Benny. Right here, boy. It's collect. Okay. Wait a minute, Mary. Don't touch it. That's from Fred Allen. Send it back, buddy. I refuse to accept it. Well, I refuse to be surprised. Goodbye. Well, Alan isn't going to catch me napping. Sing, Kenny. Imagine trying to hook me for a collect telegram. That, that was Please Come Out of Your Dream, sung by Kenny Baker, who never will. That was really beautiful, Kenny. Gee, some night I wish you'd sing five or six numbers on our program. I better get five or six checks, too. All right, Kenny, I was just paying you a compliment. Hmm, what a gang. And now, ladies and gentlemen, for our feature attraction tonight... Some compliment. And now, ladies and gentlemen, for our feature attraction tonight, we are going to present our version of Paramount's famous Chinese picture, Hop Along Cassidy. <laughs> now, I will play Hop... Mary will be long, and Kenny will... Pardon me, folks. Come in. Oh, it's you. Hello, Aubrey. Hiya, Chief. Everything's okay outside. How's it going in here? Oh, everything is fine, Aubrey. Uh, Just keep your eyes open, that's all. I got you, Chief. Ready to go home now? In a little while. Oh, fellas, uh, this is my bodyguard, Aubrey Mulligan. Your bodyguard? Yes, I just hired him today. My goodness, Jack, what do you need a bodyguard for? Somebody's got to help him find his glasses. <laughs> That's not the only reason, Mary. I figured that Alan might send some thugs out here to get me, and I want to be ready. Thugs, eh? Then you're not scared of Alan personally, is that it? Listen, Phil, why should I be scared of a fella who's so frail that he has fainting spells at least three times a week? Fainting spells? Yes. You know how Alan talks through his nose. You think that's adenoids, don't you? It is adenoids. It is not. That obstruction in his nose is built in smelling salts. (laughs) Well, the only reason I got Aubrey is for protection against Alan's henchmen. Aubrey, uh, sit down here and wait till the program is over. Okay. Hey, Chief, how about giving me a knockdown at the thing? Oh, yes. Yeah, this is Mary Livingston. Hiya, babe. What you doing tonight? Nothing. You want to shoot some pool? <laughs> Mary, that isn't nice. And now, ladies and gentlemen, as I started to announce before, tonight we are going to present... Uh... Pardon me. I'll take it. Hello? Hello, Mr. Benny. This is Rochester talking. Oh, what do you want? The telegram just came to the house for you. $8.80 collect. Well, don't accept it. That wire's from Fred Allen. He sent it to me for a gag. Well, he must be laughing now. I paid for it. <laughs> paid for it? Where did you get $8.80? I ripped open the mattress and dipped into your reserve fund. <laughs> oh, you did, eh? Well, stay away from there. Incidentally, I've been missing a lot of bills lately, so I wish you'd stop making my bed with a vacuum cleaner. <laughs> Now, keep the telegram. I'll read it when I get home. Okay. Oh, now, hop in the car and pick me up. I'll be ready in about 15 minutes. I ain't going near that car, boss. Why? What's the matter with it now? Well, every time I step on the starter, the headlights change places. (laughs) Oh, are they doing that again? Well, what happens when you use the crank? Coffee comes out. (laughs) 
Now, that's just a big lie. Well, never mind. I'll take a cab home. Okay. So long, boss. So long. Oh, say, boss, I think you better come home right away. Why? Is there anything wrong? Well, there's a man been prowling around the house all day, and now he's in the backyard. In the backyard? Oh, I get it. I'll be right home, Rochester. In the meantime, do something to keep that man there. Shall I throw him some silverware? No! <laughs> I'll see you in a little while. <laughs> Hey, fellas, I'm going to run along now. Rochester tell me there's someone prowling around my backyard. I bet Alan's got something to do with it. That's what I think. Come on, Aubrey, here's your chance. Okay, Chief. Wait a minute, Jack. I'm going with you. Nothing doing, Mary. There might be some rough stuff, and you're liable to get hurt. Go on. I can run as fast as you can. Well, all right. Come on. Let's go, Aubrey. Follow me, Chief. I'll take you home in my car. Okay. Come on, Mary. See, <laughs> Aubrey, I'm... All in from this walking. It was a fine place for your car to run out of gas. I'm sorry, Chief. Hey, are you sure you ran out of gas, Aubrey? Gee, the gate said full. I said I was out of gas, didn't I? Yes. 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 When you're out of gas, you're out of gas. I know, but I wanted to get home in a hurry. Oh, Jack, we've only got five more blocks. Five more blocks? My feet are killing me. Say, Aubrey, why are we walking down such a dark street? See, the main boulevard is only two blocks away. It's more romantic here. Oh. Well, anyway, it's a beautiful night, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, say, Aubrey, I just happened to think I forgot to ask you for references. Yeah, that's too bad. <laughs> yeah. Are you worried, Jack? No, I'm not worried. I'm just tired. <laughs> Say, Jack, get a load of that tough-looking guy coming towards us. Where? Oh, yes. Hello, Mulligan. Well, as I live and breathe, if it ain't the doctor. Doctor? Say, Chief, I'd like to have you meet a friend of mine, Dr. Thorndike. Oh, glad to know you, Doctor. This is Mary Livingston. Pleased to meet you. How do you do? <laughs> Funny-looking doctor. Are you going our way, Doc? Yeah. I find the night air most beneficial and soothing. So I might as well walk along with you guys. Do you mind, Chief? No, no, no. Come right along, Dr. Thorndyke. Well, yes, sir. <laughs> do you... Uh, do you live in this neighborhood, Doctor? I ain't talking, buddy. Oh. <laughs> well, what kind of a doctor are you? He's a swell sergeant. A sergeant? Yeah, what's the matter? Don't you like it? Oh, yeah, yeah. Some of my best friends are sergeants. <laughs> Say, Jack, I don't think he's a doctor at all. Look at that bulge in his coat pocket. Oh, that's just his handkerchief. Well, it's got a trigger on it. Yeah. <laughs> well, gentlemen, this walk is very invigorating, isn't it? It sure is. Oh, Jack, here comes another guy. Oh, my goodness. Well, well, if it ain't Aubrey Mulligan and Doc Thorndike. Hello, Professor Kingsley. Professor? <laughs> Kingsley, yes. Well, ain't this a coincidence? Oh, Professor, this is Jack Benny. Well, how do you do, Professor? Hiya, buddy. Who's your scoit? Just call me Levy the Log. <laughs> Mary. Well, fellas, I hate to be rude, but I think I'll run ahead. I'm quite anxious to get home. No, you don't, Chief. <laughs> hmm, hmm. Hey, Professor, you want to take a walk with us? Sure. I find the night air most beneficial and soothing, so I might as well walk along with you guys. Well, beautiful evening, isn't it, Professor Kingsley? Huh? Yes, and nuts. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Huh? Hey, Jack, get a load of the professor's cauliflower ears. Well, maybe he teaches boxing. Who knows? Huh? Well, Aubrey, another couple of blocks and we'll be home. Safe and sound, huh, Aubrey? Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> you think it's dark enough here, Professor? Well, what do you think, Doctor? I think it's okay. See, it's swell. It's night air, so beneficial and soothing. <laughs> Isn't it, fellas? Yeah. All right, buddy, stick them up. What? You hide me up with your hands. Why, Aubrey? You can run along now, lady, and if you open your trap to anybody, we'll bump this here guy off. Yeah, don't talk. Okay. So long, fellas. Goodbye, Jack. I'll see you tomorrow if I don't talk. <laughs> All right, boys. All right, you put one over on me. All right, here's my dough. Now, leave me alone. Hey, that's a beautiful watch, isn't it, Aubrey? Yeah. You take it, Doctor. I forgot to send you something for Christmas. 
Who's the sentimental fellas, anyway? Shut up! All right, boys. All right, you got my money and watch. Now, please, let me go. Oh, no, we ain't taking no chances. Off with your pants. My pants? Gee whiz, fellas, we're in Beverly Hills. Grab hold of them, Doc. We'll rip them off. Oh, Jack, come, come on, Come on, fellas. Wait a <laughs> Oh, my goodness. What's the matter with you guys? Hey, fellas, get a load of them four legs. Yeah. <laughs> Darn you, I'm going to report you guys to the police. Yeah, do that little thing. Come on, let's scram, fellas. So long, Pete. Aubrey Mulligan, you're fired. <laughs> a fine thing. Yeah, on the street here, my BBDs. Oh, well, I've only got another block to go, so I'll run home. Gee, I'm so embarrassed. Hello, Jack. Hello, Barbara. Oh, my goodness, of all times to meet Barbara Stanwyck. Oh, Rochester! Rochester, open the door! <laughs> Stan, we will be with you again next Sunday night at the same time. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to take this opportunity of thanking all of my listeners, as well as the radio editors and critics throughout the United States and Canada, for the lovely tribute they paid the Jell-O program, members of my cast and myself, in the recent polls conducted by the New York World Telegram and the Radio Daily. So thanks again, folks, and good night. The Jell-O program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Kenny Baker, and yours truly, Don Wilson. And now, ladies and gentlemen, in this corner at 143 pounds, we bring you that Waukegan bomber, Jack Benny. Thank you, thank you. Hello again, this is Kid Benny, your Sunday night slugger talking. And say, Don, that was something new, wasn't it? Uh, what was the idea of that introduction? Well, Jack Mary told me that you were going in for a lot of vigorous training and road work lately. Are you uh, getting ready for a fight? Oh, no, Don. I was just a little run down and felt that I ought to get back in shape again. That's all. Oh, then those threats Fred Allen's been making lately have nothing to do with your sudden interest in physical culture. Don, stifle the thought, please. <laughs> I don't have to build myself up to fight that guy. Any man that'll starch his legs so they won't wobble. (laughs) Well. Oh, uh, you think you could lick him, then? Don, if I I ever got in the ring, if we ever got in the ring together, I'd finish him faster than a Scotchman eating a paid-up meal in a burning restaurant. (laughs) And I'm the guy that can do it. Say, Jack. Yes, Mary. I heard Alan's program Wednesday night, and he made one crack that simply burned me up. I thought he went too far. Oh, yeah? What did he say? He said when it came to fighting, you were dirtier than a Pittsburgh nudist. <laughs> oh, he did? Yeah. <laughs> Boy, was I mad. <laughs> well, you certainly acted. Let me tell you something, Mary. The reason Alan talks so tough is because he knows there's very little chance of us ever getting together. That's right. If he comes here, you'll go to New York. <laughs> All right, Mary, go ahead. Make a coward out of me. You're not fooling anybody. Oh, Jack, uh, what sort of training have you been doing? Anything strenuous? Well, rather, I get up bright and early in the morning, and Rochester and I toss the ball back and forth, and then we run like mad around the backyard, and then I skip rope. You make mud pies, too? <laughs> Yes, if it'll make you happy. Well, Jack, that sounds like you're really going in for good, solid exercise. I'll say I am. And you know, Don, I've also got a punching bag and a pair of 15-pound dumbbells. 15-pounders, huh? Uh, Well, how do you like working with them? I don't know, Don. I can't get them off the floor. (laughs) I have a lot of fun, though, rolling them around. (laughs) Say, Jack, Uh, did you tell Don what happened to you the other day on your trapeze? No, and never mind. What was it, Murray? Well, Jack hung a trapeze in that big tree in his backyard and said he was going to swing over to a limb like Tarzan. Oh, Mary. <laughs> so when he jumped, one foot stuck to the trapeze and the other got caught on the limb. Now listen. He was hanging up there all afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> and what happened? A bird built a nest in his toupee. <laughs> Well, that could happen to anybody. And besides, you know very well that I don't wear a toupee. That was my coonskin cap. Well, it had a nice wave in it. Yes, didn't it? Now, let's forget me and the trapeze. Oh, hello, Phil. Hiya, Jackson. How's muscle-bound Benny tonight? 
It's all right, Phil. It wouldn't hurt you to take a little exercise once in a while. For a guy your age, you're very flabby. Oh, I don't know. You just don't live right. I don't, eh? Listen, Benny, I take a cold shower every morning, the minute I get home. <laughs> well, isn't that marvelous? You know, Phil, if they don't put sun lamps in nightclubs pretty soon, I'm afraid you won't be with us much longer. <laughs> <laughs> Incidentally, have you forgotten that little rebellion last week, or do you still intend to do your own program? Oh, sure, I'm going through with it. In fact, I've been working on it all week long. Is that so? Say, uh, Phil, what's the name of that product you told us you were signing up with? Bixby's Bubble Gum. Bubble Gum. <laughs> a lot of bubble gum you'll sell. Oh, I'll do all right. And boy, I got a theme song that'll sweep the nation. You want to hear it? No. I do. I helped him write it. Oh, this ought to be marvelous. Two minds without a single thought. <laughs> Go ahead, Phil. Let's hear your theme song. Okay, hit it, Charlie. Give me a little introduction. Bubble gum, bubble gum. Won't you buy my bubble gum? It's for me. It's for you. Chew and chew and chew. Oh, brother. <laughs> it's so sweet. Can't be beat for Tom and Joe and Pete. Chew it up, chew it up, chew it up, blow! <laughs> My bubble gum. <laughs> oh, so that little thing is going to sweep the nation, eh? Well, we think so. I gave Phil another swell number for the middle of the program. Oh, for the middle of the program. Will it get that far? <laughs> Gee, it's terrific, Mary. Sing it to him. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks for the bubble gum. No matter how you chew, it's always good as new. Cats, they all meow for it, and cows, they always moo. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Why, Mary, that ought to be sensational. <laughs> huh? You said it. Phil, you wouldn't be on the radio two weeks with that junk. What are you talking about? That's classy stuff. Look what's talking about class. You've got the only pinstripe tuxedo in Hollywood. <laughs> class. Well, I could answer that, but why bother? Fred Allen takes care of you. Allen, Allen, that's all I've heard lately. He's just sore because I exposed him last week. That's well, all. He, he should be. You said he was nearsighted and he claims he isn't. Oh, he isn't. Allen isn't nearsighted, huh? Listen, Don, I saw him in a restaurant one night dressed in Portland's evening gown. So he's either nearsighted or a female impersonator, and he can take his choice. <laughs> it's up to him. Take it easy, Jack. Alan won't like that crack. Oh, he won't? Well, I'll be just too, too perturbed. <laughs> and now, Mr. Harris, you're still in my employ... So would you mind going over to your orchestra, wake you them up, raise your baton, hold your nose, and play something? <laughs> okay, boss. Go ahead, maestro. Give out one of your musical masterpieces. Wait a minute. Come in. Mr. Benny? Yes? I resent that crack you just made about Fred Allen. Why? Are you nearsighted? No, I'm a female impersonator. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> What a pest. I wish he'd stick his head in a bucket of water and let it freeze. Play, Phil. Uh, that was Umbrella Man, played by Phil Harris at his orchestra. And say, folks, you know how Phil would announce that if he was on his own program? You know how he talked. He'd say that was Umbrella Man brought to you by His Royal Majesty of Rhythm. Just call me Mad. Yeah. <laughs> that was a goodie, wasn't it, folks? Yeah. I was right in the groove. We were in there punching. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, Jack. Don't give people the impression that I'm corny. I suppose you're not. You ought to call yourself Phil Harris and his musical cob. <laughs> <laughs> and now, folks... Wait corny... a minute, Jack. My orchestra isn't corny either. Oh, it isn't, eh? I could start a husking bee here in about two seconds. <laughs> And now, folks, as I was about to say... Well, say, Jack. What is it, Kenny? Did you hear uh, You Know Who last Wednesday night? <laughs> yes, I heard You Know Who. Boy, did he give J.B. what was coming to him. 
Kenny, you can drop this none-too-deep mystery. We all heard Alan, and I, for one, am not interested. Well, gee, he certainly answered everything you said about him last Sunday. With one little exception. You notice he didn't say a word about his being a juggler in vaudeville. That's right. Why was that? Because he's ashamed of it. Oh, Don, you remember the Cherry Sisters who used to do an act years ago, and they were so bad that they had to work behind a net? Yes. Well, Alan used to work behind them. <laughs> In fact, when they put in revolving stages, he quit. So now, Kenny, if I've cleared that up, you can go ahead with your song, which we're anxiously awaiting. Wait a minute. See who that is, Mary. Okay. Hello? Hello, Mary. Let me speak to Buck. Uh, Just a second. It's for you, Jack. Who is it? It's either Annie Devine or a concrete mixer. (laughs) Oh, Andy, I want to talk to him. Hello, Andy. Hiya, Buck. Are you coming over today? Yes, a Rochester's waiting downstairs in the car. He's got my boxing gloves and everything I need. Did you, did you ask your pa if I could work out in the barn? Yeah, he said if it's okay with the bull, it's okay with him. <laughs> oh, well, how does the bull feel about it? Oh, he don't mind. He went to Pomona to see an old cow he used to know. <laughs> well, that's fine. We'll be leaving right away, Andy. See you in a little while. So long. So long, Buck. I'm sorry, fellas, but I have to rush away. You can carry on without me, can't you? Oh, it'll be a tough struggle, but I think we can do it. And how? (laughs) All right, fella, none of that bubble gum stuff. This is a jello program. So long. Hey, Jack, can I go with you? Yes, but I don't want any wisecracks when I'm training. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye, Jack. Come on, Jack. Well, what am I standing here for? Sing, Kenny. Rochester, take it easy on this country road, will you? Okay, boss. I'm tired of bouncing around. Yeah, it's a good thing we're strapped in. Don't blame the car. Rochester, why don't you put some air in the tires like I told you to? Well, the man in the filling station said we couldn't have no more air until we bought some gas. (laughs) Don't alibi. Now, the first chance you get, put some air in those tires. What's the use? It just goes in one hole and out the other. (laughs) They're not that bad, so keep still. Say, Jack, are you sure this is the road to Andy's farm? I think so. Uh, Rochester, where's that road map I had? The road map? Yes. You glued it on the medicine ball and made a globe out of it. (laughs) Oh, that's right. Now, let's see, Andy's farm ought to be around here somewhere. I know we must be close to it. Hey, boss, there's Mr. Andy's place right down the bottom of this hill. Oh, yes, there it is. Shut off the motor, Rochester. It's more of a thrill coasting down. (laughs) Oh, how much gas can you save on one little hill? That's not the point, Mary. It's better for the car. Shut off the motor. Hold on, boss. Here we go. Yes, sir. Whee! Hey, Mary, isn't this fun? Yes, some excitement. Boy, we're really moving now. Say, boss, you know that loose front wheel we got? Yes. Well, there it is, way up ahead of us. <laughs> oh, for heaven's sake, catch up to us. Hurry up. Jack, we're going too fast. All right, Rochester, slow down a little. Slow down, Rochester. Step on the brake. It's down to the floor now. But good heavens, we're heading straight for Andy's barn. Quick, let me have the wheel. Here you are, boss. Don't hand it to me. <laughs> Look out. Look out, everybody! Here we come, Andy, ready or not. Rochester, look out for the barn! Don't worry, I see it! (laughs) Oh, my goodness! What a mess! Mm Mm-mm! I better fix that fender! Never mind the fender. Take this pig off my lap. <laughs> Mary, where are you? Mary. Mary, are you hurt? No, but it's lucky this goat hasn't got horns. <laughs> Thank heaven you're all right. You know, Rochester, this is all your fault. My fault? Yes, and whatever the damage is, it's going to come out of your salary. Doc, go on, I get Doc more than the Queen Mary. <laughs> Well, you ought to. And quit making goo-goo eyes at that chicken. It belongs to Andy. Hey, Buck! Buck! Here comes Andy now. Act nonchalant, Jack. Yeah. Hello, Andy. Hiya, Buck. Are you hurt? 
No, Handy, but I'm sorry we crashed into your barn like this. Oh, that's nothing. Pa does it every Saturday night. <laughs> he does? Yeah, then the darn fool takes off his shoes and tries to sneak into the house. <laughs> Well, there's no harm trying. Say, Rochester, get the boxing gloves and my training clothes out from under the back seat. Okay. Uh, thanks very much, Andy, for letting me use your barn to train in. Uh, where can I get into my trunks? Oh, right over there in that stall. Oh, fine. Mary, will you excuse me while I change my clothes? I'll excuse you while you go to South America. <laughs> very sweet of you. I'll be back in a second, Andy. Say, say, Mary, what's Buck doing all this training for? Oh, he's bombing. He thinks he's going to fight Fred Allen. Well, is he? Why, if those two ever meet, Jack will probably haul off and faint. Well, just the same. It won't hurt Buck to get in shape. Here he comes now. Gee, that was quick. Yeah. <laughs> Gonna load him with those boxing gloves and red velvet trunks. <laughs> well, here I am, fellas. How do I look? Mama! Now, what's the matter? Boss, when you get off your clothes, there just ain't nothing left. <laughs> well, that's the purpose of my training. I want to fill out. Say, Buck, Fred Allen was right about your chest. It does cave in a little. Oh, well, a good slap on the back will fix that. All right, Mary, what are you shaking your head for? I thought you told me you had muscles. Well, I have. Look when I pull up my arm. What do you see now? A hula dancer. I'm not talking about my tattoo. <laughs> Mary, you annoy me. Why don't you go milk a cow or something? Well, what do you say, Andy? How about putting on the boxing gloves and having a little slugging match with me? Oh, no. Nothing doing, Buck. Nothing doing. Ha, ha, ha. I don't blame you. I'll put them on with you. Oh, shut up. <laughs> You don't think I'd fight a woman, do you? You would if you thought you could win. <laughs> Look, I came here to train, not argue. Hey, Rochester, put on the boxing gloves and work out with me. Oh, no, not me. Oh, come on, put on those gloves. I'm not going to hurt you. I know that. I'm just tired. <laughs> Rochester, if you don't do it... All I... right, boss, I'm putting them on. That's better. Mary, hand me my glasses. How are we going to box if you're wearing glasses? Well, I got to see you, don't I? <laughs> Why don't you put on a suit of armor, too? Now, the next one who says I'm a coward can't watch. <laughs> All right, Rochester, and remember, no holding in the clinches, hitting below the belt is foul. And over the fence is out. Never mind that. Now, let's get going, Rochester. First, we'll spar around a little and get warmed up. Then I want you to tear right into me. Okay, let's go. Atta boy. <laughs> What's the matter, Andy? With you and Rochester sparring around, it looks like you're shadow boxing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, Mary, how's my footwork? Very flat. It's a good thing they are. It's harder to knock me over. Hey, Andy, watch me get Rochester. Okay, Buck. Hey, Rochester, look. What's that behind you? Well, right there. Ow! <laughs> I got you that time, Rochester. Boy, did I give you a black eye. Black eye? Yes. You have to peel me to prove it. <laughs> you said it. I think that was a dirty trick, Jack. Never mind. If he was dumb enough to fall for it, it serves him right. All right, Rochester, come on. Put some snap into it. <laughs> Say, I'm in better form than I thought I was. Say, boss, your shoelace is untied. My shoelace? Which one? That one there. Oh, yes, I'll have to... Ooh. Jack, Jack, get up off the floor. Are you hurt? No, I'm looking for my bird's work. <laughs> your what? My bird's work. The darn fool left my turf What's... Well, what's he saying, Mary? Rochester knocked out his bridge work. Oh, that's awful. Never mind turkey. Help me turn my turn. <laughs> Maybe you swallowed him, boy. Swallowed him, turn you, Rochester. You're fur. I'm what? You're fur. Fur. Hey, Buck, I found your bridge work. Well, hand it over. Hand it over. Here you are. Thanks. <laughs> hmm. All right, Rochester. Come on, put up your dukes and fight. Rochester, where are you? I'm up here in the hay mound. Oh, you are, eh? Well, I'm going to wait for you down here if I have to stay all night. Okay, I'll see you in the morning, boy. 
Why, the coward, I'll teach him to knock my teeth out. You don't have to, Buck. He knows how. <laughs> We'll be with you again next Sunday night at the same time. Well, come on, Mary. Let's go home. What do you say, Jack? Let's go to Earl Carroll's for a couple of dances and have some fun. No, Mary, I can't. I'm in strict training. Well, a friend of mine is throwing a big party over there. Oh, I suppose I could drop in for a little while. Huh? Good night, folks. <laughs> The Jell-O program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Kenny Baker, and yours truly, Don Wilson. For now, ladies and gentlemen, Tuesday being Valentine's Day and also Jack Benny's birthday, let us welcome our little Cupid with that old familiar greeting. Are you ready? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to me. <laughs> well, hello again. This is Jack Benny talking, and folks, believe me, I am deeply touched. Don, wasn't that lovely the way our audience joined in on that greeting? Gosh, it was so spontaneous and sincere. Huh? Yes, Jack, it certainly was. I thought they were better when they rehearsed it. <laughs> Phil, I'm talking to Don. Well, Don, another year, another birthday. See, here it is February again. You know, it's amazing how many prominent people were born in the month of February. And it made it pretty tough for me, too. Huh? Why? What do you mean? Well, with Washington and Longfellow and Lincoln, it's so hard for me to be outstanding. <laughs> really, it's been a terrific struggle. I can imagine. Of course, Don, I don't want you to think for a minute that I'm comparing myself to Lincoln or Washington. Why not? Washington wore a wig, too. <laughs> Well, I'm talking to Don. You know, Don, I will say that my father really thought I was going to grow up to be president. Well, all fathers have great plans for their children. Why, my dad thought I was going to be a jockey. A jockey? <laughs> well, he must have looked at you through the wrong end of a pair of binoculars. <laughs> a jockey end. Now, wait a minute, Jack. Don't jump at conclusions. At the age of 17, I was nothing but skin and bones. Well, those bones are certainly buried now. <laughs> But you know, Don, getting back to my birthday, gee, the years come along so fast, I, I can hardly keep track of them. Oh, they certainly do. Oh, by the way, Jack, uh, how old will you be next Tuesday? Uh, what is that, Don? You heard him. <laughs> Phil, I'm talking to Don. Well, I'm lonesome. <laughs> well, why don't you join a lodge or something? <laughs> uh, what are you saying, Don? I said, how old will you be next Tuesday? Well, come on, Don, what would you say? Go ahead, give a guess. Huh? Well, I don't know, Jack. I'd say somewhere between 34 and 37. You would? Well, you didn't quite hit it, Don, but it was almost a bullseye. There's bull in there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brother. <laughs> Listen, Phil, you're hardly in a position to make any cracks about my age. Those bags under your eyes are so big, your nose looks like a red cap. <laughs> It does, eh? Yes, and get this. On my 75th birthday, I'll be able to go out on an all-night party, eat a Welsh rare bit with pickles, and on the way home get run over by a milk wagon, and still look better than you do right now. <laughs> so don't make any cracks about my age. Jack's right, Phil. He can't be very old and have such nice, rosy cheeks all the time. It could be rouge, you know. <laughs> rouge, Phil, I haven't had rouge on my cheeks since I played an Indian tea for Cecil B. DeMille. Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Rain in the Face. Happy birthday. Ugh, and thanks. <laughs> Say, Jack, uh, I didn't know whether I'd see you Tuesday or not, so here I brought you a birthday present. Oh, that's well, Mary, but really, you shouldn't have bought me anything for me. Why not? Well, for one thing, it makes Phil and Don look so awfully cheap. <laughs> you know, huh? Well, Jack, I was going to get you something, but after all, you have everything. Oh, I can excuse you, Don, but Phil saw me in the locker room at the country club yesterday, and he knows darn well I need underwear. <laughs> was that your underwear? I clean my golf clubs with it. Oh, you did, eh? Hey, are you going to open my present or not? Oh, I'm sorry, Mary. You bet I'm going to, and right now. Imagine cleaning this club for my... 
Well, I'll be darned. Look, fellas, a silk necktie. Gee, thanks, Mary. Do you like it? I'll say. What a lovely color. But what's that little thing crawling around the bottom? A silkworm. The tie isn't finished yet. <laughs> oh, well, he's going like 60, so it won't be long now, huh? Thanks again, Mary. And that isn't all. I also wrote a special birthday poem for you. A poem, too? Well, hit me on the head and clip my tongue. <laughs> a birthday poem? Yeah. Say, Jack, how old are you anyway? Well, how old do you think I am? Oh, I don't know. It's hard to tell. Well, go ahead and guess. Okay. Uh, 30? No. 31? No. 32? No. 48? Shut up! <laughs> Be a long time, Mary, before I'm 48. Now, let's hear your poem. Well, what's the title of it? Uh, Mary Livingston's Ode to Jack Benny by Mary Livingston. Oh, you mentioned me, too, didn't you? <laughs> well, go ahead, Mary. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jack Benny, oh, Jack Benny, you've had birthdays, but how many? Is it 21 or more, or twice that much, and more and more? <laughs> hmm. Years ago in all Waukegan, in the state of Illinois, a child was born into the Bennies, and it wasn't Myrna Loy. Well, of course not, Myrna Loy. For the boy, they called him Jackie. And even then, he looked quite wacky. Wacky? And the good old stork who brought him there shot himself with a revolver. <laughs> now, Mary, that wasn't his attitude at all. Quiet. No. I see you, Jack, at the age of two, with golden curls and eyes of blue. That's right. And then I see you three years old, with silver threads among the gold. Mary, how could I have gray hair at the age of three? You didn't live right and you know it. All right, now grow me up and finish this. Okay. At 12, you said you'd run away, unless the fiddle you could play. And when you got one, what do you think? Were you good or did you think? <laughs> Pink. Yeah, baby talk. Oh. Well, Mary, this next verse better be the last. It is. Oh. Old Jack Benny, old Jack Benny, you've had birthdays, but how many? So happy returns and all good wishes from us in Jello, so delicious. The end. <laughs> Mary, that poem was so good, I'm afraid to follow it with anything verbal. So, Phil, uh, how about an orchestra number? Wait a minute, Jack. I can't find my baton. Your baton? Can't you lead without it? It's not that. I got something in my tooth. Oh. <laughs> well, go ahead. I'll look around for it. Hold it a minute. Come in. Mr. Benny? Yes? I'd like to take this opportunity of wishing you a happy birthday. Mm -hmm. And may life grow sweeter as the years roll by. Well, thank you very much. Now, tell me, who are you? Just a bunion in the march of time. Goodbye. <laughs> You know, folks, I'll bet he has more fun than anybody. Play, Phil. That was a brand new number called I Better Get Some Shut Eye, played by Phil Harris, who certainly looks it. You know, folks, Phil never gets to bed. He's what I'd call one sleepy people. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen... Wait a minute, Jack. I resent that vitriotically. Vitriolically? Well, some stuff. I feel you're not only using the word wrong, but you don't even know what it means. I do, too. I got it from my guitar player, didn't I, Frankie? Yeah, I learned you a lot of things. <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> Phil, Phil, there isn't one man in your orchestra that can handle a word of over two syllables. Is that so? Well, for your information, all the boys in my band went through college. Well, they didn't get any on them. <laughs> Vitriolically. Why, well, I don't even know what it means. And now going from the sublime to Kenny Baker. Say, hey, Kenny, you're a little late. Huh? I couldn't help it, Jack. I stopped in the store to buy you a birthday present. Here you are, a nice box of candy. Oh, well, thanks. Hey, hey. <laughs> well, gee, I'm going to sample one of these right now. Huh? It was sweet of you to remember me, Kenny, but, gee, you didn't have to buy me anything. That's what you said last year, and you twisted my wrist. <laughs> Kenny, I was only clowning, you know. Say, <laughs> gosh, look at this. Say, these are the biggest pieces of candy I've ever seen. What are they, anyway? Chocolate-covered bananas. <laughs> Chocolate-covered bananas? Well, that's something new. 
Here, have one, Don. Well, thanks, Jack, but I'm cutting down on sweets. Oh, how about you, Phil? No, thanks, I'm not a bit hungry. Hmm, Mary? No, thanks, I'm not a bit crazy. Well, Kenny, looks like you and I will have to eat the whole box. I'm game. So will I. That's a suicide pact if I ever heard one. <laughs> That's right. Let's forget the whole thing. Well, Kenny, how about a song? Huh? Okay, I've got one for you. Okay, Jack. Yes? Did you hear Fred Allen, I pan a you Wednesday night? <laughs> no, and I'm not interested. Now, go ahead with your song. Boy, he sure tore into you. Yeah. He said your feet were so flat, your socks bagged at the arches. <laughs> well, Phil, I'm not even going to answer him. After all, the man is in bad shape. You know, he's so weak and anemic, and on top of that, his blood circulation is so poor, it's really pathetic. Alan has poor blood circulation, huh? Poor? Don, ten years ago, a rattlesnake bit him on the ankle, and the poison has yet to reach his knee. <laughs> and the square fellas, he hasn't got any more pulse than a snowman. The whole thing is really pitiful. Go ahead with your song, Kenny. Okay. Hey, Jack. Whatever became of that rattlesnake that bit Fred Allen? It was knighted, Mary. <laughs> and now, Kenny, you may sing. Now, hold it a minute. Hello? Hello, Mr. Bennett. This is Rochester. Yes, yes. What do you want? I've got something to ask you, but first I want to wish you a happy birthday. Thanks, Rochester, but my birthday isn't until Tuesday. I know, but that's my payday, and we always argue. <laughs> All right, now, what was it you wanted to ask me? Hey, boss, do we know any Eskimos? Eskimos? Of course we don't know any Eskimos. Okay, so long. So long. Hey, Rochester, wait a minute. What made you ask me if we know any Eskimos? Well, boss, a big box just came for you and said happy birthday on it. Yes? And when I opened it, there was a polar bear inside. A polar bear? Oh, it can't be a real bear. It must be a rug. That's what I thought till it slapped me down. <laughs> You mean you let that bear loose in my house? Where is he now? He's in the bathroom taking a cold shower. In my bathroom, Rochester, you go right in there and get him out. Boss, I wouldn't go in there well on, tired of living and directly behind Frank's book. <laughs> oh, this sounds fantastic to me. Rochester, I'll bet this whole thing is nothing but a figment of your imagination. What's that? The pigment wants a towel. <laughs> oh, my goodness. What am I going to do with this bear anyway? Put him back in the crate and have the cook look up some recipes. I bet Fred Allen has something to do with this. Well, Rochester, keep your eye on him. I'll be home in about half an hour. Okay, boss. i got to run along now. There's something breathing on my neck. <laughs> What? Wait till I look around. Yep, that's it. So long, boy. <laughs> Can you imagine that? What's the matter, Jack? Plenty is the matter. There's a polar bear loose in my house. I told you you should have put in a furnace. Yeah, that would be a big help. Sing, Kenny. Say, Mary, I wonder how much it would cost to send an alligator to New York. I don't know. <laughs> that's, uh, that was Thanks for Everything, sung by Kenny Baker. And Kenny, for finesse and feeling and delicacy of tone, you are definitely preeminent among young American tenors. Gee, ain't I something? Yes, and I wish I could tell you. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, in honor of Valentine's Day next Tuesday, tonight the Benny Art and Bingo Players will present a romantic little drama about an old maid entitled Love Finds Annie Hardy, or It's About Time. <laughs> Now, uh... Am I going to be Annie? No, Mary. I hired a genuine old maid for the part. Uh, where are you, Miss Mildew? I mean, Miss Muldew. Where are you? Right here. Where's my man? Yahoo! <laughs> Control yourself, Miss Muldew. Now, in this drama, I will be Annie's paw, Mary will be her maw, and Don, Phil, and Kenny will be rivals for Annie's hand. Oh, no. Count me up. Come on, Jack. Come back. You're all of you. Don't worry, Annie. We'll hook one of them. I hope I get the fat one. Yahoo! <laughs> <laughs> Why, Don, you're blushing. Huh? Anyhow, the locale of our play is a thriving little town of off-center Indiana. 
As the scene opens, we find Ma and Pa seated in the parlor of the little love nest they built 50 years ago. Curtain. Music. Love, your magic spell is everywhere. Tum, 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 tum. Well, Ma, here it is Valentine's Day, and the air is full of romance. It is, eh? Yep. Well, open the window, wet it out. <laughs> oh, come on, Ma, this being Valentine's Day, how about a little kiss? Get away from me, you old fool. Okay, I couldn't find your lips and all those wrinkles, anyhow. <laughs> Ow! I was only joking, Ma. This is no time for jokes. My daughter Annie is 40 years old and she ain't married yet. Well, she'd have been married long ago, wasn't for her hay fever. What's that got to do with it? Well, the fellows can hear her wheezing a block away and she can't sneak up on them. <laughs> you sent her down to the beauty parlor to get a mud pack like I told you to? Yeah, but she had one last year and it was no good. Why not? After three days, the darn mud wore off. Oh. <laughs> She's the homeliest gal I ever seen. Well, like mother, like daughter. <laughs> Ouch, stop hitting me. If I wasn't petrified, I'd be black and blue. Speaking of Annie, what's the idea of getting her all dressed up today? Well, I got a scheme, Ma. There's, uh, there's only three single fellas left in town, ain't they? Yep. There's Tubby Wilson, Daffy Baker, and Twitch Harris. <laughs> That's right. I invited all three of them up here today, and it's our job to get one of them to marry our daughter. How do you know they'll show up? Hee <laughs> I told them you were going to do a fan dance. <laughs> all fair in love and war. I bet that's one of the boys now. Pull your bustle up, Ma. That's the bus tool. Oh. <laughs> Come in. Howdy, folks. Well, if it ain't Twitch Harris. Hi, Twitch. Fine and silk. What's on your mind, Zeke? Got an important question to ask you. Here, have a glass of cider first. That'll get it, Ma. Cider? Hey, wait a minute. This stuff ain't intoxicating. It better be. Quiet, Ma. Say, Twitch, I don't want to seem personal, but uh, have you ever thought of marrying a girl and settling down? If you're referring to that lop eared daughter of yours, no. Now, hold on, Twitch. Have you seen Annie since she got her new teeth? Yeah, I went to the preview. <laughs> well, she may not be the prettiest gal in town, but she's smart and stylish. You know, she got her hair up. Up where? Upstairs. <laughs> Keep quiet, Ma. We've got to get our daughter married. Say, Zeke, I thought you were going to raffle Annie off. I tried to, but I couldn't sell any tickets, so I changed it to a duck. A duck? That's cheating. It is not. She walks like one. Mary, I wish you'd shut up. You're cramping my style. Gosh, I'll bet that's Annie now. Let me out of here. Quick, Harris, get away from that window. So long, folks. No, gone that low down, Harris. He stole him a jug. Don't get excited, Pa. You can get another jug. Yeah, but where the heck can I get another finger? Dog, gone it. Well, Ma, let's see if we can land the next one. Come in. Good evening, folks. Well, well, look, Ma, it's Tubby Wilson. Hello, Tubby. Have some chairs and sit down. <laughs> yes. Yeah. What's up, Zeke? Tubby, how'd you like to marry my daughter Annie? Annie? Hold him, Ma. I got him. I got him, Pa. I got him. Let go of me, you old bat, and put your glasses on. <laughs> well, that's two strikes, but we ain't out yet. Come in. Hello, everybody. Well, it's young Baker. Son, I'll make it short and snappy. How'd you like to get married? I don't know. Is it fun? <laughs> Ain't nothing like it, my boy. How'd you like to tie up with my Annie? Gosh, I couldn't do that. Hold on now. Just give me one reason why you don't want to marry my daughter. She frightens me. We'll get used to her. Now, listen, Baker. If you take her for your bride, I'll treat you both to a honeymoon at Niagara Falls. Niagara Falls? Can I push her in? <laughs> That's up to you, my boy. What I don't see, don't hurt me. That's right. Just get her out of the house. Yes, sir. Okay, it's a deal. Come in, come in. Oh, it's you. Hello, Annie. Hello, Pa. Hello, Ma. <laughs> Back from the beauty parlor already? Yep. How do I look? If you didn't pay your bill, don't. I got good news for you, gal. Young Baker here is consented to make the supreme sacrifice. He's going to marry you. And I got good news for you, too. I already got myself a husband. A husband? Gee, Hosephat. Keepers, creepers. So you're married, eh? Well, where is he? Out on the porch. Come on in, mister. Mister? <laughs> Gosh, there ain't much to him, is there, Ma? Well, he's a man. That's more than we expected. 
That's right. Hello, everybody. Come in, young fella, and congratulations. What for? Hey, if you don't mind my asking a personal question, how'd you come to marry my daughter anyway? Well, I'm a traveling salesman. I was just getting off the train when this girl grabbed me and put me seat right in the Cedar Foster Treasury they say. And I didn't know whether they were the Cedar Foster Street like to sell to me. And you want to see right beside the Cedar Foster Street or about this man. And here I am. <laughs> oh, she took you off your guard, eh? Yeah, and not only that. You want to see the party tour, Miss Little Free for Boston Spur of Free I don't want to fly to see the Boston Spur of Moon. It's time to read the Boston Spur of Boston Space. Father, what do I do? Too late to do anything, young man. You're hooked just like I was. Hee, hee, hee. Ouch, Clayfield. And we will be with you again next Sunday night at the same time. And oh, yes, I'd like to take this opportunity of congratulating Boy Scouts and their leaders everywhere on their 29th birthday anniversary of Scouting in America. You know, Mary, I used to be a Boy Scout when I was a kid. And now someone has to help you across the street. They do not. Good night, folks. The Jell-O program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Kenny Baker, and yours truly, Don Wilson. And now, ladies and gentlemen, next Thursday evening, February the 23rd, the winners of the annual Academy Award for Distinguished Achievements in Motion Pictures will be announced. That's right. The recipients of this great honor for outstanding performances on the screen will receive gold statues symbolic of their unquestioned ability. Yes, sir. So tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we bring you a man who hasn't a Chinaman's chance, Jack Benny. <laughs> well, hello again. This is Jack Benny talking. And, Don, that was very funny, but uncalled for. If I were you, Mr. Wilson, I wouldn't be so sure about my not winning the Academy Award for the best actor. Well, Jack, you'll have to admit that your name hasn't been mentioned in that connection. Well, that doesn't mean anything. I can always be a dark horse, you know. Can't I, Phil? Not with that gray mane. <laughs> <laughs> now, wait a minute, Phil. Don't jump at conclusions. Did you see my last picture, Artists and Models Abroad? No, I didn't. Go ahead and fire me. <laughs> Not gonna fire you, Phil. I'm just trying to bring out a point, that's all. Uh, Don, did you see Artists and Models Abroad? Well, to tell you the truth, Jack, I didn't. However, it was raining one night, and I intended to go. Now, what happened? It stopped raining. <laughs> oh, well, it's too bad, because you sure missed a real tree. Hello, Jack. Hello, Kenny. Say, Kenny, did you see Artists and Models Abroad? Oh, sure. I went the very first week, and I took my girl along. Oh, well, what did you kids think of it? Well, to ask us, we were necking like 60. <laughs> That's fine. Do you two always neck when you go to a picture, Kenny? No, during the good earth, we made mud pies. <laughs> well, you were younger then. Hmm. I'm going to find somebody who saw my picture if I have to start a contest. <laughs> anyway, fellas, my performance in Artists and Models Abroad is deserving of some recognition. I don't say that I'm positive of getting the Academy Award, but if I don't, it's a frame up. Now, uh, listen, Jack, I don't want to shatter your hopes. But there's a rumor that Clark Gable has an excellent chance of winning the award. Who? Clark Gable. Gable? <laughs> the fine chance he's got. And not only that, I hear that Jimmy Cagney's liable to step right up and cop the prize. Cagney? Yes, Cagney. <laughs> that little guy for what? For what? Did you see him in Angels with Dirty Faces? Yes, I did. You call that a performance? I certainly do. Oh, why, you take that scene where he was electrocuted. He didn't get one laugh. <laughs> Some performance. Well, for heaven's sake, you don't expect a guy to get a laugh when he's going to be electrocuted, do you? Yeah, I'd have got a laugh. You'd have got a ball. <laughs> well, Phil, if you're going to make a joke out of it, there's no use discussing it any further. Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. What are you all excited about? Plenty. Phil here doesn't think I have a chance in the world of winning the Academy Award. He doesn't? How does Don feel about it? Well, Don agrees with Phil. Oh, move over, fellas. <laughs> You hear this gang talk, you think I was a flop as an actor. Oh, Jack, you always get so upset when these awards are being given out. Last year, you were jealous because Spencer Tracy won it. Me? Jealous of Tracy? I was not. You weren't? Then tell him what you did to his picture on the billboards all over town. All right, so I drew a few mustaches. <laughs> Is that a crime? Me jealous of Tracy. Yes, and the things you said about him. Now, wait a minute, Mary. All I said was, I wish I had my ability and his luck. That's all. Why, Jack Benny, what are you talking about? 
Spencer Tracy's one of the greatest actors on the screen today or any other day. Oh, he is? Why, certainly. Of course he is. That goes for me, too. Down with Benny. <laughs> Kenny, this isn't a revolution. We're just having a little discussion. Well, I don't care. Don is right. Listen, Kenny, I'm just as good as Spencer Tracy any day. All I need is a break. Oh, I can't stand this. I'm going out for a smoke. <laughs> hmm. Well, how do you like that? First time I've ever seen Don so upset. Mary, do you think he was really mad? Yes, his chins were just quivering. <laughs> He was. It's getting so a guy can't even express an opinion around here. I don't see why Don should jump on me. After all, I after all I've done for him. What did you ever do for Don? What did I ever do? Well, for one thing, I discovered him. That's what I did. Discovered him? Yes. When I first met Don Wilson, he was a barker in front of a sideshow, ballyhooing for a lot of free. That's what he was. How'd you happen to meet him? Jack was a wild man from Waukegan. <laughs> Now, Mary, I haven't been around a freak show since I broke up with Princess Zaza, the snake charmer. So there. No kidding, Jack. Did you really go around with a snake charmer? Yes, Kenny. She was a lovely girl. But I couldn't stand that hissing all the time. <laughs> and now, if you've got a song ready, we'd like to hear it. Okay. Just a minute. Come in. Telegram for Jack Benny. Right here, boy. Take it, Mary. Okay. Uh, here, buddy. Here's a nickel for you. Gee, thanks, mister. Now I can get married. <laughs> Fresh guy. Who's the telegram from, Mary? It's from your father, Miami Beach, Florida. Oh, from Dad, eh? What does it say? It says, uh, my dear boy, everybody in Miami seems to think you're going to win the Academy Award. Well. But the sun is very hot down here. <laughs> oh, good old Dad. Always thinking about the weather. Sing, Kenny. Say, Mary, do you think Don is really offended? <laughs> That was Stardust, an old favorite sung by Kenny Baker. And very good, Kenny, but what made you sing such an old number? Oh, I don't know, Jack. I guess I'm just sentimental. Oh. You know, a song like that brings back a lot of memories, believe me. Memories? Boy, those sure were happy days when I was just a kid and didn't know what it was all about. <laughs> well, well. Happy days are here again. <laughs> Now, Mary, Kenny has just as much right to reminisce as anybody else. He can have his memories, too. And how, brother? <laughs> Kenny, don't be such a devil. And now, ladies and gentlemen, to get on with the program, I'd like to announce that next week... Hey, we are... Jack, what? he's Don. Oh, yes, our prima donna has returned. Hello, Don, did you have a nice smoke? Yes, Jack, and I'm sorry I lost my temper. Oh, that's all right, Don, we can all make mistakes. I didn't make any mistakes. Oh. But when you say that you're a better actor than Spencer Tracy, Clark Gable, or Jimmy Cagney, it just nauseates me, that's all. Oh, it does. <laughs> well, did you hear that, Phil? Well, Don's right. You sound egotistical. Oh, I do. Gosh, I'm not the least bit jealous of Paul Whiteman or Stokowski. Well, you would be if you were a musician. <laughs> hmm. You're a fine leader, Phil. You have yet to conduct a number where you didn't finish a minute ahead of the boy. Well, that's the trouble with them. They're no good in the stretch. <laughs> well, anyway, Phil, Don and I are talking about an entirely different thing. Now, in my picture, artists and models abroad... Your picture, your picture, that's all you talk about. Well? Fred Allen was right Wednesday night when he said he saw you in forum and you can't act at all. Oh, he did. Well, let me ask you something. Did you see Allen in that last picture he made? His photo finish? <laughs> Yes, I saw it. Oh, boy, how he tries to hog the camera. What do you mean? Well, any man that'll put a false face on the back of his head so he can appear in every scene, well. <laughs> and the way he photographs, what they have to go through to make up that pan of his. Quite a job, huh? A job? It's a government project. <laughs> I'll never understand why Universal Studios spend thousands of dollars to make up Boris Karloff when they can use Alan in the raw. <laughs> Boy, will he burn up when I win the Academy Award next week. How do you know you're going to win it? Because I deserve it. I'm an actor, first, last, and always. You're a ham, baked, boiled, or fried. <laughs> Listen, Mary, there's nothing hammy about speaking the truth. Why, in my picture, artists and models are... Oh, this is disgusting. You said it. I'm going out for a smoke. <laughs> well, now, Mr. Baker has joined the ranks of the sculptors around here. You see down the bad example you set? And now, ladies and gentlemen, that Kenny is in the other room and it might be a little quieter in here, I'd like to make the announcement that I started five minutes ago. 
Next week is a special attraction. We are going to present... Now what? Come in. Well, hello, Andy. Hi, you bud. Well, Andy, we haven't seen you for some time now. I was hoping you'd drop in last week for my birthday. Well, better late than never, Buck. Here's a little present Mom made for you. Well, thanks, Andy. Thanks very much. Here you are, Buck. I hope you like it. Well, gosh, look, fellas, just what I needed. A hand-painted sofa pillow. <laughs> Say, that'll come in mighty handy. Yeah, you can put it in your pants in case you need Spencer Tracy. <laughs> Never mind that. Gee, it's so nice and soft. Be sure and thank your ma for me, Andy. <laughs> well, you better thank Pa, too. He caught an awful cold in his chest on account of that pillow. He did? Yeah, Ma stuffed it with his beard. <laughs> Oh, so he cut Pa's beard off, eh? What was the big idea? Well, Ma thought he was making faces at her, and she wanted to find out. I see. Well, I'm surprised your Pa let her do it. Is he uh, better looking without it? Oh, he's handsome now. He is, huh? Yeah, when Ma was shaving him, she dug a dimple in his chin. <laughs> well, gee whiz, that's something. It's too bad about him losing his Adam's apple, though. Well, well, all that trouble for this little pillow. Anyway, thanks again, Andy. I'm going to keep this in the living room right next to my melodeon. And now, folks. Oh, Jack. Uh, Penny just came in. Oh, yeah. Well, Mr. Baker, did you have a nice smoke? Yeah. That's good. Boy, am I dizzy. <laughs> well, it serves you right. And now, folks, once more, I'd like to announce that... Hey, Buck. <laughs> what are you laughing at? <laughs> did, did you hear Fred Allen Wednesday night? Oh, him again. Why? He said you were so cheap you're putting your long underwear away soaking wet so the moth would catch cold. Oh, he said that, eh? Well, how would you like to know that Alan doesn't wear any underwear at all? He doesn't? No, when it gets real cold, he just pins his shirt tail around him and lets the rest of the world go by. <laughs> so he better shut up. Well, Alan can say anything he wants to about you because you called him a rat. Why, Mary Livingston, I called him nothing of the kind. You didn't say he was a rat? Definitely not. All I said was, if the Pied Piper ever came to New York and walked down the street, Alan would join the parade. <laughs> That's what I said. Oh, then you didn't refer to him as a rodent. No, and the fact that he's partial to food au gratin is just a coincidence. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, now that I've put Mr. A in his place, we will have a number by the orchestra. What are you going to play, Phil? Yes. Yes, you mean now or after the number's over? <laughs> Andy, stick around. Phil's going to rip into a selection for us. Okay, I can stand it if you can. Hit it, maestro. Ready, boys? One for the money, two for the show. Nuts to Benny, and here we go. How cute. How cute. Uh, that was either Jeepers Creepers or This Can't Be Love, played by Phil Harris and his orchestra. <laughs> Did I guess right, Phil? No, the name of that was Hold Tight, but you were close. Thanks. You know, Phil, I've been wondering for some time, why do you have two piano players in your band? Two? I only have one. Well, who's that little guy with the mustache at the other piano? Oh, he's lost. He thinks I'm Guy Lombardo. <laughs> <laughs> well, good heavens, don't tell him. You know, Phil, one thing I've noticed lately... Uh, pardon me for interrupting, Buck, but I think I'll be running along now. i got work to do. Okay, Andy. See you later. So long. So long. Oh, say, Buck... I meant to ask you, did you really get a polar bear for a birthday present last week, or was that just a gag? He went way low on that. <laughs> I wish I wish it was a gag, Andy. Believe me, I've had plenty of trouble with that polar bear, haven't I, Mary? Yeah. <laughs> Tell him what happened when you were training him the other afternoon. Oh, that. Say, that could happen to anybody. <laughs> training him? What are you training the bear for? Jack wants to be ready in case Vaudeville comes back. <laughs> That's not the only reason. Anyhow, let's forget about that polar bear. Oh, no. What happened when Jack was training him, Mary? Go ahead, you little tattletale. <laughs> well, I dropped in at Jack's house the other day, and there he was all dressed up in a leopard skin, a beanie, and a whip in his hand. Is that so? Go on, Mary. Well, when the bear stopped laughing... He wasn't laughing. <laughs> I had him scared to death. Anyway, Jack cracked the whip and made him sit up and said, Nice bear, give me your paw. <laughs> and what happened? Jack got it right in the kisser. <laughs> Well, I can hardly feel it. Anyway, I got him tamed now, and he knows who his master is. Jack, uh, do you think you know who sent you that bear? I don't know, Don. At first, I thought it might be Fred Allen, but I'm positive now that it wasn't. Why? Well, I had Allen's program on last Wednesday, and the bear turned it off. <laughs> uh, 
Oh, he's a pretty intelligent animal, you know. Say, Jack, what are you going to do with that bear anyway? Are you going to keep him? Well, I'd like to, Kenny, but it's so expensive. He eats fish like mad. And he's so fussy, he won't eat what I give him. No wonder. Jack put scales on carrots and told them they were goldfish. <laughs> well, what's the difference? They're good for him. Huh? Hey, Buck, I gotta go now. See you later. So long. So long, Andy, and thanks again for the present. Oh, you're welcome. I hope you get the Academy Award, Buck. <laughs> I don't know why that should be so funny. You might all be surprised. And now, ladies and gentlemen, as I started to announce so many times this evening, next week as our feature attraction, we are going to present the year's supreme effort by the Benny Overestimated Art Group. None other than our version of Daryl Zanuck's 20th Century Fox production. That dynamic screen classic. That gripping melodrama. That thrilling and sensational triumph, Jesse James. Thank you. Now, owing to the importance of this great feature, tonight we are going to present a few of the highlights from this tremendous attraction. First, pardon me. Hello? Hello, Mr. Bennett, this is Rochester. Look, you'll have to call me back later, Rochester. I'm right in the middle of an important announcement. Okay, boss, I'll just leave my resignation on the dresser. Yes, do that. Your resignation? What are you talking about? Now, look, boss, I don't mind opening doors, running air, driving your car, and cleaning the house. But when you expect me to be lady and waiting to that North Pole kitten, I quit. Now, don't get excited, Rochester. In the first place, you can't quit this minute. I haven't paid you yet. That's all right. I'll just take some spoons. <laughs> You'll do nothing of the kind. Now, tell me, what's the matter with Carmichael? Carmichael? That's the bear. <laughs> What's wrong with him, Rochester? Well, every time I meet him, he wants to rumble with me. Oh, well, he's just being playful. Why don't you dance with him? I did this morning, and when we got through, he applauded. Applauded? Well, say, that was cute. Cute nothing. My head was between his paws. <laughs> oh, that's too bad. I'm all scratched up like a nearsighted berry picker. <laughs> Well, look, Rochester, you should have done what I told you to. I told you to put that polar bear in the garage. I did that a half hour ago. That's no good. Why not? I looked out the window just now, and he was driving by in the car. <laughs> Rochester, are you sure it was him? I'm positive. He waved at me. Then it was Carmichael. My goodness, Rochester, how are you going to get him back? Don't worry, boys. He can't go far. Why not? The car's nearly out of gas, and he didn't take any money with him. <laughs> Well, I'll be home pretty soon. We'll go out looking for him. Okay, so long. So long. Oh, say, boss. Yes? If you win the Academy Award, will you give me a raise? I certainly will. You'll get a nice, substantial increase. Man, I sure wish you was a better actor. <laughs> now, wait a minute, Rochester. Just for that, you're going to get a... What's that? Well, blow me down. Here comes Tom Michael up the driveway. I bet he got a ticket. A ticket? How do you know? He's got a policeman in his mouth. So long, boy. So long. Say, you know what, fellas? I got a regular gold mine in that bear. He can dance, drive a car, and everything. Gee, if he could lead an orchestra, you could shoot Phil Harris. <laughs> hey, there's an idea. I'll get him a baton tomorrow. Oh, yes, our half hour is nearly up. So right now, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to give you a preview of some of the highlights from next week's attraction. Jesse James. <laughs> Drama! Now listen, Mrs. James, we're going to run a railroad through your land, so I'm giving you just ten minutes to pack your duds and get off. I ain't a getting off. Oh, Jesse! Jesse! Yes, Ma? This man is trying to take our farm away from us. Oh, he is, eh? Yeah, what are you going to do about it? Nothing now, but you wait till next Sunday night. Action! Oh, hey, you. What? Up with your hands. Stick them up, quick. Okay, but you're wasting your time. I haven't got any money. You haven't, eh? Well, I'll give you just seven days to get some. <laughs> Romance. Oh, Zerelda. Zerelda, will you marry me? No, Jesse, I can't. You have no sex appeal. Well, I'll get some by next week. Jello. Don't shoot him, Jesse. Don't shoot him. Why not, Frank? Oh, he said to count six before you lose your temper. Okay, strawberry, raspberry, cherry, orange, lemon, and lime. <laughs> These are just a few of the thrills that will come to you next Sunday night. So be sure and tune in. Play, Phil. <laughs> We will be with you again next Sunday night at the same time. So be sure and listen in, folks. Jesse James will be our feature attraction. 
Say, Mary, remind me to stop in the market on the way home. I want to get a can of sardines for Carmichael. One can for that big bear? Yes, and one sandwich out of it for me. Good night. <laughs> The Jell-O program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Kenny Baker, and yours truly, Don Wilson. And now, ladies and gentlemen, last Sunday night we brought you a man who thought he was going to win the Motion Picture Academy Award this year, and he didn't. I was robbed. So tonight we bring you the same man who thinks he's going to win it next year, Jack Benny. Hello again, this is Jack Benny, the optimist, talking. And Don, uh, weren't you surprised when you picked up the papers Friday morning and found out I wasn't on that list of winners? Well, frankly, Jack, I wasn't. Oh, well, I was just checking. <laughs> Phil, uh, Phil, weren't you surprised uh, that I wasn't on that list? Yes and no. What do you mean, yes and no? Yes, we have no bananas, and no, I wasn't surprised. <laughs> I ought to have my head examined. I've been doing comedy for 15 years, and I fall for a yes and no. <laughs> anyway, you fellas can believe it or not, but I wasn't a bit envious about Spencer Tracy winning the award last Thursday. In fact, when they handed Tracy that gold statue, I was positively thrilled. Wasn't I, Mary? Yes, sir. Jack sat right down and cheered. Sat down. What was he standing up for? The darn fool thought they were going to give it to him. <laughs> yeah. Gosh, I was so embarrassed. But, well, Jack, what in the world made you think you were in line for the award anyway? Well, Don, I had every reason to suspect it. Because all through the dinner, people kept looking at me and whispering and then looking at me again. In fact, I was the center of attraction. Well, no wonder your toupee was favoring one ear. <laughs> Now, Mary, I was not wearing a toupee. You weren't? No, it just so happened that before the banquet, I had my hair cut by a barber with one short leg. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so don't make up lies. Well, let me tell you something, Jack. You should be tickled to death that you didn't win the Academy Award. Oh, I should. Yes, your head's big enough now. Oh, so besides all my other faults, I've got a big head, too. So just to show you how wrong you are, Mr. Harris, I only wear a six and seven-eighths hat. Don't I, Mary? Yeah, way up on top. <laughs> well, let's not dwell on that subject any longer. The Academy Award is over, and to tell you the truth, I was only kidding. I never expected to win it anyway. Not much. That's all you were thinking of. Who, me? Yes, when the fellow next to you passed you the salt, you said, I accept this on behalf of Paramount. <laughs> <laughs> all right, you little snoot. Now, let's forget it. Say, Don, uh, we've got quite a long play to do tonight. Is everybody here? I think so. Oh, by the way, where's Kenny? I'll go out and look for him. Wait a minute, I'll go along with you. Why, <laughs> Why, Kenny, I didn't see you. Why didn't you join the conversation? Oh, I don't know, Jack. I just felt kind of blue about you not winning the Academy Award last Thursday. Oh, don't let it bother you, Kenny. It's not that serious. I didn't win it this year, so what? So hurry up, you're not a kid anymore. <laughs> Just don't worry about it. As a matter of fact, I've got the whole thing figured out. The reason I didn't get the award is because I don't make enough pictures. You make enough for me. <laughs> That's so. Well, it might interest you to know that I'm dickering with Paramount to play the lead in Cecil B. DeMille's Union Pacific. Well, stop dickering. They previewed it last night. <laughs> Well, it was some railroad story, anyway. Now, look, fellas, we've got more important things to take care of tonight. And now that we're all here, I guess we can get started. So tonight, ladies and gentlemen, as I announced last week, the Benny Bargain Baseman Players will present their version of Daryl F. Zanuck's 20th Century Fox production. That screen classic, that gripping melodrama, that sensational hunk of film, Jesse James. I said, Jesse James. <laughs> You're a little late there, buddy. Sorry, I was in another world. <laughs> well, stay in this one, please. Now, in this epic, I will play the part of Jesse, that fearless, daring, courageous desperado, as portrayed on the screen by Tyrone Power. And, Phil, uh, you're going to play the part of Bar She, the villain. Why can't I be the hero? I'm prettier than you are. <laughs> No, Phil, it's already decided. Gee, I got wavy hair and pearly teeth and the biggest brown eyes. Quiet, this isn't a beauty contest, Miss Encino. <laughs> <laughs> now, 
Now, I'm going to be Jesse James, and Mary, you're going to be my sweetheart, Zerelda. Your sweetheart? Yes, we fall in love, get married, live together 20 years, and then I get shot. Why does she wait so long? <laughs> oh, go press your hair. <laughs> She doesn't shoot me, Phil. I'm shot by a dirty, low-down traitor. A man that hates me. I bet he sells toothpaste on Wednesday night. <laughs> I know who you're referring to, Kenny, and I don't want that man's name mentioned on this program. It takes all the class out of it. Now, let's see. Uh, uh, who are you talking about, Jack? I'm referring to an ex-juggler who talks through his nose, wraps his wallet in barbed wire, and is as yellow as those corny shoes he wears. <laughs> That's the gentleman I'm discussing. Incidentally, Don, did you ever notice that pained expression on his face? Yes, Jack. He always seems to be in agony. Why is that? Well, he's worn those same shoes since he was 12 years old, and in the meantime, his feet have grown. <laughs> now, getting back to our play... The same shoes, eh? I don't see how I can stand it. Well, every two or three years, he has the buttons moved over. Now, getting back to our but play... But, Jack, when Alan takes off his shoes at night, how does he get them back on in the morning? Who said he takes them off? <laughs> His toes haven't wiggled since the Chicago fire. <laughs> <laughs> now, getting back to our play, uh, Mary, uh, you're my sweetheart, Phil's the villain. Say, hey, Jack, am I going to be in it? Yes, Kenny, you're going to be the president of the St. Louis Midland Railroad, and you're a shrewd, intelligent executive. Fine casting. <laughs> Well, that's your part, Kenny. You're going to build a railroad all the way from St. Louis to California. He couldn't build one around a Christmas tree. Quiet. And, Don, you have a very important part in this play, too. Really? Yes. Uh, you're going to be a crowd of people that I hold up on the train. <laughs> now, let's see. Oh, yes. Uh, my mother, Mrs. James, will be played by... Uh, where is that lady I hired for the part? Here I am, Mr. Benny. Uh, now, Mrs. Felton, do you think you can handle the part of my mother? I think so. I have three lovely Airedales. <laughs> oh. You'll do. Yes. Yeah. Well, I think we're all set now, so our play folks will go on immediately after Kenny's song. Take it, Kenny. Hey, Buck, ain't I gonna be in this? Oh, yes, Andy, of course. I forgot all about you. I was sleeping over in the corner. Well, I'm glad you woke up. Uh, you're gonna play my brother, one of the James boys. Okay, Buck. <laughs> Well, what are you laughing at? I was just thinking of you at the Academy banquet last Thursday night. Well, what about it? I thought I'd die when you stuck your tongue out at Spencer Tracy. I didn't stick my tongue out at Tracy. My doctor was sitting across the room, and he wanted to know how I was feeling. <laughs> Buck, you're a liar, but I love you. <laughs> Andy, go over in the corner and get dressed for our play. Sing, Kenny. Mary, put on your hoop skirt and sunbonnet. Will you? That was This Night Will Be My Souvenir, sung by Kenny Baker. And now, ladies and gentlemen, for the main event of the evening, our dramatic highlight, Jesse... How was my song, Jack? Uh, very good, Kenny. Jane. <laughs> the year is 1867 in the thriving little town of I'm From, Missouri. There's much excitement as the St. Louis Midland Railroad has invaded this peaceful hamlet, determined to buy for a song the property of the simple, hardy pioneers. As the scene opens, we take you to the farm of Mrs. James, located on the outskirts of I'm From. There, we find her two sons, Jesse and Juicy, <laughs> at work in the barn. Juicy is gathering the eggs while Jesse is milking the cow. Curtain. Juicy. <laughs> Steady, Lulu. That's it. Mm. Steady now. Don't kick the pail. One, two. And <laughs> a girl. Nice going. Well, well, I guess that, that's about all. Mm. Oh, sorry, old girl. Well, three quarts. A dark. 
Uh, darn good, Lulu. Tonight I'll take you down to the gym theater to see Ferdinand the Bull. Mm-hmm. Woo! Control yourself, Lulu. Now it's your turn, Petunia. Oh, Jesse? Yes, Juicy? How much milk did you get? I got three quarts from Lulu, two from Cleopatra, and Petunia's gauge says full. <laughs> How are you making out with the egg? Fine, Jesse. I got 14 and a half. You got half an egg? Yeah, but I'm afraid Geraldine ain't trying. <laughs> Darn it, I told her a thousand times to concentrate. Watch your tail, Petunia. I'm flat happy now. Be careful. Hello, Zerelda. Hiya, Juicy. Juicy, Jesse. <laughs> Here I am, gal, behind the cow. Oh, hello, Jesse. Say, when did you grow the mustache? Mustache nothing. Petunia, pull in your tail. Say, you're looking mighty sweet, Zerelda, but uh, your bustle's kind of flat, ain't it? Yeah, darn that billy goat of yours. Oh, he's just being playful. He wasn't mad at you. He is now. I braided his horns. Well, it serves him right. Here's a stool, Zerelda. It's kind of hard, but sit down. No, thanks. My feet don't hurt. Well, you know best. Hey, Jesse, you ought to do something about that darn goat. He's getting too familiar. He is, eh? Yep, I bent over to tie my shoelace yesterday, and the next thing I knew, I was trucking. Time to straighten you out, eh? Say, Jesse, I came down here to tell you that those railroad men are up at the house talking to your ma again. They are, eh? Well, they're a waste of time. We ain't going to sell our farm. Not for any seven cents an acre. How much would that amount to? Well, 35 acres at seven cents. Let's see, seven times five is, uh... Well, seven times five, that's, uh, How much is that, Juicy? Don't ask me. You went nearer to school than I did. <laughs> Zarelda, how much is 35 acres at seven cents an acre? Well, let's see. Seven times five. I tried that. That ain't no good. <laughs> I'd like to find out, though. Why don't you count it up on your fingers? Shut. I only got ten, and I know it's more than that. <laughs> Well, anyway, they're off range enough. I'm going up the house right now and throw them off our land. Come on, Zerelda. Better be careful, Jesse. They mean business, and they're armed to the teeth. Well, I'm armed, too. I you fixed for teeth? I eat corn on the cob, if that means anything. Come on, gal, let's go. Will you need me, Jesse? No, Juicy. I can handle those varmints myself. Let's go, Zerelda. I'll take care of them high binders. A man named, named Jesse James. <laughs> Now, listen, Mrs. James, I'm tired of all this hemming and hawing. I'm going to give you just one minute to sign this paper. Yeah, one minute. Now, hold on, gentlemen. Hold on, nothing. We're aiming to run a railroad through this land, and there's nothing going to stop us. Yeah, nothing. But, gentlemen, this little farm is all we have. Makes no difference. The railroad's going through. Yeah, through. Boy, I'm all in. <laughs> now, here's the paper, Mrs. James. Sign right here. Very well, gentlemen. I suppose I'm not. Who on them all? Drop that quill. Now, listen here, Barshee. I told you yesterday to stay off of this land. Well, supposing I don't. If you don't, I'll take this six-shooter of mine, and when I get through, your nose will look like a flu. So get, get going. I ain't leaving here till we get the deed to your land. A deed? What's that? Hey, Barshee, who's that little squirt with you? Take it easy. That's Mr. McCoy, president of the St. Louis Midland Railroad. President of the railroad, eh? That's me. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> Why, you little runt? Lay off of him, James. Listen, Barshy, I had enough of you. You're nothing but a crook and a skunk. Yeah, a skunk. Say, who are you with, anyway? I don't know, but my heart belongs to Daddy. <laughs> Fine president. Now, get out of here, Barshy, before I lose my temper, which is easily misplaced. Be careful, son. Be careful. Stay out of this, Ma. Oh, Jesse, you and I are going to get married in two weeks, so please don't fight with him. I must, gal. You don't want to marry a weak, spineless coward, do you? That's right. Let's call the whole thing off. But, Zerelda... Come on, come on. Quit your stalling. Are you going to sign this paper or not? No, I'm not. Reach me a shooting iron, Barshy. Who, me? Yes, you. Not me. Come on, Barshy. I'll give you one more chance. Are you getting out of here or not? I'm not a budget. What are you going to do about it? This is what I'm going to do. Take that. Oh, yeah? Take that. All right, now you take that. See, you guys sure can take it. <laughs> well, Barshy, have you had enough? You keep out of this, Maul. 
Well, how about it, Bossy? Are you willing to call it quit? Yeah, I'll call it quit. But you ain't heard the last of me, Jesse James. We're going to build a railroad through this farm, and we're starting tomorrow. A pretty speech, Mr. Bossy. But it ain't going to happen here. You find out. Goodbye. So long. Lift me up, Ma. I'm full of lead. End of Act One. And now for the second act of our play, Jesse James. Take it, Mr. Wilson. Two years later, the James family has stubbornly refused to give up their land, and we find that the railroad company has built its tracks not only on the farm, but right through the middle of the James house. So let us tune in on this happy little group. Oh, Jesse! Juicy! Yes, yes Ma! Breakfast is ready. I'm a coming. Me too. What are we having, Ma? Orange juice, ham and eggs, sweet cakes, apple pie, and cinders. Cinders? We've been getting a lot of them ever since those darn trains have been running through the house. The last night when I was sound asleep, a cattle train came through and woke me up. Woke you up? Yeah, I was wearing a wool nightgown and the sheep all yelled, Hiya, Mom! <laughs> well, don't complain. On Mother's Day, they may throw candy at you. <laughs> Doggone that railroad. I was eating a piece of toast the other morning, and the conductor reached out and punched me and it. It sure is a nuisance. Now sit down, boys, and eat your breakfast. Just a minute, Ma. I'm going in the bathroom and wash my hands. All right, son. Be careful crossing the track. <laughs> ah, well. Doggone, I was marooned in there three hours yesterday on account of a slow freight. <laughs> Be right back, Ma. Hey, Ma, is the back door open? Yes. Well, open the front one quick. Here comes the 715. <laughs> hey, Sam, the engineer. Hi, you, Sam. Hi, Sam. Hey, that train was really flying this morning. Yeah, it must have been doing at least 60 through the living room. Yes, sirree. Now sit down and eat, boys, before your breakfast gets cold. Here's your orange juice, Jesse. I don't want any more. Give them a juice to Juicy. <laughs> I'm going to dig into these ham and eggs. Boy, this sure looks good. Jesse, how long are you going to keep on being so stubborn? Why don't we move to another farm where it's peaceful and quiet? Listen, Ma, what's the use of moping? These railroads won't last. It's just a fad. That's all. That's what they said about underwear, and now everybody's wearing it. <laughs> All but me, I'm a holdout. <laughs> Say, more. these wheat cakes are sure humdingers. How do you make them? I take two hums and three dingers and stir them up. Well, they're mighty good. Say, Jesse, look who's coming down the track. Oh, yes. Hello, Zerelda. Hi, boys. Hello, Mrs. James. Hello, Zerelda. Sit down on that switch and have some breakfast. <laughs> oh, no, the last time I sat down there, it threw me. <laughs> Well, Zarella, it's been two years now that you promised to marry me, and we still ain't hitched. Jesse James, I told you a thousand times I ain't going to marry you till you move out of this house. I can't stand all these trains going through. Why not, gal? There ain't no privacy. Them traveling salesmen keep winking back at me. Well, I can't help it, Zarella. I love you, but my mind's made up, and I ain't a moving. All right, then, Jesse, you win. I'll marry you. Now you're talking, Zarella, and we'll be very happy here. <laughs> Zarelda, get off the track. Here comes the 810 right on schedule. Good heavens, what's that? Another train and it's coming the other way. Oh, my goodness, there's only one track. There'll be a wreck. Yeah, here they come. Stop, Jesse. Young Juicy. Look out, Paul. Look out, Zarelda. Here it comes. <laughs> Darn it, my wheat cakes are ruined. Are you all right, Ma? Yeah, I'm all right, son. Where's Juicy and Zerelda? Here I am, up on top of the canoe. This is me with a red lantern beanie. Well, this is the last straw. Come on, everybody. We're a moving. This will be continued next Sunday night. What's the next step in the career of Jesse James? Will he become an outlaw? Will he marry Zerelda? Will they have any children? Tune in next Sunday night and find out. Play <laughs> it. We'll be with you again next Sunday night at the same time when we will continue with the adventures of Jesse James. 
Well, Mary, i got to run along now. Carmichael, my polar bear, has a bad cold. He has? Yes, he's acting so ornery. I think I'll give him a hot lemonade. you better give it to him through a long straw. That's an idea. Good night, folks. The Jell-O program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Kenny Baker, and yours truly, Don Wilson. So now, ladies and gentlemen, we bring you that well-known plunger who lost $2 on the big race at Santa Anita yesterday... Grief-stricken Jack Benny. Thank you. Hello again. This is Jack Benny, the ex-gambler, talking. And, Don, believe me, I didn't mind losing the $2. But when I put dough on a horse, the least I expect is a run for my money. Well, I don't blame you, Jack. Your horse came in last, didn't he? Last? He came in at last. <laughs> But, of course, it's all my fault. I should have known long before the race that that horse was too weak to run. Why? What do you mean? Well, when I put the $2 on his nose, his hind legs flew right up in the air. <laughs> what a nag. Pretty bad, huh? Bad. Don, I didn't mind the horse losing the race. But when he walked over to my box and said, do you want to make something out of it, that was going to <laughs> hmm. But it's over and done with, and I still had a swell time. Hello, Jack. What are you talking about? Oh, hello, Mary. I was just telling Don about the $2 I lost on the big race yesterday. You lost? Why, well, I had a dollar of it. Never mind. <laughs> anyway, whatever I lost, it didn't bother me any. I wasn't the least bit excited. Not much. You took an aspirin tablet, box and all. <laughs> Oh, now, that's just silly. And you ran over to the ticket window and tried to get your money back. All right, now, let's forget it. Why, for heaven's sake, Mary, how could Jack possibly get his money back? He rolled up his pants and told the man he was under 21. <laughs> why, Mary Livingston, I did not. Then why did you make me grab the back of your neck to pull the wrinkles out of your face? <laughs> Now, Mary, for the last time, will you please forget it? Hello, Phil. I mean, hello, Phil. <laughs> Hiya, Jackson. How's Diamond Jim Benny tonight? Oh, I'm all right. Say, I saw you watching the big race yesterday. How'd you do, Phil? How'd you do? Fine. Now, Phil. <laughs> Stop with those Wiltshire bowlers. <laughs> I asked you how you did yesterday. Oh, it was a great day for me, Jack. Did you see that gorgeous blonde I was with? Yes, sir. I'll say I did. You had your arm around her all afternoon. Who was she? Darn if I know. Oh, a stranger, eh? Phil, sometimes I wish I had your nerve and technique. Boy, would I be a ladies' man. <laughs> What's so funny about that? Romeo with rheumatism. Well, it was damp in those days, too. <laughs> anyway, Mary, don't exaggerate. I haven't got rheumatism. Oh, no? On a rainy day, you walk like a spider. <laughs> Very good, although I thought it was going to be much better. <laughs> Mary, when I'm talking to Phil, I wish you'd stay out of it. Say, Don. Yes, Jack? I hope everybody gets here early tonight. We've got to finish up our play, Jesse James. You know, we've got... Oh, hello, Kenny. Hiya, Jack. I saw you out the pack yesterday right after the big race. Oh, you did? Yeah, do you feel any better now? <laughs> oh, I feel fine. Now, how'd you do, Kenny? I mean, uh, did you win anything yesterday? <laughs> Boy, did I clean up. I got a real system. You have, eh? What is it? Well, I close my eyes and hold up my program, uh, and then I take a pen and make a stab at it. Yes? And whatever horse I pick, that's the one I play. Say, that's very interesting. Who did you pick in the first race? A fat lady in front of me. <laughs> oh. Guys, was she burned up? She was, eh? Did she hit you? I think so. I missed the next three races. <laughs> Well, Kenny, you can keep your system. I'm not that much of a gambler. I bet my little two dollars and let it go at that. Two dollars? I told you I had a dollar of it. Mary, I was speaking of our syndicate. <laughs> anyway, I'm the one that laid out the money. Yeah, and it's the last time I'll ever walk up to a ticket window with you. Gee, was I embarrassed. What happened, Mary? Oh. When the man asked him for the two dollars, Jack had to take his shoe off to get it. <laughs> well, there are a lot of pickpockets around. You can't be too careful. Anyway, I'm better off than any of you fellas because I only bet on one race. Listen, Jack, do you mean to say that you go clear out to Santa Anita and sit there all day just to bet on one race? Yes, I do. Boy, what a tight one. It's not that at all. It just so happens that I don't care anything about gambling. Well, if you don't care anything about gambling, why are you always going out to the racetrack? Because I like hot dogs. 
Well, that's why. Well, if you're not a gambler, why do you dress like one? Why do you wear that loud suit? So the mustard won't show and shut up. <laughs> now, let's forget about horses and get on with the program. Are you ready for your song, Kenny? All set, Jack. And for heaven's sake, do it. That kills me. I lose two dollars. Everybody has to harp on it. I told you I had half of your bet. I'm still referring to our combination. Sing, Kenny, before I get mad. John, go out and get Andy. <laughs> Memory Lane, sung by Kenny Baker. That was an oldie. And now, ladies and gentlemen, as I started to announce, tonight we are going to continue with the second episode of our version of Daryl F. Zanuck's 20th Century Fox production, Jesse James. It is ten years later, and as last week, I will again play the part of Jesse. Andy Devine will be my brother, Juicy, and Mary, you're going to be Zerelde again. Oh, yes, your sweetheart. Now, that was last week. This week, I got a little surprise for you. You're going to be my wife. And I've got a little surprise for you. We've got three kids. <laughs> three kids? What are their names? Jesse, Tessie, and Nessie. <laughs> well, that's lovely. I'll adore Nessie. <laughs> <laughs> and Kenny, Kenny, you're going to have the same part you had last week. You're going to be the president of the St. Louis Midland Railroad. I want to be the engineer. Kenny, you're going to be the president. All right, but I'm going to have a whistle on my desk. Well, suit yourself. I'm going to blow it, too. Quiet. <laughs> and now, folks, our play will go on immediately. Hey, Jack, am I going to be in this clam bake? No, I'm sorry, hey. Phil. You're not going to be in it this week. My writers don't like you. <laughs> oh, yeah? Well, I'll be in that play or my orchestra won't laugh. What, those pushovers? <laughs> Well, I have to strap your guitar player down before I can say hello to him. <laughs> Look at him now. Look. <laughs> anyway, Phil, you're out of the play, and that's that. Well, we'll see about that, brother. And don't call me brother. Heaven forbid. <laughs> Phil, where do you buy your neckties? From an Indian? <laughs> now, this play... Say, this, Jack. What? Isn't that Mr. Zanuck in the third row watching our program? Daryl Zanuck, where? Right there, that little fellow on the horse. Oh, yes. Yes, we better be good tonight. You know, this is his picture. Anyway, folks, as soon as the next number is over, we're going to... Pardon me. Hello? Hello, Mr. Bennett. This is Rochester. Oh, hello, Rochester. I wish you wouldn't always call me up when I'm busy. What is it? Boss, we got to come to an agreement. Either that polar bear leaves the house or I do. Oh, are you two feuding again? <laughs> What's the matter with Carmichael? Doggone that bear, he scratched up everything in the house, including your humble servant. <laughs> oh, stop complaining. He hasn't scratched you. Now, wait a minute, boss. I wasn't born with a pinstripe. <laughs> now, look. Look, Rochester, don't be such a coward. If he acts up, get tough. Grab hold of them and throw them in the closet. Only thing about you, boss, every time a war comes up, you got to be the general. <laughs> now, look, Rochester, just leave Carmichael and Roll, and I'll talk to him when I get home. So long. So long. Oh, say, boss, I was just listening to the program, and I've been wondering about something. About what? Well, you know that $2 you lost on a big race yesterday? Yes. Well, if Miss Livingston had a dollar of it, and I had a dollar of it, how come you feel so bad? <laughs> because I'm sorry for both of you. Goodbye. I wish you wouldn't bother me when I have things to do. Now, where was I? Uh, you are getting ready for Jesse James. Oh, yes. Oh, Phil, how about a number? Something apropos. I mean, something that fits our play. I know what apropos means. Well, don't show off in such a small word. <laughs> hey, Juicy, come on in here. I'm coming, Jesse! You're in our play, you know. And now, ladies and gentlemen, for the second episode of our stirring drama, Jesse James. Take it, Wilson. Ten years have elapsed since last week, and we find that Jesse James, the simple farm boy has become Jesse James, one of the most notorious desperados west of the Mississippi. Mighty pretty stream, the Mississippi. <laughs> As the scene opens, we find Jesse and his wife, Zerelda, in their hideout in the country. Jesse is cleaning his gun, while Zerelda is knitting him a bulletproof sweater. Curtain, music. All right, this is your last step. Come on out of there, we'll blast you out. Zarella, turn off that gangbuster program. I want to relax. <laughs> okay. Thanks. 
Doggone this gun, Zerelda, when you go out shopping this afternoon, I wish you'd pick me up a new six-shooter. What's the matter with the one you got? The barrel's crooked. Last night, I was aiming at a rattlesnake, and I shot the cigar right out of my mouth. <laughs> oh, it can't be that crooked. It can't, eh? Here, take the gun and aim at that window. See what happens. Okay. There goes the window. Window nothing. That was my glasses. <laughs> God, did you do much damage? I think so. There's a period between your eyebrows. Oh, well, I'm a little drafty, but I prove my point. How are you coming along with my bulletproof sweater? Fine, Jesse, but it ain't very stylish. I think I'll put a turtleneck on it. Don't do that, gal. When I'm riding my horse, people will think I'm a polo player. I ain't no sissy. Now, wait a minute, you. What's wrong with polo? Nothing, Mr. Zanuck. It just don't become me. <laughs> I wish he'd stay in the audience. Well, anyway, thanks for the bulletproof sweater, Zerelda. You're welcome, and see that you wear it. I'm tired of you coming home full of holes. Our bill for corks is something fair. I don't mind that, but they keep popping out all the time. I feel like a champagne bottle. There goes one now. <laughs> Doggone it. That may be the law. Quick, Zerelda, hide in the closet. What for? We're married. <laughs> No, but you might get shot. Who's that? Hello, Jesse. This is Juicy. Come right in. We'll cook a goosey. <laughs> yeah. Hi, you folks. Hello, Juicy. What's that you got under your arm? It's a new picture of Jesse. I just ripped it off a tree. Let's see it. Well, well, there's a reward out for me. $5,000, dead or alive. $5,000 is a heap of money. It sure is. Is that Pat? Yep. Zerelda, put down that gun. <laughs> Put it down, I see. Just I'll never get a mink coat. Not that way, gal. It's unethical. Say, Jesse, if we're going to rob a train tonight, the Bow and Arrow Limited is due here in about 20 minutes. Yeah, we better get going. Hey, Zarella, we're going to hold up a train. You want to come along? I'd love to, Jesse, but I hate to leave Junior alone. Well, bring the kid along. I would, but he's got the mumps and I can't get him through the door. <laughs> Oh, well, some other time, then. So long, Zerelda. Wait a minute. Shall I fix your boy some lunch before you go? No, don't bother. We'll eat on the train. <laughs> Come on, Juicy. I'm coming. Quiet, you two. It might be the sheriff. Get your gun, Juicy. I got it. Mine's ready, too. Come in. Pardon me. Is this 118 Elm Street? Get out of here, Harris. I told you you ain't in this place. I'm nuts. <laughs> Them Easterners getting my nerves. Let's go! Let's go, Jesse, or we'll be late! Yeah, come on. Steady, partner. <laughs> Say, Juicy, I see you got a new horse. What happened to that broken down old gray mare you used to ride? Well, I had her face lifted and sent her to Santa Anita. I know, I bet on her yesterday. <laughs> come on, partner. Whoa! Whoa! Here! Whoa! Darn those stoplights. We're going through the next one. Get up, partner! Come on! Jesse James rides again! Oh, that's Juicy! Five minutes later, and we find Jesse and Juicy lurking in the bushes alongside the railroad tracks, waiting for the bow and arrow limited. Well, Juicy should be coming around the bend any minute now. Yep, and they'll never recognize us with these baseball masks on. That's right. But you know, I think we ought to change our voices, too. What are you talking about? Mine changes every three seconds. It sure does. And you ought to do something about that voice of yours, Juicy. It sounds like a man with squeaky shoes walking on oyster shells eating peanut butter. <laughs> it's awful. Well, I had my tonsils shot out four times, but they keep going back in again. Well, stop drinking water. It's that irrigation that does it. <laughs> Try that for a while. Ooh. Here she comes, Juicy. Now, you jump down on the bushes and make a noise like a locomotive whistle. The engineer will think it's another train coming and stop right about here. Okay, Jesse, let me know when. Ready, Juicy? Get set, blow. <laughs> That's it. Sure work, Jesse. Come on, let's go. All right, everybody out. This is a hold-up. All right, 
quiet, everybody. Up with your hands. Why not, folks? We don't want to skip anybody. Come here, buddy. You're first. Now, wait a minute. I'm Mr. McCoy, president of this railroad. Oh, you are, eh? All right, Mr. President. Up with your hands. Okay, hold my ice cream cone. <laughs> Here's his money, Juicy. Eight dollars and thirty-five cents. Thanks. <laughs> Now, wait a minute. You only rung up $8. Well, I'm a crook, ain't I? No, oh, that's right. Now, let's see. Who's next? Cigars, candy, and program. You can't tell Jesse from Juicy without a program. <laughs> oh, yeah? Well, take that. Wise guy. Come here, lady. You're next. Here I am. Say, hey, Jesse, she looks like an old maid, don't she? Yeah. Where's your money, lady? I ain't selling, dearie. <laughs> I think we better skip her. <laughs> Who's next, you see? Well, how about this big fat guy here? Gentlemen, this is an outrage. Oh, yeah? Who are you, anyway? I'm a traveling salesman. <laughs> Quiet, lady. Well, you're a traveling salesman, eh? Yes, sir. Well, none of your stories were on the air. <laughs> Here's his money, Juicy. Eighteen dollars and seventy-five cents. Okay. Now let's see. All right, buddy, you're next. How with your hands? How dare you? I'll do nothing of the kind. Oh, pardon me, Mr. Zanuck. <laughs> Gosh, he sure gets around, don't he? Hey, Juicy, look at that guy in the derby hat trying to run away. I'll stop him. Oh, Quiet! This is a whole lot I want to concentrate. Now come back here, you. Take it easy, my light-fingered friend. That last shot put my back collar button in front. Hmm. That voice sounds familiar. What do they call you, stranger? Well, sir, Allen is the name. Fred Allen. Allen, eh? This is 1873, folks. That gives you an idea how old he is. <laughs> now, listen, you. Hand over your money. Here's my wallet, but I warn you, Jesse James, there's man-eating moths in there. I'll open it up anyway. Well, I'll be darned. Look, you see, $150,000 in pennies. I always knew you were a miser, Alan. Gentlemen, gentlemen, I protest. You better shake him, Jesse. I'll bet he's got a nose full of nickels. He's, he's got something up there. <laughs> well, now, let's see, you see. We collected over $150,000 today. I guess we did pretty good. Yes, let's go. Come on, Juicy, we got enough. Goodbye, gentlemen. Oh, no, you don't. Stick them up, you two, and hand over that money. Well, Phil Harris, put down that gun. I told you you can't be in this place. Have it your way, but hand over that money. I'm a drawing the gun, Harris. Look out. I'm a shooting mine. Take that. Oh. 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 You got me. Yeah, maybe you'll let me in your play next time. So long, Jackson. <laughs> oh, I'm getting weaker. Juicy. Juicy. Jesse. Jesse, speak to me. Speak to me. Oh, everything is getting dark. It's not so late. I mean, for me. <laughs> I'm a going, Jeff, Juicy. I'm a going. <laughs> oh, Jesse. Jesse. Zorelda, what are you doing here? Jesse. Jesse, speak to me. Tell me what's the matter. Tell me what happened. Listen, gal. Dying Zarelda, dying Zarelda, dying right here on the track. He's dying Zarelda, dying Zarelda, dying right here on my back. He's dying Zarelda, dying Zarelda. I think that I'm going to die. He's dying Zarelda, dying Zarelda. What's more, fellas? He's dying, Zarelda, dying, Zarelda. I'm dying surely, but slow. He's dying, Zarelda, dying, Zarelda. If you must go, you must go. He's dying, Zarelda, dying, Zarelda. He sure that he's going to die. Play, Phil. And we will be with you again next Sunday night at the same time. Meanwhile, folks, all I want to say is 
I'm dying, Zerelda, dying, Zerelda, but I'll be with you next Sunday night. Poor Jesse is dying, but nobody's crying. La, 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 la. Oh, come on, everybody. <laughs> He's dying, Zerelda, dying, Zerelda. I'm sure that he's gonna die. He's dying, Zerelda, dying, Zerelda. Die, 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 die. die, 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 die. The Jell-O program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Kenny Baker, and yours truly, Don Wilson. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I bring you a man... Hey, wait a minute, Jack. What's the idea? Uh, There's going to be a little switch, Don. Tonight, I'm going to introduce you. Well. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I bring you a man who today is celebrating his 16th anniversary in radio. Here he is, folks, 300 pounds of sugar and spice and everything nice... Don Wilson. Now, <laughs> uh, there you are, Don. Well, thanks, everybody, and thank you, too, Jack, for that lovely tribute. But really, you didn't have to do it. Oh, yes, I did, Don. Any man who can spend 16 years in radio and never miss a broadcast, a laugh, or a meal deserves an ovation. <laughs> Today is your day, Don, and nothing is too good for you. Oh, I'm glad to hear you say that, Jack, because for some time now I've been planning to ask you for a raise. I think I should get more money, don't you? Uh, what's that, Don? I said I think I deserve more money. You sure do. Well, let's get on with the program. <laughs> uh, tell me, Don, I'm sure a lot of our listeners would like to know, how did you happen to get into radio? Were you always an announcer? No, Jack, I started out on an exercise program. I was known as Happy Don the Muscle Builder. <laughs> oh, Oh, setting up exercises, eh? Yeah, I used to start out the program by saying to my audience, bend over and touch your toes. Yeah. Yes, sir, and then I'd bend over with them. Oh, sure, sure, I can imagine. Yeah. Now, wait a minute, Jack. I'm still pretty limber. I can bend over and touch the floor right now. Oh, yeah? Don, if you were an old maid, you'd have to go down in the basement, stand on a barrel, and bore a hole in the ceiling before you could look under the bed. <laughs> But this is your anniversary, Don, so let's change the subject. Okay, Jack, how about that raise? I think I deserve it, don't you? Yes, I'm agreeing, but not spending. <laughs> oh, hello, Phil. How are you? Hiya, Jackson. What's new? Jackson again. Phil, why do you walk in here every Sunday night and call me Jackson? Because asking you for a raise is like going up against a stone wall. <laughs> That was very clever, Bill, very clever. You know, you're just lucky you're not broadcasting over a trap door right now. <laughs> By the way, aren't you going to congratulate Don? You know, he's been a radio 16 years today. Sure, congratulations, Don. Oh, thanks, Phil. You know, Jack, I've been in this racket almost as long as Wilson. You have? Oh, that's right, Phil. You started out in radio with a hillbilly band, <laughs> didn't you? Yep, the Blue Ridge Blue Blowers. Wakes, weddings, and feuds. <laughs> Oh, were, were you the leader? No, I played first jug. <laughs> jug, eh? Well, I'll bet it wasn't entirely empty. <laughs> Who was your sponsor then, Phil? Hatfield's Mountain Dew. Oh. <laughs> Watch the pink elephants go by. Well, well, quite a slogan. Now, let's see. What are we talking about then? Well, I don't like to be insistent, Jack, but I've been with you for five years. Now, how about that raise? Raise, raise. Don, keep your shirt on. Let's Ringling Brothers move under it. <laughs> Stop scowling at me. Hello, Jack. Oh, hello, Mary. Where were you? I just got a letter from Mama, and I was out in the hall reading it to the janitor. To the janitor? Yeah, he says Mama's funnier than you are. What? Cyril said that? Cyril? <laughs> I hope he gets termites in his broom handle. You want to hear the letter? Mama's a panic today. Oh, all right. Go ahead. What's the B. Lily of Plainfield got to say? <laughs> Here it is. Plainfield, New Jersey, March the 9th. Look, it's written in red ink. Yeah, it's an extra. Oh. <laughs> Oh, go ahead. My darling daughter, Mary, just a few words to let you know we're all well and that I received your last check. Quite a while ago, wasn't it? <laughs> the old gold digger. Go ahead. So sorry you couldn't be here for your sister Ruby's wedding. It was a grand affair. Well, it was about time she got married. Uh, when the bridegroom said I do, your father yelled hooray. And I was so embarrassed I stopped applauding. <laughs> That's typical of your mother. Your sister's husband is a local tree surgeon, and it was love at first sight. Oh. She met him one day when he came to prune your Uncle Otto's wooden leg. <laughs> which is budding again. 
budding again. Yeah. Last year, they got three bushels of apples off it. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Continue. Your new brother-in-law is six feet tall and has beautiful brown hair, which would look much better without those bangs. Your sister would get somebody like that. Quiet. Oh. The happy couple are driving to California on the honeymoon and plan to visit you. So get out of town before it's too late, my dear. <laughs> Boy, is she corny. I don't think so. Of course not. You're in the groove, too. <laughs> Go ahead, Mary. Your brother Marvin wants to thank oh, you. Oh, hello, Kenny. Hello, Jack. What's going on? Nothing. Mary's mother's hogging our program again. Go ahead, Mary. Uh, your brother Marvin wants to thank you for the movie camera you sent him on his birthday. He took movies of your cousin Willie last week in our neighbor's chicken coop. Well. It must be quite a picture. They are going to preview it tonight at the police station. <laughs> What a family. Must close now as there's no other news. Give my love to Don, Kenny, Phil, and that gray-haired weasel you work with. <laughs> I think he's comical. <laughs> so goodbye for now. Your loving mother, Pygmalion Livingston. <laughs> Pygmalion? Well, she's topical anyway, huh? Uh, P.S. I almost forgot to tell you, when your father read about Hedy Lamar eloping, he tried to kill himself, but with gin as usual. Well, I'm glad that's over with. Now, Kenny, do you think you can follow our New Jersey correspondent with a song? Yeah. You know, Jack Mary's mother is a scream. I wish my mother was as smart as she is. Why, isn't your mother smart, Kenny? Not very. She thinks I'm Frank Parker. Oh, then sing, Frank. I don't want to disillusion her. Uh, no matter how much you spend on your girl, you can't deduct it unless you marry her. Well, the government wouldn't feel that way if they could see her. <laughs> well, I'm sure they wouldn't. You know, in the first place, Kenny, when you make out your income tax, you should get somebody to help you. Oh, gosh, I had four accountants and I drove them nuts. <laughs> that I can believe. Say, Phil, did you have much trouble making out your income tax? No, with the salary you pay me, it was a pleasure. <laughs> That's so. Phil, if I only paid you 35 cents a week, you should salam every time you meet me on the street. I'll salam you right now if you want it. <laughs> Some funny crack. That would go better in the Wilshire Bowl. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, this being Don's anniversary. Say, Jack, uh, the government's going to get a big kick out of my tax. They are? Yeah, I wrote a poem in the back of my check. A poem? Rickety rack, rickety rack. Here's my check for the income tax. If it bounces, let it slam and give my love to Uncle Sam. <laughs> Well, that's very good. That's very good. They should, they should love that. And now, ladies and gentlemen, as a climax to this special occasion, we were going to do a little play called The Life of Don Wilson. But we found it rather dull. So we decided instead to give you The Life of Fred Allen. But that turned out to be repulsive. <laughs> so therefore, folks... Hey, Jack, uh, speaking of Allen, I saw that picture of you on the front cover of Radio Guide where you're training to fight him. Yes, sir, and I looked pretty tough there, didn't I? You sure did, but I couldn't figure out what you were holding in your right hand. Uh, that was a flute. You see, Alan is a snake, and I have to charm him before I can hit him. <laughs> now, getting back to our play, and I think it's a crime the way Portland has to take in washing. <laughs> <laughs> Alan's doing all right. Oh, well. Anyhow, tonight we are going to present... Uh, pardon me. Hello? Hello, Mr. Benny, this is Rochester. Oh, you. What do you want now? It's about Carmichael, your polar bear. What's the matter? Is this cold still bad? You know, Mary, he caught a terrific cold last week. Uh, how is he, Rochester? Don't go on that animal. Well, did you give him that hot bath like I told you to? Well, yes and no. What do you mean, yes and no? I got him in the bathroom and he got me in the tub. <laughs> Well, look, Rochester, there's a mustard plaster in the cabinet, so you better put it on his chest. That'll help. On his chest? What about all that fur? Well, naturally, you'll have to shave the fur off. Boss, if I ever get that close in with a razor, I'm going to get even. <laughs> Rochester, don't you dare lay a hand on him. Not if I want it back. <laughs> I'll come home right away and take care of Carmichael myself. In the meantime, put him to bed. So long. So long. <laughs> Well, what's so funny? Wasn't it silly of Mr. Wilson to ask you for a raise? It's your life. <laughs> Goodbye. 
Yes, I'm sorry, fellas, but i got to run along. I'm worried to death about Carmichael. You can take care of the rest of the show, can't you, Don? Oh, sure. Run along, Jack. Come on, Mary. I want you to go with me. Okay. Can I come, too, Jack? I've never seen a polar bear. Sure, Kenny. He's never seen a tenor, either. <laughs> let's go. My car's right downstairs. Oh, that old thing? If you're in a hurry, let's walk. You'll go in my car and like it. So long, fellas. So, so long. long. Well, Phil, what do we do? I don't know about you, but I'm going to lay down over here in the corner. Playboys, and not too loud. <laughs> Well, we'll be at my house pretty soon now. Gee, I hope Carmichael isn't seriously ill. Forget about the bear, Jack, and watch the driving. Oh, boy, what a car. Well, what's the matter with it? Every time you step on the gas, the radiator shoots up like Old Faithful. <laughs> well, a little water isn't going to kill you. Whee! Boy, I'm enjoying this ride. Are you, Kenny? Yeah. I'm young and I can take it. <laughs> I wish you two would stop joking when I'm worried about Carmichael. Who knows? Maybe he's dying. Oh, Jack, quit worrying. The bear will be all right. I want that stoplight. What stoplight? The one you just went through. Oh. Oh, well, nobody saw me. They didn't, eh? No. Then, what, then what's that? A mockingbird? Yes, but wait. <laughs> oh, my goodness, it's a cop. Now, look, kid. Let me do the talking. Hello, officer. Hey, you, what's the big idea? Where do you think you're going to, a fire? Well, that's original. Mary. <laughs> Uh, what, uh, what seems to be the trouble, officer? You see that red light that keeps going on and off back there? Yes. That ain't just to break the monotony, you know. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm sorry, officer. I but... got a good mind to give you a ticket. Go ahead, I dare you. Now, Mary. <laughs> uh, she's a little nervous, officer. Oh, yeah? You can't arrest us. I'm a junior G-man. Henry, <laughs> Look, officer, I've really got a good reason for being in such a rush. My polar bear is quite ill. Your what? My polar bear, Carmichael, he's sick in bed with a bad cold. Ah, oh, you're drunk too, huh? <laughs> no, officer, I'm serious. Mary, you tell him, haven't I got a polar bear that's sick in bed? Oh, Jack, think of another one. What? <laughs> Kenny, tell the man, do I or do I not own a polar bear? Which do you want me to say? <laughs> Well, pals. All right, officer, I haven't got a polar bear. He isn't sick, and I'm just a big liar. Well, that's more like it. Here's your ticket. Well, thanks. Hmm. So long. So long. A sick polar bear. What do you think I am, an imbecile? That's imbecile. Oh, yeah? Here's another ticket. <laughs> Fine. I got two of them now. Here, another one. We can all go. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's get out of here. Hey, hey, wait a minute. Not so fast, buddy. <laughs> oh, now what? Look at those license plates. This isn't 1937, mister. <laughs> now, see here, it's not my fault. I wrote in for new ones. Well, while you're waiting, have another ticket. Hmm. Hooray, I knew we'd make it. Kenny. Now, listen, officer, I can explain... Oh, Jack, you've got enough. Don't be a pig. <laughs> oh, brother, if you weren't a woman... <laughs> Well, all right, I'll take these tickets and go. I want to hold mine. All right. <laughs> all right, let's get going. Hmm. Three tickets. And you two kids certainly proved to be fine traders. Oh, we were just having a little fun. Yeah, what's the matter? Can't you take a rib? Kenny, I'd like to take your rib and hit you on the head with it. <laughs> well, here's my street. Hang on tight. I'm going to make a turn. I hope there's nothing seriously wrong with Carmichael. You know, I've become so attached to that bear. Gee, he's just like a relative. Yeah, all he does is eat and sleep. <laughs> just the same, I like him. Well, here we are at the house. <laughs> right, come on, kid. Jack, you better put the car in the garage. I can't. Rochester's got three cousins from Alabama living in there. <laughs> I don't know what to do with them. Why don't you start a minstrel show? No, I think I'll just plant cotton in the backyard. <laughs> That'll keep them busy. Hey, Mary, get a load of that sign on the front door. Where? Why, Jack, Benny, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. What for? Look at that sign. See the polar bear, 15 cents. <laughs> well, I'll be darned. Rochester must have put that up. I was wondering how he bought that new suit. 
darn it, the door's locked, and I forgot my key. Ring the bell, Kenny. I can't go in. I didn't bring any money with me. Never mind. <laughs> Ring the bell. Okay. We ain't over today, folks. The bear's sick. <laughs> Rochester, open that door. Oh, it's you, boss. Hello, Miss Livingston. Hello, Mr. Baker. I ain't seen you in some time. Forget the formalities. How Carmichael? Did you put him in bed like I told you to? Yes, boss, but I had a little trouble getting your pajamas on him. <laughs> pajamas? Rochester, if those are my new silk ones, I'm going to take $10 out of your salary this week. What do you mean, out? That's it. <laughs> Well, I haven't got time to argue. Tell me, how's Carmichael? His cold seems to be getting worse. He sneezes all the time. Well, that's awful. Did you take his temperature? I sure did, boss. What does the thermometer say? Easterly wind with probable rain. <laughs> you used the barometer. Oh, well, I'm going in and look at him. Uh, can we see him, Jack? Yes, but you'll have to be quiet. Now, follow me. I wonder if we should have brought flowers. That isn't necessary. Here's the room. Now, be quiet. Oh, look at Carmichael sleeping there, peaceful as a lamb. Oh. Oh. Gee, isn't he cute? Look at that smile on his face. Yeah, I wonder what he's dreaming of. Some other bear, no doubt. <laughs> Quiet, you'll disturb him. See, you woke him up. Gee, look at him. He's got such a bad cold. I think I'll pull the covers up around him. Be careful, boss. He's kind of on me. Well, naturally, he's sick. Look at him. Has Carmichael got a bad cold? <laughs> <You're done, Tom. laughs> oh, Carmichael, watch it. Shall I get your umbrella, boss? <laughs> no, Roger. So you should have given him a spoonful of this cough syrup every hour. Here, open his mouth and give it to him now. Boss, I wouldn't open his mouth if my best friend was in there. <laughs> Oh, give me that spoon. I'll give him the medicine myself. Look out for your hand, Jack. Don't listen to Rochester. He's just a coward. That's me, a coward with brains. <laughs> well, I'll show you there's nothing to be afraid of. Now, here, Carmikey, be a good little bearsy wearsy and open his mouth. <laughs> Come on, now. Take this cough syrup for Daddy. <laughs> uh -uh. <laughs> Now, come on, Carmichael. Daddy is getting impatient. Take this cough medicine. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> Carmichael, I'll shove it right in your mouth. <laughs> Carmichael, open up them golden gates. <laughs> Carmichael, take this medicine. Hey, oh, right, 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 right. stop! Hey, look out, Jack. He's coming for you. Carmichael, get back in bed. Come on, Jack. Let's get out of here. Carmichael! Yeah. Bossmaster, get out of my way. I'm going to be on this promoter now. <laughs> And we will be with you again next Sunday night at the same time. Oh, yes, ladies and gentlemen, this time I want to congratulate and extend my good wishes to the American Legion who celebrate their 25th anniversary this week. You know, Mary, every time the Legion has a birthday, it reminds me of my heroic deeds in the World War. It does, eh? Yes, sir. Well, Carmichael, go on now. Get down off the chandelier. <laughs> Are you sure? Good night, folks. Jell-O program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Kenny Baker, and yours truly, Don Wilson. And now, ladies and gentlemen, every Sunday at this time, it is my custom to bring you Jack Benny. Tonight, however... Jack is confined to his house with a slight cold. Slight? I went to see him this morning, and there was a man with a sickle sitting on his bed. <laughs> oh, he isn't that bad. Say, how'd Jack get that cold, anyway? Well, he got it from Carmichael, his polar bear. Well, it's his own fault. He shouldn't have kissed him. <laughs> it wasn't that. Jack's been taking care of him, and that's how it happened. Boy, between Jack and that polar bear, Rochester sure got his hands full. He certainly has. Well, anyway, let's get on with the program. Now, folks, inasmuch as Jack is unable to be here tonight... Phil, Kenny, and I are going to try to bring our own little show with me off the wall. Jeepers, creepers, I ain't closed my peepers. <laughs> Jeepers, creepers, I ain't shut my eyes. Rochester. God, show, get up. I can't hold my head up. God, Rochester, up. quiet. <laughs> I feel bad enough without that Central Avenue serenade. <laughs> uh, uh, hand me that cough medicine, will you? 
Here you are. Thanks. <laughs> this room sure is funny sight. You and one twin bed and that polar bear and the other. There were what funny about it? Uh, if there was a wallet on the sofa, you'd look like Alice in Wonderland. No, don't be so fantastic. <laughs> Quiet, Carmichael. Daddy's right here with you. <laughs> Quiet now. I can't understand why you didn't put that bear in the other room. Well, because you wouldn't take care of him, that's why. I asked you to do me a little favor, and you refused. A little favor? You want me to open his mouth and swab out his throat? Well? Man, that's just bad casting. <laughs> well, look, Rochester, what are you afraid of? He won't bite your hand. He won't. Of course not. He's tame, isn't he? Well, I'm tame, too, but I get hungry. <laughs> Why, Rochester... <laughs> Rochester, you ought to be ashamed of yourself being afraid of Carmichael. You've got a yellow streak clear down your back. Not anymore. He's passed it off. <laughs> no, he did, eh? Boss, one of these days, I'm going to give that bear a goldfish with a Mickey Finn in it. You'll do nothing of the kind, so don't be so smart. Gesundheit, <laughs> <laughs> <Ow! laughs> Carmichael. Where's that nurse I hired, Rochester? She's never around. I saw her down in the kitchen playing Santan with the cook. He is? My goodness, she shouldn't play cards with Swing High. He's very lucky. After three weeks straight, he's won his salary from me. <laughs> what a gambler. Well, he might be all right at cards, but he don't know how to handle them Mississippi models. <laughs> oh, shooting dice, eh? Rochester, have you been taking Swing High's money away from him again? Well, that ain't fried rice I've been talking to the bank. <laughs> Now, I want you to stop with that dice shooting immediately. You're wearing out all your uniforms at the knees. Now, go in the kitchen and get the nurse. <coughs> Here she is, boss. Oh, yes. It's time for your hot toddy, Mr. Carmichael. My name isn't Carmichael. <laughs> I told you a thousand times, Carmichael is that bear in the other bed. Oh, that's right. Do you mind if I put an X on your forehead? <laughs> no, go right ahead. I want you to be happy here. Now, look, Miss, uh, Miss, uh... Latouche. Oh. Now, Miss Latouche, I wish you'd take my temperature. I think I'm getting a fever. Okay. As soon as I give the bear his hot toddy. Hmm. Now, come on, Carmichael. Open your mouth. <laughs> Better be careful, nurse. Ma'am, look at those teeth. Carmichael, drink his hot toddy. Uh-uh. <laughs> <laughs> You certainly are a brave girl. How old are you, Miss Latouche? Just 20. 20, eh? You better leave that bear alone so you can vote next year. <laughs> he's, he's right, Miss Latouche. You better watch yourself. Oh, he's just fluffy. Now, Carmichael, for the last time, drink this hot toddy. <laughs> well, he sure went for that. Was it good, Carmichael? <laughs> Now, don't show off. It wasn't that strong. I think I'll go down. I think I'll go down and have one myself. See you later. Now, Rochester, you see how easy it was to handle Carmichael? Weren't you ashamed to let a woman throw you up like that? I sure was, boss. You're not afraid of the bear now, are you? Now, tomorrow, and when old Rotten Chance gets me. <laughs> well, you're just biggest big sissy. You're worse than Fred Allen. <laughs> There he goes again. Every time I mention that fellow's name, Carmichael has a fit. Yeah, why is that? Well, you see, Alan is part Eskimo and they're natural born enemies. <laughs> now, look, Rochester, you better call the doctor and tell him to come over here right away. I keep getting chills all the time. <laughs> and answer the door. Okay, boss. Well, <laughs> what do you say, Carmichael? How about another game of checkers? You're one up on me, you know. <laughs> Well, if you don't like it, we'll play later. And don't eat all the bananas. They were sent to us jointly. Come on now, Carmichael. Give Daddy a banana. <laughs> Come on now. Give me one, I say. Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. What's the matter? Oh, Carmichael's got all the bananas, and he won't give me one. Carmichael, give me one of those. Ouch. Well, you got it. <laughs> yes, he would have to hit me with the ripest one. Oh, well, he was just playing. <laughs> How do you feel, Jack? Any better? Oh, I feel awful, Mary. I ache all over. One second I'm hot, and the next second I'm cold. Then I turn hot, then I turn cold. Oh, stop. You sound like a shower bath in a cheap hotel. <laughs> well, there's nothing to kid about. And those pills you left here yesterday. What pills? Those pink ones you left on the dresser. I took all six of them, and they didn't do me a bit of good. <laughs> what are you laughing at? Those are buttons for my new dress. <laughs> 
buttons where you had them in a bottle and the label said aspirin. That's my dressmaker, Madam Aspirin. Oh. You just planned the whole thing. I know you. Gesundheit, <laughs> <laughs> Tom. Gee, he's... That bear is so thick. Uh, that reminds me, Jack. I don't think Rochester likes the polar bear very much. Oh, he talks a lot. But in his heart, he's very fond of that animal. Oh, Yeah. Well, I was in the library a few minutes ago, and you know that space in the wall between the moose's head and the stuffed owl? Yes. Well, Rochester's got a big sign there, reserved for Carmichael. Uh, well, then I better keep an eye on him. <laughs> Say, Mary, I was just thinking, I bet they're having a tough time without me on the program today. Oh, don't be so egotistical. They're probably doing all right. They are, eh? I can just see Phil Harris trying to run the whole show with that Hollywood and Vine chatter right here. <laughs> I'll turn on the radio and we'll listen to it. Okay, hand me the earphones. Mary, I haven't got that set anymore. <laughs> I got a new one. Turn that switch there, KFI. And now, boys and girls, you're going to hear a little ditty from our little old tenor who's got plenty on the ball. The eight ball, folks. <laughs> oh, brother, is he corny. <laughs> Quiet, I want to listen. Well, what's your song going to be, Kenny? I'm going to sing a beautiful number entitled, A Little Bit of Heaven. That's swell, Kenny. Rip into it. Swing it, boys, and don't spare the drum. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. He makes me sick. <laughs> that was, um, A Little Bit of Heaven, sung by Kenny Baker, and very good, Kenny. Boy, you really laid him in the aisle. Thanks, Phil, and I dedicate that number to our pal, Jack Benny, who is sick in bed with a cold. Oh, isn't he a sweet boy, Mary? Well, he didn't even send you flowers. That's right, the little brat. <laughs> Say, Phil, did you tune in last Wednesday night and listen to Fred Allen? Yes, I did, Jenny. Oh, boy, I thought I'd die when Allen said that... Darn it, I wanted to hear that. Who turned off the radio? Carmichael. Oh, yes, he just hates Allen. Say, Mary, did you hear him last Wednesday night? I sure did, and he certainly exposed you, you big faker. Baker, what are you talking about? Well, Alan had the real Jack Benny on his program, and they proved you were an imposter. Imposter? Yes, you can't get away with it forever, Maxwell Stroud. <laughs> Maxwell Stroud? Let me get this straight. Did he say that my right name was Maxwell Stroud and the fellow on the program was the real Jack Benny? Absolutely. He said that when you were both babies, they got you mixed up in the hospital. Well, now, that's just a big lie because I wasn't born in a hospital. I was born in a taxi cab. <laughs> And I better say it was a yellow one, or Alan will say it next Wednesday and get a big laugh. <laughs> hmm. Going around telling people that I'm Maxwell Stroud. Well, aren't you? No. Then why have you got the initials MS on all your belt buckles? Listen, Mary, that MS stands for movie star. <laughs> which I am. Just a little publicity that I wear around my waist. <laughs> and you know what else, Jack? What? Alan said you were so cheap you put your finger down a moth's throat to get your cloth back. <laughs> oh, he said that, eh? Well, he's a fine one to talk. <laughs> Any man that'll open a can of sardines, eat the fish, use the can for a cigarette case, and then have the key made into a button hook, well... <laughs> Why, he's had a cake of bath soap for 12 years, and you can still read ivory on it. <laughs> anyway, when I get back on the air next week, I'm going to settle that Maxwell Stroud stuff. <laughs> oh, nurse, nurse. I'm coming. Will you please bring me a glass of water? My throat's awfully dry. Okay. Oh, by the way, Mary, this is my nurse, Miss Latouche. Well, many of all people. Hello, Mary. Oh, do you two know each other? Sure. See, Minnie, I haven't seen you since we used to go dancing at the Palomar together. Yeah, them were the days. Say, Mary, do you remember Joe Finkelhoff and Pete McGuire? Oh, yes. Are you still going around with Pete? Yeah, but I'm married to Joe. <laughs> now, that's, that's very interesting, nurse. Now, how about my glass of water? Right away. Uh, say, Mary, what are you doing these days? Are you still with the May Company? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm in radio. Oh, radio? Who are you working for? I don't know. It's either Jack Benny or Maxwell Stroud. Mary. Hey, nurse, what about my glass of water? Say, Minnie, remember the time we went to the masquerade and we dressed up like hula dancers? <laughs> I'll say. And someone dropped a piece of ice on my back and I won first prize. <laughs> 
Listen, nurse, I'm going to get a glass of water if I have to tap my knee. <laughs> my goodness. All right, keep your shirt on. I'll be right back, Mary. What I have to go through for a little glass of water. I'm so thirsty I could drink a gallon. <laughs> Carmichael, I said gallon, not Allen. Oh. Don't be so touchy. Gee, he hates Allen. Hey, boss. Yes, Rochester. Here's some flowers just came for you. Three beautiful roses. Only three flowers? Who are they from? The card says, we the people. <laughs> Oh, my public. <laughs> Incidentally, Rochester, while I've been in bed here with nothing to do, I've gone over our monthly accounts, and there are a few items I don't understand. Is that so? Yes. <laughs> I'd like to know where all that money's been going to. I'll be back in a minute, boss. There's somebody at the door. There's nobody at the door. Now, come here. Excuse us a minute, Mary. Go right ahead. Don't mind me. Now, look, Rochester, I don't know what kind of a system you've been using, but our food bill is something fierce. It is kind of high. High. Now, look here. Last month alone, caviar, $95. I don't remember eating any caviar. I got that for myself. <laughs> oh, you did. Now, look, Rochester, I like caviar, too, but I can do without it. I know, boss, but with me, it's a magnificent obsession. <laughs> I don't care if it's from the picture of the same name. you got to cut it out. <laughs> and all this scribbling and abbreviation. Look at this. P-C-T-T-H-O-M-D-O, $25. What in the world is that? You won't like that word. <laughs> Never mind whether I like it or not. What does P-C-T-T-H-O-M-D-O stand for? Pork chops to take home on my day off. <laughs> Isn't that awful? Now, Rochester, from now on, I want you to stop carrying food home. Can I mail it? No! <laughs> I'll take charge of the books after this. Now, call the doctor again and tell him to hurry over. I don't feel so good. Okay, boss. Mm -mm, I'm sure going to miss that caviar. <laughs> caviar yet. What a guy. Why don't you fire him, Jack? I can't. He's got some letters I wrote to Garbo, and he won't give them back. <laughs> Say, Mary, tune in on our program and see how the jolly boys from Encino are doing. <laughs> okay. All right, Phil, I give up. Why is the kiss over the telephone like a straw hat? Because it's not felt. <laughs> oh, I've got that big laugh. He probably hit Kenny in the face with a pie. I wouldn't be a bit surprised. And now, folks, the boys in the band and myself are going to entertain you with a little swing number. Yeah. A little song entitled, Mother Feeds the Baby Garlic So She Can Find Him in the Dark. How's that one, folks? Are you listening? Yes, you big fool. <laughs> That is positively cruel. Oh, nurse, nurse, where's my water? Oh, yes, do you want ice in it? I don't care if the Queen Mary's in it. Get me a glass of water. Feed the baby garlic. Wait till I see him next week. <laughs> that was Honolulu, played by the orchestra and conducted by His Majesty of Rhythm, Phil Harris. <laughs> Just call me mad, yeah. <laughs> 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 well, he's off again. I wonder who writes Phil's stuff anyway. <laughs> oh, some waiter at the Wilshire Bowl. <laughs> That's quite possible. And now, ladies and gentlemen, for our feature attraction tonight, the Harris High Class Arts Players hmm. will present an original Western melodrama entitled Buck Harris Rides Again. <laughs> original? <laughs> Did you hear that, Mary? Buck Harris rides again. Why, he stole that from me. Oh, I bet he never even thought of Buck Denny. What good gravy, girl. <laughs> Look at your face. <laughs> Please, Jack, I want to listen. Now, before we go into this play, folks, I'd like to announce that any resemblance to persons living, dead, or laid up with a cold is purely coincidental. <laughs> Coincidental, well, my eye. Oh, shut up. Now, in this little Western drama, I will play the part of Buck Harris, the hero. Some hero. And as we are short of girls tonight, Kenny Baker will be my sweetheart, Daisy Carson. <laughs> Gee, my course is killing me. Imagine Kenny playing a girl's part. Now, as the scene opens, we find Sheriff Buck Harris on the trail of Texas Face Elm. Turn the radio off. Turn it off. I can't stand it anymore. Oh, all right. Boy, if I had my strength, I'd go down to the studio and put an end to this outrage. 
Hey, boss, the doctor's here. You want to see him? No, Rochester. I'm lying here in bed because I can't find my pants. <laughs> You're pressing them under the mattress. Never mind that. <laughs> I throw the doctor in. Okay, here he is. Oh. Now, how do you do, doctor? Well, well, young man, you need a shave. That's the bear. This is me over here. <laughs> By the way, Dr. Nelson, I'd like you to meet Miss Livingston. Oh, really? Are you the Mary Livingston? Yeah, you want to make something out of it? Mary. <laughs> well, Doc, now that you're here, I wish you'd look me over. I feel much weaker today. All right. Just open your pajama coat. I'll take a look at your chest. Okay. <coughs> there you are, Doc. My, my, you're kind of caved in there. <laughs> yeah. Get a load of that chest. It looks like Laurel Canyon. <laughs> Oh, don't be so funny. Watch your cigarette, Doc. That's my mouth, not an ashtray. Pardon me. Now, let's see. Uh... Oh, oh, so you're not Maxwell Stroud, eh? What are you talking about? So you're not Maxwell Stroud. No, I'm not. Then what's that MS tattooed on your chest? That's Morrison Silvers, my old vaudeville agent. They used to brand their clients. <laughs> Butt me up, Doc. I've got a chill. Uh, not yet. I've got to tap your chest first. Mm. Say, it's a pretty big mallet you've got there, isn't it? Yes, I play polo after work. Mm. <laughs> Go ahead, Doc. Now, hold still. Ooh. Hey, what's that? It's a bullet I got in the war. <laughs> There's a lot more in his back. Uh, no. Hurry up, Doc. I've got an awful chill. All right. Now you stay in bed and keep warm. And if you want me during the night, I'll be under a table at the Coconut Grove. <laughs> so long. So long. Oh, wait a minute, Doc. While you're here, I wish you'd examine Carmichael. Oh, yes, the bear. Let's see a tap on his chin. Rochester. <laughs> I'm a little worried about Carmichael, Doc. All right. Let's take a look at our inflated poodle. <laughs> now, open your mouth, Carmichael. Come now, open your mouth. You see how easy the doctor handles in Rochester? Yes, sir, my mind. He's got a pretty heavy cold, hasn't he, doctor? Cold nothing. This polar bear is suffering from a bad case of measles. Measles? Why, that's impossible. Oh, yeah? I'll bet you $10 that under his fur there are little red spots. Now, that's silly. Spots under his fur. Let's rip it off and find out. Rochester, get out of here. Well, what do you think we ought to do, Doc? Yeah, just keep him warm and quiet, and I'll drop back in the morning. Goodbye. Goodbye, Doctor. Goodbye, Miss Livingston. Goodbye, Quack. <laughs> Bear hasn't any more measles than I have. Tune in the radio, Mary, and see what Buck Harris is doing. Okay. Hmm. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Sheriff Buck Harris, having finished a hearty lunch, is now on his way to visit his sweetheart, Daisy Carson. Hmm, this ought to be good. We now pick up Buck Harris, riding over the prairie. Imagine Harris on a horse. Yeah, I'll bet it's got a Marcel mane. <laughs> yeah, and a finger wave in the tail. Woo, partner. Woo, woo. Partner, that's my horse. Well, here's Daisy's house now. I'll see if she's in. Come in. Hello, Daisy. Hello, tall, dark, and puffy eyes. <laughs> 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 well, gal, them ain't exactly tea bags you're peeking over. <laughs> did you hear that, Mary? They're doing the same kind of jokes we did. Come on, Daisy. How about a little kiss? No, no. A thousand times no. Come on, Daisy. Why won't you kiss me? My girl will get jealous. Mary, turn that radio off. That's the silliest thing I've ever heard. What's the matter with you, anyway? What's the matter with me? They're ruining my program. That's what they're doing. I'm going right over to NBC Studio and put a stop to this whole thing. You can't go out of the house, Jack. I can, too. My cold isn't so bad. It's not that. Take a look at your face in this mirror. My face? Here, look at those spots breaking out. What? Oh, for heaven's sake, I've got the measles. Darn you, Carmichael. Rochester, Rochester, call the doctor back. Okay, boss, and if I get in the mail in the next two weeks, hold it. Rochester, come back here. We'll be with you again next Sunday at the same time. So be sure and listen in for further adventures of Buck Harris. Oh, yeah, we'll see about that. Shut up. <laughs> Good night, folks. <laughs> uh... 
The Jell-O program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Kenny Baker, and yours truly, Don Wilson. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, we bring you our master of ceremonies, that suave comedian and sophisticated humorist, Maxwell Stroud. <laughs> Now, wait a minute, Don. I refuse to accept that introduction. No matter what Fred Allen says, I'm not Maxwell Stroud. I'll change it immediately. Okay. And now, ladies and gentlemen, this being the first week of spring, we bring you that quince on the fruit tree of life, Jack Benny. <laughs> That's better. Anyway, hello again. This is Jack Benny talking, and Don, thanks very much for that royal introduction. It was awfully nice of you to call me a prince. Oh, don't mention it. I'll see you later. <laughs> but you're right, Don. Spring is here. Flowers are blooming, trees are budding. It's getting warmer every day. Oh, uh, it sure is. Oh, well, by the way, Jack, have you taken your long underwear off yet? No, I always unveil in April. <laughs> But you know, Don, this spring weather has done my cold a world of good. I tell you, it's simply marvelous to be living here in sunny Los Angeles. Yes, sir. Sunny? Why, Jack, there hasn't been any sun here in over two weeks. Of course not. It's gone to San Francisco for the fair. <laughs> but it'll be back. I am looking much better, though, don't you think? Oh, you certainly are. And incidentally, uh, how's Carmichael, your polar bear? Oh, he's fine, Don. Getting along swell now. You know, I've been taking him out for long walks nearly every day. You and the bear? Oh, sure. And you know, Don, I was so embarrassed yesterday that we were strolling down Hollywood Boulevard, and all of a sudden, Carmichael pulled out a tin cup. <laughs> oh, I don't know where he got it. Not much, you don't. Phil, I was talking to Don. But as long as you're here, I want to thank you for taking my place on the program last week when I was sick in bed. That's all right, Jack. Say, those jokes of mine were pretty hot, weren't they? Hot? They were warmed over, if that <laughs> is. <laughs> hmm. Hot. You got the next line, Phil. Go ahead. What are you waiting for? You just ate modern, that's all. Modern? What a combination. Corny and illiterate. Hmm? <laughs> oh, hello, Mary. Hello. Say, Jack, I saw you and your polar bear on the boulevard yesterday. Boy, what a crowd you had around you. Yes, we were quite a sensation, weren't we? Yeah, but I thought you were overdoing it with your violin. <laughs> now, Mary, don't jump at conclusion. It just so happened that I was taking my violin to the repair shop. Sounded all right to me. <laughs> now, Mary, don't make up things. You know very well I was not playing that violin. Then why was the bear dancing? Because the pavement was hot and keep still. <laughs> Gee whiz, the way you're questioning me, you think I didn't have an amusement license. <laughs> now, let's forget it. What territory are you working next week? Westlake Park. Will you be there? <laughs> we start out with a program about spring, and here we are in Westlake Park. Shall I unpack the lunch? Now, stop this. <laughs> Phil, I think you better play a number before the ants spoil our little picnic. Okay. Oh, no, you don't, Phil Harris. I just wrote a poem about spring, and you're all going to hear it. Now, Mary, you're not, we're not going to listen to a lot of... You poems. are, too. Oh, all right. Get it over with. What's the title of your poem? When it's springtime in the Rockies, I will throw some rocks at you. <laughs> now, there's a sentimental thought. Go ahead, Mary. <clears throat> <clears throat> Winter, you have gone away. Where you are, I cannot say. But spring is here, and birdies sing. Gee, I'm happy. Pling, pling, pling. <laughs> pling, pling, pling. What's that for? I'm playing a banjo. Oh, I... I didn't see it. Continue. I saw a robin not long ago making a nest of grass and snow. Snow? And then I saw an old blue jay building his nest in Jack's toupee. Well, isn't that silly? Yesterday, I spent two hours watching the bees among the flowers. Buzz, 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 they were making honey. And I got stung where it wasn't funny. Well, it's your own fault. All our folks, it's the end of the line. Well... <laughs> Uh, that was very good, both of you. Now, Phil, if you'll put down your nail file, how about a number? <laughs> uh, what's, uh, what's it going to be? I'm going to play a little ditty entitled, We Don't Know Where Mom Is, But We've Got Pop on Ice. Ooh. <laughs> Phil, now you pick up that baton and redeem yourself. And we got pop on ice. <laughs> that was, I'm going to get some shut-eye, played by Phil Harris. Hmm. I don't know where Mom is, but we got Pop on ice. <laughs> wow. Phil, no kidding. How can you possibly be so corny? Corny? I resent that, Jack. I'm high class. 
All right, then have it your way. Your cream of corn. <laughs> Say, that was a fast one, eh, Barry? Yeah, that was a stinger. Well, I'm glad that's over with. I was a little worried about how you were going to read that. <laughs> And now, folks. <laughs> and now, folks, since our feature attraction this evening is rather long, I will start announcing it without further ado. Tonight, the busy Benny Bumpkins <laughs> will present a hotel mystery drama entitled... Hey, Jack, look at Kenny standing over there biting his nails. Oh, yes. Hello, Kenny. Hello. <laughs> What's the matter with you? Nothing's the matter with you. That's what. <laughs> Now, Kenny, I know there's something bothering you. What is it? Well, I'll suffer alone, thank you. Kenny Baker, I don't want you coming in here with a long face. Now, what's wrong? Did you ever buy a ticket on the Irish sweepstakes? Yes. Did you win? No. Well, put yes and no together and leave me alone. <laughs> oh, so that's it. Listen, Kenny, everybody can't win. You bought a ticket, so what? Two dollars and a half shot to Dante's Inferno. <laughs> All right, all right. Don't be such a hard loser. Look who's talking. Quiet. <laughs> and now, folks, getting back to our play, in our hotel mystery, I will play the part of the clerk. Or Clark, as they say in England. Or Cluck, as they say in Waukegan. <laughs> Phil, have you so much money saved up that you can afford to ad lib at random? <laughs> <laughs> If not, I would suggest less levity. <laughs> now, let's see. I'm going to be the clerk, and Mary, you're going to be the telephone operator. Okay. Say, Jack, why don't you be the house detective? Because I don't want to. I'm going to be the clerk. Gee, two flat feet gone to waste. Never mind that. <laughs> now, this murder mystery will go on immediately. I'll never eat another Irish potato, believe me. Kenny, will you forget about that sweepstake ticket? <laughs> Now, folks, as I've been trying to say, this murder mystery will go on immediately after... Come in. Pardon me, is this the Jell-O program? Yes, it is. Uh, what can I... Well, of all people, Ed Sullivan. How are you, Ed? I'm fine, Jack. How are you? Well, well, this certainly is a pleasant surprise. Nice of you to drop in, Ed. We're doing a swell play tonight. You'll enjoy it. Well, thanks, but to tell the truth, Jack, I really came up here for another reason. Oh. Well, it's sure good to see you again. Say, Ed, I don't think you've ever met my gang. This is Mary Livingston, our leading lady. How do you do, Miss Livingston? Mary, this is Ed Sullivan. He writes a very famous newspaper column. I never saw my name in it. Mary. <laughs> <laughs> don't mind her, Ed. She's a little blunt. She's a little brat, too. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yes. He is. Now, there are Don Wilson and Phil Harris. Harris is the one with the false eyelashes. <laughs> right there. Oh, I know them both. Hi, fellas. Hi, Hi Ed. Ed. And, oh, yes, I want you to meet our young tenor, Kenny Baker. Kenny, this is Ed Sullivan. Hello, Kenny. Oh, an Irishman, huh? Give me my 250 back. Kenny. <laughs> Mr. Sullivan has nothing to do with the Irish sweepstakes. You see, Ed, he's a little upset because he didn't win. Oh, come now, Kenny. I bought a ticket and I didn't win either. Oh, a sucker, huh? Uh -huh. Kenny, <laughs> I've had about enough from you. Now go over in the corner and lay down. <laughs> Jolly little troop you have here. Yes. Well, Ed, we're just about to put on our little play, so sit down and make yourself comfortable. Now, wait a minute, Jack. I didn't come up here to watch your program. I'm here as a reporter. Oh. Well, what's on your mind, Ed? I want to get the lowdown on this Maxwell Stroud stuff. Now, what about it? Are you Jack Benny or Maxwell Stroud? Ed, believe me, I'm Jack Benny. And until two weeks ago, I never even heard of Maxwell Stroud. Well, last Wednesday night, Fred Allen had the real Jack Benny on his program, and a notary public from Waukegan approved it. Now, wait a minute, Ed. You and I have been friends for a good many years. We started on our careers at the same time. We've palled around together from the bright lights of Broadway to the battle-scarred trenches of France. I don't remember that. Well, <laughs> we've stuck together through thick and thin, you and I, the two of us. We've called each other Buddy. Now, whom do you believe, me or the notary? The notary, Buddy. <laughs> well, maybe I didn't build it up enough. 
But look, Ed, regardless of what Alan said, you know that my name has always been Jack Benny. Well, you could have changed it, you know. Take my case, for instance. My name wasn't always Sullivan. Oh, no, what was it? Hooligan. <laughs> Hooligan? Yes, Edward H. Hooligan. Oh, what's the H for? Happy. Mary. <laughs> Now, look, Ed, don't pay any attention to Alan. I'm the real Jack Benny, and you can tell your readers tomorrow that I'm not Maxwell Stroud. Well, let me ask you something. What about that ring you're wearing? What about it? Well, what does that M.S. stand for? Mostly silver. It does not. <laughs> that M.S. on my ring stands for Master of Ceremony. Master of Ceremony? <laughs> Ceremony begins with a C. In Russian? <laughs> Well, I got this ring in Moscow when I was playing Rasputin's Rivoli. <laughs> I went over very big. Now, Ed, will you please sit down and watch our play? Oh, no. I'm here for a story, and I'm going to get it. Say, why don't you run out and get drunk like reporters do in the movies? <laughs> don't evade the issue. Fred Allen has definite proof that you're an imposter. You're not Jack Benny. I'm not, eh? Well, you call up Mansell Talcott, the mayor of Waukegan. He'll tell you. Why, he planted a great big elm tree in the public square in my honor. Call him up. I tried to, but he wouldn't come down out of the tree. <laughs> oh, is he up there again? <laughs> Never since he visited Hollywood, he thinks he's Tarzan. Now, we got a long play to do tonight, Ed, and I haven't time to discuss this any longer. All right, Mr. Benny or Stroud or whatever your name is. I'll go, but I'll be back and get to the bottom of this, or my name ain't Edward Happy Hooligan Sullivan. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> hmm, what a prying prunella. Why, if I were you, Jack, I'd have punched him right in the nose. Now, Mary, how could I hit a man wearing glasses? He wasn't wearing glasses. Well, I am. <laughs> And now, folks, our hotel mystery will go on immediately after Kenny Baker's song. Go ahead, Kenny. How can I sing when my money lies over the ocean? Sing, Kenny. I've had enough for one day. And where's my cigar? <laughs> that was Deep Purple, sung by Kenny Baker. And now, ladies and gentlemen, for our play. That great hotel mystery entitled... <laughs> or... Now, the scene of our drama is the lobby of the Hotel Chafing Dish, located in the thriving little town of Sterno, Pennsylvania. It is a dark and stormy night. Outside, the wind is howling and whistling. The suits, what weather. It is 8 p.m., just one hour before the stroke of nine. What happens then? Nothing. Curtain. Music. Good evening, Hotel Chafing Dish. Here's your party. Good evening. What's that, sir? Oh, that's terrible. You'll do no such thing. What well, seems to be the trouble, Miss Lavons? <laughs> Mr. Ferncliffe from 503 wants to send some money down to pay his bill. Money? What's wrong with that? Two hours ago, he ordered some paper, green ink, and a picture of Lincoln. <laughs> oh, is he doing that again? Last week, he gave me a $5 bill with baby snooks on it. Oh, well. What a night. Good evening, sir. Good evening. I'd like a room, please. Uh, would you like a room with a bath, or do you want to follow the arrow? <laughs> we, uh, we have both. It doesn't matter. I won't be here long. <laughs> I see. Front, take this gentleman's luggage up to 401. Be careful of that alligator bag. It hasn't had lunch yet. You know something? I think that guy is nuts. Oh, tush, tush, Miss Lavance. He's all right. Well, sir, I hope you have a good night's rest. You look tired. Yes, I had a tough day at Waterloo. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. That three-cornered hat should have tipped me off. Yes? Uh, pardon me, but the folding bed in my room is stuck, and I can't get it down. We'll take care of it, Mr. Baldome. 
<laughs> Thank you. Goodbye. Good evening. Yes, Mr. Smith. What? There's a hippopotamus in your bathtub. Well, put your glasses on and apologize to your wife. Mrs. Smith is a pretty big woman. Well, 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 how do you do? Hello. I'd like a room. I just got married. Oh, a newlywed, eh? Where's your wife? Outside. She's carrying the trunk. Carrying the trunk? My goodness, is it heavy? I think so. She never had bow legs before. <laughs> Here she is. You can put it down now, Sophie. Thanks, Waldemar. You're so considerate. Say, hey, you got her trained early, haven't you? Yeah. You ought to see me balance a ball on my nose. Balance a ball? That's the only seal I ever saw with a rabbit coat. Quiet, Miss Levant. Uh, what sort of a room would you folks like? We want the bridal suit. Suit? That's sweet, sweet. Lay off of my wife, you measure. <laughs> I'm not flirting with your wife. As a matter of fact, I think she's very homely. Well, that's more like it. Mm. Ron, take this happy couple up to suite 5B. Let's hurry upstairs, honey. I don't want to miss the Lone Ranger. <laughs> oh, I'm following that, too. Good night, kiddies. Good night. Hi, ho, Super! <laughs> Gee, they're, they're a romantic couple. Good evening, Hotel Chasing Dish. Yes, 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 yes. Who are you saying yes to? My darling daughter. Oh, how is Joni? <laughs> uh, pardon me, but the folding bed in my room is still stuck and I can't get it down. I'll uh, get to it as soon as possible, Mr. Baldome. Please do. Goodbye. <laughs> Charming fellow. Well, more business. Good evening. I'd like to get a room. Uh, yes, sir. What's your name, please? Bill Harris. Oh, you better have baggage, brother. <laughs> <laughs> no stalling. Now, where are your bags? Under my eyes, straight man. <laughs> Don't be so smart and get out of here. We have no room. Okay, I'll sleep at the Wilshire Bowl. <laughs> what a show-off. <laughs> Yes, sir. What can I do for you? Have, uh, have you any rooms available? Why, certainly. Quite a bad storm, isn't it? Yes, yes, it is. Will you be staying long? No, just for the night. I'm on my way to New York. Oh. A little business trip? Not exactly. You see, I'm on a mission of great importance, and I don't wish to discuss it. Well, I didn't mind to mean to pry into your affairs, Mr., uh, Mr. Stroud. Maxwell Stroud. <laughs> Maxwell Stroud. Well, slap me down and call me grumpy. Please, Miss Levant. You seem rather nervous, Mr. Stroud. What's wrong? Can I trust you, young man? Definitely. Well, for two weeks now, a certain well-known radio comedian in New York City has been perpetrating a vile and vicious slander. Yes? He claims that a certain Jack Benny, whom he hates... Yes, yes, I know. ...is not Jack Benny at all... Yes, yes, yes. ...but really Maxwell Stroud. But you are Maxwell Stroud. Exactly. And when I get to New York... The whole world will know of the cheap trickery that's been foisted on the public by this nasal buffoon. <laughs> well, I'm with you, Mr. Stroud. Here's the key to your room. Thank you. By the way, are you acquainted with Jack Benny? No, but I understand he's revolting. Good night. <laughs> Good night. Well, Miss Levant, that's very important news we just heard. I'll say it is. Uh, pardon me, but the folding bed in my room is still stuck, and I can't get it down. Don't worry, Mr. Baldwin. We'll take care of it first thing in the morning. I wish you would. My wife is in it. <laughs> oh. Well, I'll attend to it at once. My, my, this is certainly a busy night. Hey, you, did a fellow check in here a few minutes ago by the name of Maxwell Stroud? Yes, he did. What room is he in? 313. Wait a minute, who are you? I'm Ed Sullivan of the New York Daily News, the Pittsburgh Press, the Hollywood Citizen News, the Boston Traveler, the Philadelphia Ledger, the Omaha World Herald, the Denver Post. 
and the Chicago Tribune. Did you hear those shots, Miss LeBond? Yes, they came from upstairs. I suspected something like that. Follow me. You don't think he'd go first, do you? Oh, no. Come on. Let's go. Good heaven. It's Maxwell Stroud. He's dead. I thought so. Now we've got to find out who done it. That's who did it. Fine newspaper man. <laughs> but who in the world would want to kill Maxwell Stroud? Look! Someone jumped through that window and he's running down the fire escape. That must be the murderer. Did you get a good look at him happy? No, I didn't. Look, well, here's a derby hat on the floor. He must have dropped it. Let me have that. Uh-huh. Look at the initials inside of that hat. F.A. F.A.? Yes. That proves the man who killed Maxwell Stroud was none other than... Yike! We got it. <laughs> Ooh. Who shot you? Tell us who shot you. Yes, who done it? I told you before that who did it. <laughs> I was shot by... I was shot by... I was... Oh, nuts, Clayfield. Thank you, Ed Sullivan. We're a little late, folks. Good night. Well...